Mestiza America the Country of the Future William Ospina Colombian writer, novelist, and critic born in Hervio, a municipality in the department of Tolima. Mestiza America the Country of the Future Called Hispanic by the Spanish, Iberian by the Portuguese, Latin by the French, Equinoctial, Ismic, Insular, and Southern by the Baron of Humboldt and by the Creoles, our America has spent centuries trying to define itself, and in that almost fruitless search the complexity of its composition and the magnitude of its difficulties can even be noted symbolically. It would seem that of all the names he has sought for himself, the one that could best suit him is that of America Mestiza, which at least tries to define it by its diversity and its mixtures, not by the predominance of any of its elements. And Mestiza should be understood not only as a mixture of Iberian and indigenous ethnic and cultural elements, but also as the multiple convergence of African elements, elements from other European nations, and the growing incorporation of traditions from the rest of the world. Our America is less a geographical homogeneity than a historical and cultural conjunction, but the common destiny of its inhabitants ended up turning it into a world that must be thought of and embraced as a whole, just as when thinking of the European continent, the mind automatically includes Scandinavia and Iceland, because shared history ends up influencing geography. Those who say that the true discoverers of America were not Columbus's sailors, who on a desperate night in 1492 saw with incredulous eyes an impossible light in the darkness, are right but rather the irredeemable travelers who more than 30,000 years ago did not know when the, the Asian ice had become the ice of another world, and they entered forever into the depopulated forests of the continent, among the deaf forests, which the elk and reindeer track, as the poet Chesla Malaz says, without sensing that their remote descendants would make conical tents in the autumn meadows, raise red pyramids in the Quetzal and indigo forests, soften gold with macerated herbs on the towering plateaus, build enormous stone fortresses in the mountains of flame and mist, trace figures of animals that the eye cannot encompass in the Peruvian deserts, would carve megalithic heads and sacred jaguars, and would sail on docile carved logs. Boats and bison skin boats on the highest lakes and the largest rivers in the world. The continents, however, had a common origin, and part of what is now South America had once separated from the body of the African continent. To see this, it is enough to look at the maps, since the western line of Africa, from the beaches of the Ivory Coast to the extreme of South Africa, fully coincides with the eastern coast of South America. Any child can play a puzzle in which the mouth of the Amazon in Macapa coincides with the border region between the Ivory Coast and Ghana. The city of Fortaleza corresponds to the lower region of the Gulf of Guinea, Recife coincides with the Bay of Biafra, Salvador de Bahia with the coasts of Gabon, Esirito Santo with Zaire, Rio de Janeiro with the coasts of Angola, and the area of Curitiba with the border between Angola and Namibia. Along the mid-ocean ridge the continents separated, two different massifs of early South America, the Brazilian and the Venezuelan, separated by an oceanic arm came together, and the tectonic plate advancing west collided with the plate of the Pacific, making emerge the Andes mountain range and the central isthmus that united South America with the distant North American continent. All this, without a doubt, in times too early for man, in an age of cataclysms, when the world was barely fulfilling the tasks prior to human history, but in an age not so distant that its traces in the morphology of human beings have disappeared. The worlds called Hispanic by the Spanish, Iberian by the Portuguese, Latin by the French, Equinoctial, Ismic, Insular, and Southern by the Baron of Humboldt and by the Creoles, our America has spent centuries trying to define itself, and in that almost fruitless search it can noting even symbolically the complexity of its composition and the magnitude of its difficulties. Neither the Spanish language, nor its extension to the Iberian languages, nor its extension to languages of Latin origin, fully encompass it. And it is that this America bears on its forehead the stigma of always tending to define itself by something external, or by a part only of its composition and its historical legacy. Perhaps that is why it is not fully recognized, since the denominations it finds tend to exclude some element of its complexity. It is like a creature that will never find its name, a being that in order to designate itself had to renounce the consciousness of its eyes, its dreams, or its wings.
This exciting feature is becoming a substantive part of it, and has marked many serious moments in its history. However, it would seem that of all the names he has sought for himself, the one that could best suit him is that of America Mestiza, which at least tries to define it by its diversity and mixtures, not by the predominance of any of its elements. And Mestiza should be understood not only as a mixture of Iberian and indigenous ethnic and cultural elements, but also as the multiple convergence of African elements, elements from other European nations, and the growing incorporation of traditions from the rest of the world. Our America is less a geographical homogeneity than a historical and cultural conjunction, but the common destiny of its inhabitants ended up turning it into a world that must be thought of and embraced as a whole, just as when thinking of the European continent, the mind automatically includes Scandinavia and Iceland, because the shared history ends up influencing the geography. Until a century and a half ago, the mountains of California, the plains, and the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona were also part of the project of this America, lands of the monumental plateau and of delicate colors, as Jorge Luis has described them. Borges, the lands of Colorado and Wyoming and even the mountains of Nevada. They were all lands occupied or visited by Spain and later by Mexico and even today these remote regions continue to be meeting places between the peoples of the North and the South. How can we not wish that one day, when neighborliness, collaboration, and respect have fulfilled their mission, the entire American continent will be a vast alliance of dignity and civilization propitiated by languages and traditions? What originates from America? If something characterizes this region of the continent, it is its extraordinary diversity. Children of a shared historical past, the peoples inhabit regions so radically different that it is easy to understand when looking at them why, despite their cultural community, they have ended up having such a wealth of styles. Nothing would connect Chile, that line of mountainous ridges and rocky beaches, with the vast and tropical Venezuela, with its vertiginous Tipuis and its ancient rock formations. Nothing would link the Brazil of the jungle and the river, the green side of the Atlantic, with the dry plateau of Mexico, which is erased by light in the deserts of the north. Nothing would link Cuba or Puerto Rico, mountain peaks surrounded by water, with Bolivia, a mass of water surrounded by mountains. Europe is a much more homogeneous continent, not only because everything is spread out on the map in a horizontal line north of the Tropic of Cancer, because of the latitude that it shares with Canada and the United States and that unifies them in the same climate regime but because there are not in its territory the great geographical contrasts that abound in ours. We do not conceive of a true jungle in Europe, a mountain range as dizzying as the Andes, grasslands like the Colombian Venezuelan plains or the Argentine Pampas, and we can hardly say that the Mediterranean Sea configures a microworld like the Caribbean Sea. It was the poet Auden who said that one of the main differences between Europe and America is that in Europe, no matter how lost someone is, he is less than an hour from some populated place, while every American has seen with his eyes regions practically untouched by history. This contrast of magnitudes was experienced with special perplexity by some men of the 16th century, and above all the chroniclers of the Indies, who warned early on how enormous the newly found world was compared to the continent from which they came. There are those who dare to think that strictly speaking Europe is not even a continent, in geographical terms and Paul Valéry has called it, with delicate irony, that peninsula where the Asian continent advances towards the Atlantic. America has experienced several discoveries and those discoveries have sometimes been subsequent to the conquests. This routine of discoveries and conquests seems to be part of their destiny, but the enormity of the territory and the complexity of its cultures is such that sometimes we feel that they will never be discovered. Five centuries ago people began to talk about the New World, but today we still feel that our America is about to be discovered, every day it surprises us with some revelation, and we will see that curiously, not only do its nature and future end up being unknown, but also his own past ceases to be perceptible, to continue acting powerfully in the shadows. Until five centuries ago, not only did the moon have a hidden face, the earth also hid itself, and two halves of it had passed for millennia without the slightest contact. This had allowed the development of totally autonomous civilizations, owners of their own logic and their own rhythm, and that is why the meeting of cultures could have been so enriching for the world.
but that meeting turned into a clash, because unfortunately the Europe that found America came from an age of barbarism. The soldiers of Charles V were an extension of the Crusaders who for centuries had besieged the Arabs in Asia Minor, they were possessed by the dogmatic conviction that their culture was the only legitimate one, and this made the early days of European domination in America they were horrifying, as the alarms of Bartolomé de las Casas and the royal octaves of Juan de Castellanos, the great poet of the conquest and the most comprehensive of the 16th century chroniclers of the Indies, bear. Witness. Due to the logic that characterizes colonialism, we Americans have become accustomed to seeing our continent appear on the horizon of history from the prow of the Spanish caravels. This created for centuries a distortion in the knowledge of this world. The many thousands of years that preceded European discovery tend to be covered by an impenetrable fog, dismissed as prehistory, or excluded as times alien to our culture. That is why we did not learn to fully inhabit the territory, to take root in its traditions, to be the serene continuation of that timeless past. For a long time we have lived like guests who have come to populate an old house, and who do not even bother to explore the endless rooms, the succession of its inhabitants. A deaf discord between the centennial Western America and the millennial planetary America more than once makes us live as if we had just appeared in the world, and makes ours a strange and dizzying destiny. It would be worth looking at history, even the history of discovery, not from the apex of the region inventing ships, as the poet called them, but from the beaches of America, from the plurality of its native cultures and from the exuberance of its nature, from the chronologies of that other history that is also ours and that Hegel could not understand. This requires a long process, and it will even be said that we, American mestizos by culture or by blood, cannot think of the world outside the parameters of European civilization. Even Borges has written that for Europeans and Americans there is an order a single order that is possible, the one that used to bear the name of Rome and that is now the culture of the West. But it is easier to affirm that from the Argentine or North American culture, almost complete extensions of European cultures, than from the rest of the Mestizo and Mulatto nations of America, which are due to the plurality, which they carry in their composition, in their physiognomy in his memory and in his dreams a more complex labyrinth of symbols, a denser cryptography. Borges himself was not unaware of it, and in his poem to Mexico he described lucidly and with great beauty the things that seemed identical between Mexico and his country, those that seemed eternal, that is, shared, and those that seemed different. How many different things, a mythology of blood that the deep dead gods interweave the nopales that give horror to the deserts and the love of a shadow that is before the day. To understand our America it is necessary to get rid of dogmas, and assume, as a poem by Robert Frost wisely says, that those who inhabit a land have to know how to give themselves fully to it. This land was ours, before we were of this land. It was ours for more than a century, before we became its people, it was ours in Massachusetts, in Virginia but we were colonists from England, possessing things that did not yet possess us, possessing what we no longer possessed. Something that we refused to give wasted our strength, until we understood that that something was ourselves that we did not give ourselves to the ground in which we lived and from that moment it was our salvation to give ourselves. We do not ignore that being Americans today is equivalent to being heirs to all the traditions of the planet, and the Mestizo America is initially inconceivable without the triple legacy of the American, European and African worlds, and later without the legacy of the rest of the nations that have fact that, for example, Sao Paulo is today one of the largest Japanese cities in the world. But when it comes to defining our political order, our cultural panoramas and our ethical and aesthetic values, the weight of the conquest continues to be very great and even in the majority indigenous countries such as Mexico, Guatemala, or Bolivia, and in the mulatto countries such as Haiti or the Dominican Republic, there are difficulties in overcoming the exclusionary predominance of the culture of the conquerors. Mestizo America is today separated into numerous countries that owe their formation equally to the peculiarities of the territory and of the nations, and to the hazards of history. These divisions, consecrated by the will of their inhabitants and ratified by boundary treaties and by political constitutions, 
were not always beneficial for the peoples and were often due to friction between the ruling classes of the different societies or the result of specific conflicts. In pre-Hispanic times there were great empires and numerous contacts between the peoples of the different regions. The conquest still witnessed the feats of a few men who subjugated huge provinces and who were capable of traversing the continental territory with the precarious means of that time and in conditions of great adversity. Colonial times fractured those original units, and the romantic adventure of independence, despite the dreams of unity of men like Simon Bolivar, failed to save the continent from that fragmentation, which persists to this day. However, it is possible to notice that there are geographic systems that constitute natural regions, which are more difficult to understand when divided into countries, because they are interdependent systems. Such is the case of the three great regions, the Caribbean Sea and its shores, the mountain systems that border the Pacific Ocean, the largest of which is the Andes Mountain Range, and the gigantic Amazon Basin. The northern and southern extremes form geographical systems relatively independent of these large continental regions. Now, that Caribbean to which the Renaissance navigators arrived by chance was the historical setting for one of the richest and most complex human conglomerates of all time. The sailors of Columbus, in their small and fragile barges, could not imagine that they were approaching a cultural world so rich and so different from everything they knew, and the sad truth is that once the islands were found, they were no longer allowed to discover it, because before each culture they encountered they proceeded indiscriminately to plunder and assault. But if any traveler had tried to have a full understanding of that vast world, the panoramic picture that could have been formed of the Caribbean at the end of the 15th century would have been admirable. The Caribbean Sea The first thing that demands our attention is the very physical space of the Caribbean, in which it is necessary to include the Gulf of Mexico. It is a kind of extensive inland sea bordered by Florida, by the Mississippi Delta, by the Mexican Arch, where the Rio Grande flows, by the Yucatan Peninsula, by the coast of Belize where the second largest coral reef is located. Of the world, through the long corridor of Central America, through the line of Panamanian jungles, through the white coasts of Colombia and Venezuela, which pay tribute to the flow of their Magdalena and Orinoco rivers, and through the intermittent embrace of the Antilles that, chained together, seem to evidence a submarine mountain range whose successive visible summits are Trinidad and Tobago, Grenada, St. Vincent, Barbados, St. Lucia, Martinique, Dominica, Guadeloupe, Montserrat, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Kitts, St. Martin, Anguilla, the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, the Great Island of the Dominican Republic and Haiti, Cuba, and the Bahamas, and that closes its circle again in the vicinity of Florida. Many of these islands are volcanic formations, and around this prodigious basin some of the highest societies of the continent lived in pre-Hispanic times. The Caribbean was the center of gravity of a world. The Natchez, Mobile, and Chitimacha peoples inhabited the Mississippi Delta. Twenty million people populated the highlands of central Mexico, and in Anahuac rose and spread the sacred city that had succeeded the legendary Tula as capital, a city that after the year 1000 of our era invented refinements and became the heart of the Toltec Empire and the great ceremonial center of Quetzalcoatl. A century and a half before the Europeans, the capital was Tenochtitlan, which had subdued the rest of the territory and exercised its newly conquered supreme authority over the other peoples of the empire. When Hernan Cortés and Bernal Díaz del Castillo looked out into the incredible valley for the first time, they saw not a city appear but a whole harmonious culture in its design, in its colors, in its decorations, a community of hundreds of thousands of inhabitants, larger than the largest cities in Europe and much more homogeneous than any of them. Arranged on an extensive lagoon, the neighborhoods, the markets, the administrative centers, the pyramids succeeded each other. That culture had developed monumental architecture, original art, refined poetry and complex mythology, as well as a system for representing its history through pictorial elements. That is why one of the saddest moments of the entire process occurred when, already seeing their people defeated and the treasures of their culture in danger, a group of Aztec wise men made the decision, both dramatic and heroic, to go to their winners and put in their hands the codices where they preserved their memory.
it was as if, their people defeated by the Persians or the Romans, Plato and Aristotle had come to deliver their works to the victorious chiefs, to put under their protection the wisdom of a world. But as the book The Vision of the Vanquished tells us, the men to whom the Aztecs handed over the cultural treasure of their people were brutal and illiterate adventurers who found that ceremony absurd and unleashed dogs of prey on the priests. And three wise men from Ehecatl, Quetzalcoatl, of Tathzacocan origin, were eaten by dogs. No more they came to surrender. Nobody brought them. They just came bringing their papers with paintings. There were four of them, one fled, only three were hit, back in Coyoacan. The vestiges of the great culture of the Almecs were also found in Mexico, which left enormous stone heads in the Yucatan Peninsula, pieces that today can be seen in the Las Ventas Museum in Villa Hermosa, in Tabasco. Further south, to the tropical jungles of Guatemala and the valleys of Belize, although already depopulated by then, the sacred cities of the Maya persisted. That of the Mayans had been perhaps the most exquisite of the cultures of the American world. To their architectural originality, to their artistic refinement as sculptors and painters, to their poetry, we must add the most advanced astronomy of their time and a recently deciphered logographic writing that allows us to appreciate a people whose relationship with the daily environment obeyed the perception of the universe as a whole. It is noteworthy that in the deciphered inscriptions of the lords of Palenqueos, linguists and archaeologists felt puzzled at first, not knowing if they were lists of the different kings who rose to power in the city, or a description of the successive figures of the firmament. It can be concluded that for the Maya there was basically no difference between the mention of the advent of the kings and the description of the drawings of the sky. In a beautiful essay called The House of the Dying Sun, one of the key people in the decipherment of the Mayan glyphs, Linda Skeely, has revealed to us that the temple of the inscriptions of Palenque is built in such a way that the sun of the solstice winter is hidden at sunset in the tomb of King Pakal relief in stone, as is symbolically represented on the lid of the sarcophagus of this Mayan lord, and that in the temple of the cross the architecture is calculated so that the winter solstice. It is the only day of the year when sunlight bathes the front of the temple, then it seeps into its interior illuminating the figure of the god of the underworld, the very light of the setting sun ends up entering into a dance full of meaning with the ceremonial figures of the temple, and dying at the feet of the god. These peoples did not conceive of the possibility of daily life, religion, politics and architecture that were not considered in terms of the planet and the stars, the cycles of the sun and the moon. In this they revealed a much more subtle perception than other civilizations of that need for harmony with the natural universe that should be at the base of all social order. Amazing was that Caribbean surrounded by the cultures of the Toltecs, Almecs, Aztecs and Mayans, by the culture of the Zanus of the north coast of what is now Colombia, a town of extremely fine goldsmiths who had temples full of offerings in the inner sheets and that they had the custom of burying their dead in the midst of abundant symbolic pieces of gold under trees that reached colossal sizes. Further east were the peoples of the Sierra Nevada, the Tehranas, who built their city of stone high up in the mountains, with endless ladders and legendary effigies erected in the bends. Still today Ikas, Erwakos and Kajas persist in those heights facing the sea calling for reconciliation with nature. The Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta rises 5,000 meters above sea level on the very shores of the Atlantic with an ocean chasm 5,000 meters deep next to it. Geologists still wonder if the reefs of the Tehrana were not the work of man, and if the same people who built their cities of stone slabs on the vertiginous mountain were also capable of orienting reefs in the depths. The towns of the neighboring coast of Guajira and Cabo de la Vila, like those of Cumana and Margarita beyond the Gulf, extracted pearls from the abundant marine osteals, they were resistant divers. Columbus was able to see them one day, countless men and women in long boats, their whole bodies adorned with strings of pearls, and even beyond were the towns of Trinidad, in the Gulf of Peria, and the towns that inhabited the archipelago, closing their hug around the sea, through the opulent islands, to Puerto Rico and Santo Domingo, and the immense town of the Tainos of Cuba, next to the Florida Peninsula. Peaceful peoples and warrior peoples, equally deeply rooted in their natural universe, patient craftsmen, agile and vigorous, great swimmers, skillful navigators in small boats that bordered the coasts, 
had not developed monumental ships because they seemed to be satisfied with what was close, or felt, like the ancient Egyptians, the fear of the sea. Now we can try to see that Caribbean Sea of the end of the 15th century, with its rumor of inspired languages, like Nahuatl, in which Netzawalcoitl had sung, we only came to doze, we only came to dream. It is not true, it is not true, that we came to live on earth. In spring grass we came to become, they come to green again, our hearts open their buttons, our body is a flower, some flowers give and wither. Or the one in which the myth of the Mayan creation had been repeated, the verses of the Popol Vuh about the origin. There was nothing that formed a body, nothing that clung to something else, nothing that rocked, that made the slightest touch, that made the least noise in the sky. And the one where the Kajas made their own memorable hymn of creation. First there was the sea. Everything was dark. There was no sun, no moon, no people, no animals, no plants. Only the sea was everywhere. Thus, first there was only the mother. His name was Galkovang. The mother was not people, nor anything, nor anything. She was Luna. She was the spirit of what was to come and she was thought and memory. Thus the mother existed only in Aluna, in the lowest world, in the ultimate depth, alone. Aluna is the name that the hymn gives to that solitary thought that, below, in the depth, prefigures the worlds. The successive formation of nine worlds begins, before dawn. The initial beings appear, but they were not people, nor anything, nor anything at all. And once again we know that those original powers that occupy the first world, the first place and the first moment are Aluna too, they are thought. The immaterial character of these intense creations manages to produce the sensation that in his universe, as in Plato, the immaterial comes first, and that the visible forms are just projections or emissions of that initial thought. Beings, fragments, forms, orientations, functions arise, and yet there is still nothing, everything is premonition and Aluna. The body arises and it is an immanence, the eighth world arises and what was to live afterwards, and it is not yet complete, but almost, adds the poem. Finally, before us, the awaited moment arrives, the ninth, the last world, is near, and the poem concludes. Then the ninth world was formed and Vero there was no earth yet. It was not yet dawn. It was to that sea of kingdoms and myths that the three small boats of the Spanish arrived, and it is significant that, although the Vikings had touched the shores of Newfoundland before, it was the discovery of the Caribbean world that truly put Europe in contact with America and set in motion the complex fusion of the worlds. Pacific and the Andes Along the western Mexican coast, from the Baja California Peninsula and its gulf, where the Colorado River empties, we enter a different world the one that looks at the Pacific Ocean. It is clear that in the depths of the earth a sea of fire stirs, and the long western shore of the continent is the neighbor of a fiery universe, the Mesoamerican arc of the Pacific Circle of Fire, the diadem of active volcanoes that keep the earth in continuous stirring. There they are, in the Guayaranes Basin, the hydrothermal cracks in whose sulfateras live, in the boiling water and 20,000 feet deep thermophilic bacteria like those that possibly gave rise to life millions of years ago. To the southwest of the western Sierra Madre, through the states of Sonora and Sinaloa, Nayarit and Jalisco, up to the Sierra Madre del Sur, through Michoacan and through Guerrero, the volcanoes are born, they throw those mysterious perfect spheres of stone, the geodes, that one can be found as decorations in the shops of Morelia, Michoacan, the city of Pink Quarry. And today the cities of Mazatlan, Puerto Vallarta and Acapulco follow one another along that timeless coast, towards the silver region of Oaxaca, the Gulf of Tehuantepec, and the Lake Andana jungle of the state of Chiapas, where the descendants of the Mayans live. The Central American region begins there, that isthmus that emerged from the depths and that unites the two halves of the continent like a wasp waist. Due to the habit of looking at it as a point of union, as a mediator and as a contact, the importance of this region, which is configured as the central border of the worlds, is not always noticed. Being on the line of greatest proximity between the oceans allows it, 
a two-sided world, to be part of both sides of the planet at the same time and requires it to understand both. It is not only the crossroads where the descendants of the Mongols from the north passed millennia ago, who were going to populate the mountain range, the jungle and the pampas, but a powerful region in itself. There are the tropical forests of Guatemala, its coast on the Pacific, humid and fertile, the Guatemalan Sierra Madre with its highest point, the Tahumulca volcano. Region of frequent earthquakes and devastated cities, of hot days and cool nights, of logging and exceptional biological wealth. Then comes the Salvadoran countryside in the shadow of volcanoes, the southern coast of Honduras arching in the broken forms of the Gulf of Fonseca to continue towards the central mountains of volcanic origin and the system of coastal valleys in the north with its three provinces named Mythical, Atlantis, Columbus, and the extreme lands of the Gulf of Honduras where the Caratasca Lagoon is located, a border whose name was undoubtedly given by moved sailors, thank God. From Nicaragua to the south stretches a region influenced equally by the great peoples of the north and by the Chipchas of the south, traces of whose languages were found there. The Papil and the Nicaro, from San Salvador to Nicaragua, and the Sigua from the Gulf Coast, come from the Udo Aztecas or Nahuas, but the origin of the Jacoc, Payas, and Lenca from the Honduran region is still disputed. The name that the following regions received from the Spanish describes very well the abundance that was found there Costa Rica and Castillo de Oro. In Costa Rica, laborious jade statuettes are still found and gigantic and perfect stone spheres buried at intervals in jungles, which remain an enigma for researchers, but could well be representations of an underground divinity inspired by the geodes thrown up by volcanoes. It is the isthmus of the sacred jaguar and ritual coca, of the mosquitoes, who venerated the constellation of the Pleiades, of the Lenka who worshipped the sun, of the divine twins who created human beings with solar rays, and of innumerable spirits that they populate the world. The vestiges of the different cultures of the Panamanian isthmus and jungles are very abundant, which expand with the Kuna people to the rainforest region of the Colombian Choco, that spring of waters from the west presided over in the origin by the extended myth of an ancient deluge. These Kuna are the creators of a beautiful song to cure madness. The waves of the sea are moving with foam, the healer is looking at the place, he is the healer. The waves of the sea almost reached him the healer is looking at the place, he is the healer. The waves of the sea are shining with whiteness, like that of the heron, the waves of the sea are whitening, he is the healer. The coconut palms of the sea are bending in the wind, the healer is looking at the place. The apples of the coconuts of the sea are shining in the wind, the healer is looking at the place. It is a long song that makes us feel that nature, the repeated mention of its elements, is a source of calm and balance for human beings. Another great geographical and human region of our America now expands before the traveler, the Andes mountain range, which, coming from extreme Patagonia, covers the peaks of South America with perpetual snow, extends to the trifurcate Colombian mountain range, and only it moderates and declines in the vicinity of the Caribbean. It belongs to the zone of influence of that great crest of mountains, the Pacific coast, shores that overlook the great planetary ocean, from the rugged line of the Chilean coasts, to which Pablo Neruda sang with such love. Oh, sea of Chile, oh, water! High and tight as a sharp fire, pressure, and sleep and sapphire nails, oh, earthquake of salt and lions! Slope, origin, coast of the planet, your eyelids! They open the noon of the earth attacking the blue of the stars. There to the south was the land of the Araucanians, who valiantly resisted the invasion of the conquerors. And on that mountain range, further north, was built the other great pre-Hispanic empire of America, the Inca. About 14 million people inhabited it, from the mountains of Salta in Argentina, to the first herbs of Cauca in what is now Colombia, and that mountain range still secretly forms a unit, despite the disintegrating work of centuries. The Incas had unified a considerable part of South America. Following the cardinal points from Cuzco, the great empire was quartered, Chinchazuyo, to the north, through Cajamarca, Quito, and Guayaquil, to the south of Colombia, the Calasuyo, to the south, through the region of the Lipica lords of Lake Titicaca, 
to the province of Salta, Antisuio, to the east, which extended to the Amazon foothills, and the Cuntisuio to the west, to the coast, where perdition entered. Complex empire of farmers who knew how to fertilize the land with guano brought from the coasts, country of solemn constructions that at the death of the lords were dedicated to their cult, so that it became necessary to build new headquarters for the new rulers, tall and overwhelming cities of stone walls, monumental stone upon monumental stone in the intractable peaks of the Andes, country of domesticated llamas, of spinners and of precious vicuna and llama wool fabrics. An empire whose network of roads, which allowed the bearers of news, through relays, to advance up to 250 km per day, so that the Inca's orders arrived almost immediately from Cusco to Guayaquil, was better preserved than the network of roads of Europe, and included girder bridges, suspension bridges, rope bridges with baskets, signposts and water mains. All the Incas worked, because that was a social obligation, everyone had access to the goods of the land, and armed with spears, stone-covered batons, slingshots and axes, the armies were protected by padded doublets, shields and helmets. The Inca, the descendant of the great Manco Capac, founder of the empire, knew himself to be the representation of the sun on earth, and under the wool braid wrapped around his head and under the red tassels wrapped in gold that fell on his forehead, a veil covered his face to protect his subjects from the danger of seeing by chance or by distraction the incredible face of the god. Among all their women there was one, the Koya, who was the incarnation of the moon, and there was no greater crime in that culture than the transgression of the Inca's orders. But long before the Incas, other cultures had dominated those territories, the Chavan by the 5th century before our era, the Tiawanaku of Lake Titicaca and the Wari of the Ayacucho region, and still later the Mokica, the people of great potters on the north coast, and the Paracas, weavers of exquisite blankets for the dead, in the southern lands. All this on the coast of Peru, where much later Alejandro de Humboldt, after measuring the temperature of the shore and measuring it again a few hundred meters out to sea, would discover the ocean current that bears his name, and on the coasts of Ecuador, with its islands of giant tortoises, where today the figure of Darwin on the bow of the Beagle also seems timeless, and before the mangroves of Colombia and the rainforests of Choco, where one of the most powerful natural water factories in the world is located. And the jungles of Darien, from which Balboa saw the multitude of a new ocean appear. The indigenous empires had recognized and unified a part of the territory. They were not homogeneous empires, and rather learned to rule over differences born of the plurality of regions and circumstances. The Carib languages were less powerful than Nahuatl and Quechua, great imperial languages, and were not in a position to impose themselves and subjugate, but this did not prevent them from spreading, not by imposition but by simple proximity and contagion, and there were great kinships between the languages of the Caribbean and the language spoken in the Amazon basin. Where power was centralized, much progress had been made in the process of forming nations, but in all the vast territory that was not unified into empires, later studies show an astonishing number of peoples and their census will forever be incomplete. In the territory of Colombia alone there were more than 120 indigenous peoples with their languages, their mythologies, their own regulatory systems and their social organization. The recognition of living cultures was already difficult for the Europeans of that time and for the violent executors of the conquest it was an almost impossible task. Few would have believed that these peoples were worthy of attention and study, for them the natives lived in barbarism and it was necessary to quickly civilize them, although what they called civilizing almost never went beyond imposing a painful servitude on them and demanding the artificial profession of a faith that they couldn't understand. In many parts of our America, beyond the living cultures, the footprint of immemorial civilizations lasted. Facing the Pacific Line, a line without major coastal features, some remote islands seem like a helpless link with the Polynesian archipelagos. There is the most distant and lonely of the islands in the world, Rapa Nui, the country of enormous stone figures that look at infinity and seem to wait for something without respite. The era in which the culture that has left us these pensive beings flourished is still debated, but the effect of the great heads of Easter Island seems to predate all history.
symbols of the human that watches over the horizon and awaits gifts or revelations from the sky and the sea. Nor could it be known then, it is still unknown, who carved the stone statues of the culture curiously called San Agustin in the sources of the Magdalena River, and it is to be hoped that new discoveries about the architects of those ferocious monolithic warriors, of their birds, its jaguars and its men, reveal more about the culture from which they come and even restore its true name. Nor do we know when the Tumaca culture had its splendor, on the shores of the Pacific. Although it is almost given to us to reconstruct the daily life of that town thanks to the meticulous pottery in which they left represented their physiognomies at different ages, their trades, their medicine, their crafts, and their dwellings. Who knows if in the murky bottom of the Pacific, near the coast, the monuments of which these pieces were models do not lie forever, or the possible cemeteries of the Tumaca, snatched away by some tidal wave. Who knows if the secret of that culture of delicate craftsmen did not leave with their dead in the boats that delivered them to the sea. Clay, wood, stones and metals were sacred materials for the native peoples of America, instruments of prayer and praise. In the gold was the sun, in the silver the moon, in the clay the very earth from which men had come and which later maternally collected their bones. The Third Kingdom of America also extended over this mountain range, the Solar Kingdom of the Chibchas, in the savanna of Bogota, and further to the east, through the lands of Tunja, in present-day Colombia. Being the most organized and hierarchical of the peoples of the region, the richest in gold on the continent, it developed like the others a copious and diverse art of exquisite goldsmiths, and gave rise to the legend of El Dorado during the conquest, which would persist for centuries. And that would prolong its splendor in the literatures of Europe, even in the ironic pages of Voltaire. The Amazon Water, water is the secret miracle of the third great geographical region of our America. As one researcher has put it, water in rivers, in soils, in vegetation, and in the atmosphere. Waters that decline in torrents from the Andean peaks and from the peripheral massifs, waters flowing into other waters, waters that rise due to evaporation caused by tropical climates, Atlantic evaporation clouds that come unloading their rains from the east over the jungle extensions, and that are exhausted in the Andean slopes, waters that turn green in the incessant foliage of the jungle, flooded soils from which the palms of the swamp sprout, humid airs from which aerial plants feed, the quiches which the wise call epiphytic bromeliads, waters in which tapers swim, from which anteaters protect themselves by adapting to an arboreal life, waters that drain endlessly in millions of small streams, from the Mori Chales and the humid soils that make one think, as in Victor Hugo's verse, of a land that is still wet and soft from the deluge. These waters form a hydrographic basin of 6,878,761 square kilometers, which could be extended to 2 million more kilometers if the Orinoco Basin and the Guyanas are included, where the territory continues to present the same characteristics of the Amazonian world. Countless streams form thousands of currents and these hundreds of great volumes that finally pour into the Great River, the Amazon, which throws into the Atlantic at its mouth 100,000 cubic meters of water per second, and which advances with its brown waters, which they have dissolved ravines and mountains of a day, up to 300 kilometers offshore during high waters, while in periods of low water, or of minimum flow, the influence of ocean tides can be perceived up to 700 kilometers. Before the mouth. This fight between the sea and the river, salt water and fresh water, this war of colors of blue and brown, produces the Poro Roca, the wave of thunder and fury that rises when the breaking of the ocean manages to overcome the impulse of the river. The Amazon flows through an ocean floor, the primitive arm of the sea that separated the Brazilian and Venezuelan massifs, and the presence of a fauna related to marine fauna, such as pink dolphins proves that unique condition of a sea turned into a river by cataclysms. Geographical And this is the other region of the continent, the Great Jungle, that ocean of apparently impenetrable vegetation that grows from the water fabric of the world's largest river and its mighty network of tributaries. Far from the great indigenous empires of America, the inhabitants of the Amazon jungle were for centuries the most mysterious and unknown beings on Earth. They maintained a secret communication with the Caribbean peoples, but nobody knew that, 
along the thousands of kilometers that go from the sources of the Coca River, the Napo River or the Maranyan River to the violent storm that can be seen from Balam of Para and that plunges into the Atlantic, millions of human beings inhabited the universe of the equinoctial forest, and hundreds of cultures, mythologies and languages filled its territory with human meaning. Still in our time unknown peoples sometimes emerge before the astonished eyes of the world, such as the Nakakmaku, who survive naked and wander through the immensity of the jungle, who skillfully improvise their camps by weaving lianas and foliage, who hunt monkeys and build fleeting dwellings in the clearings, and that return on their way, to live further away and allow that small fraction of the forest to regenerate after they have taken from it what they need to live. Many look with alarm at their customs, without noticing that it is precisely in that nomadic life, in those transitory camps, in the familiarity with the forest and in the respect for its integrity, where the wisdom of these peoples and the profound knowledge that they have come to have of the world they inhabit. The indigenous peoples of the region customarily recite the myth of the origin of the Amazon in their marriage rites. It is significant that the ancestral memory of peoples is evoked at the moment a new family is born, we understand how close and how intimate this universe is for the inhabitants of the jungle, how they feel they are custodians of their memory and know they are responsible for their destination. The myth speaks of a beautiful woman, whom the Hewitt Odos call Manea Tiriza, who becomes the lover of Kuyobinaima, the owner of the fruits, the serpent without eyes, the god owner of aromas. Having discovered their love, because Manea Tiriza's pregnancy is already noticeable, the young woman's mother confronts God and, ignoring his promise of food and fruits in abundance for the community, a promise that is formulated in the language of aromas, destroys it or expels it. From that moment on, a time of deprivation begins in which humans are forced to consume only meat, which is seen by the indigenous people as a descent into animality. We are not tigers to eat only meat, says one of the chiefs. The young woman secretly continues to feed on the gifts of God, white yucca formed by the foam of the ravine, and her son is a tree that grows full of different flowers and fruits. Only his mother has access to the countless fruits that the tree produces but the community, eager for so much food, manages to find the metal axe that allows them to fell it. The trunk, huge. The height, huge. The weight, huge. The noise, immense. This process of felling a huge and prodigal tree narrates the birth of the river. The splinters fly into fish, the countless branches become rivers, the enormous trunk becomes the Amazon, the mother of waters, the river tree of fruits, the river tree of food. And from the death of the tree transfigured into a river the jungle is sprouting. Another of the fundamental myths is that of the great serpent. The being that slides down the rivers and is the rivers, that undulates and coils, that ascends through the trees uniting the underwater and subterranean world with the world of the surface, that extends its skin through the sky forming the drawing of the constellations, that being that inhabits all spaces and that leaves snake skins along the way, also becoming owner of time, is the living symbol of the jungle, and one of the mythical stories also shows it as the canoe snake that is it. Advances it forms the river, and that carries on its back the creatures that will populate the jungle. The gigantic Amazonian anaconda, Eunectes murinus, with its powerful body, its magnitude, and its colors, satisfies the demands of the myth for the imagination. Throughout this region the stones often bear magical inscriptions and drawings, and just as in the lands of the Mayans and the Incas traces are often found that appear innocuous, but in whose repeated scheme geologists and archaeologists could see that it was about maps of the sky, here the snake motif is one of the forms that return, a sinuous line that ends in a circle with the eye in its center, a succession of arcs in which a few features suggest faces, a human figure, of which one leg expands into a snake. In these stones, the discreet but ancient and widespread presence of humans in the Amazonian world can be seen, it is everywhere the testimony of the hundreds of indigenous peoples who continue to inhabit it. The Spanish conquerors passed through there centuries ago. In 1541 Gonzalo Pizarro spent the wealth he obtained in the looting of Cuzco by setting up a delirious expedition in search of the country of spices dreaming that he would find countries sown with cinnamon behind the ice walls of the Quito Mountains. Hundreds of Spaniards, thousands of Indians, 
thousands of laden llamas, ferocious dogs and grumpy pigs made up that expedition whose failure meant death for countless natives. After that hell, Captain Francisco de Orellana, embarked with sixty men in a newly built brigantine, was dragged, apparently against his will, by the united waters of the Coca River and the Napo River, leaving Pizarro and his men abandoned in the jungle, and sailed for several months at the mercy of the river, between hostile banks from which arrows rained down every time they tried to land. That was how the Europeans discovered the longest and most secret road in America, that river that widened endlessly with the incessant tribute of the flows, between jungles that grew on both sides and of which they could know almost nothing as they descended lost, ignoring its course until it became impossible to see the other shore, because that extension already seemed like a sea. Only the certainty that it was still fresh water that was dragging them, and the rush of that mass of water that sometimes seems to sweep away entire mountains in its fury, continued to show them that it was a river. There are those who say that fortunately it was Orellana who discovered it, that fortunately Pizarro was abandoned and had to return in the midst of great hardship to Peru, where a few years later he would meet his death because the greed and thirst for domination of the Pizarros would have converted early to the Amazon basin in the hell that only came to be centuries later. How many adventures, how many trips, how many ambitions slid century after century through the busy waters of that river to which Pablo Neruda has said, pondering its planetary dimension, the moon cannot watch over you nor measure you. Following in the footsteps of Orellana, the brave and cruel Pedro de Urshua organized twenty years later a conquest expedition that soon changed leaders, when a conspiracy of soldiers assassinated the captain, and left the troops under the command of Lope de Aguirre and his men's. Those first expeditions typified what would later become the long history of the Amazon basin, and the contrast between two radically different ways of relating to it, that of the conquerors who always sought to plunder the forest and dominate it and that of the natives who seek to understand it and survive in it without greed. The conquerors saw it as a cruel and destructive vortex, they had to advance with helmets and armor, with their viscera lowered in the midst of the oppressive heat, with their swords ready and cursing fate, while the indigenous know how to live naked in it, with the agility of monkeys, with the stealth of snakes and with respect for the mystery of multiform life. That is why some went crazy before an indomitable nature, always hostile and unknown, and the others always knew how to feel part of it, to live that green labyrinth as a home and a country. The Europeans of that time came to the jungle like many settlers today and like many large companies, to make quick wealth, to look for crops that could be exploited intensively, to look for or plant forests of a single species as they are found in Europe. But the Amazonian lands are both exuberant and poor, they depend on diversity to survive since in the jungle everything feeds on everything else but everything at the same time is supported by everything, and in such a way that it is difficult to find in the world such a fragile, intimately related and interdependent living system. Pretending to obtain easy wealth through the deforestation of the forest for livestock or for the exclusive cultivation of certain plant species supposes ignoring the fundamental thing, that the wealth of the forest is its integrity, and that this is a shared wealth of the human race since from there much of the air and water that make our lives possible come from. The great snake of the Amazon, with its forests and its myths, is a guarantee of life for the entire planet, but this poses a challenge to human wisdom, what the forest provides, it can only provide for everyone, for communities and finally for the humanity, whoever wants to obtain profits only for himself, whoever wants to derive petty profits from it, will necessarily have to destroy it and with it destroy the future. The millinery life in America In addition to the unifications that the great empires were carrying out century after century, many indications prove that communications between peoples were ancient. The vestiges of the work of the men of Puerto Hormiga, on the Colombian north coast, found in the Mississippi Delta, the salt loaves of the Muiscas used in Peru, the gold ritual objects of the Chibchas, found among the Incas, the way in which the languages of the Amazonian peoples are related to the languages of the Caribbean, facts that could be multiplied with the memory of each people, are proof of long pilgrimages, of reciprocal influences, of established businesses, and this leads us to verify one of the many paradoxes of our history, 
the native peoples were better communicated with each other than the communities of this America at the end of the Spanish colony or at the beginning of the existence of the republics. To understand it, it is necessary to postulate a sequence of historical events. It can be said that, 1. The millenary history had not fully united, but had brought the peoples together, and in some parts of the territory had configured homogeneous nations and cultures. 2. The arrival of the Europeans, with their campaign of conquest, brought about a vast and tragic process of destruction and concealment of all that previous reality, but at the same time it provided the languages and customs that would finally propitiate a continental culture. 3. The colonial centuries made us Europeans, transferred to America the elements that definitively united the American continent with the order of Western culture, although they kept our nations in a kind of late Middle Ages the same one that had been folded, after its brilliant imperial age, the Spanish society. 4. The process of independence put the emphasis on our American condition, but less as a radical effort to recognize ourselves than as an attempt to break with Spain and seek inspiration in the other nations of Europe. 5. The beginning of our independent life isolated us into highly dependent village republics and further severed the original ties between the various regions. 6. Great liberal reforms in many countries and the cultural modernism of the late 14th century renewed the ties between nations, opened the doors of the long-delayed modernity, and made us contemporary with the rest of the world. 7. The convulsive history of the 20th century turned us into complex and dramatic protagonists of modernity, in confused and violent realities but also in one of the continents full of human resourcefulness and in one of the most influential cultures of the contemporary world. It is good to look at this process in detail, to notice our possibilities and also our limitations, and thus glimpse the horizons and historical duties of Mestizo America, of which we can well say that it is a great possible country, one of the most richest, most resourceful and most hopeful in the world. What came from Europe? The expansive will of the European society of the Renaissance was irrepressible. The suspicion that there was a world behind the great ocean had haunted the conscience of that continent since ancient times, and had been renewed with the words that Dante attributed to Ulysses in some fiery verses from hell, in which it is clearly warned that the spirits the most perceptive of Europe sensed solid lands to the west of the Dark Sea. There Ulysses tells Dante that after returning to Ithaca he embarked again with his companions, sailed west to the Pillars of Hercules, and invited the sailors to enter the unknown ocean. To go after the sun through that sea without people. Until after five months a mountain appeared as high as they had never seen before. And there a wind that rose from the new land capsized the ship, burying Ulysses and his men in the depths of the sea. That literary foreboding is enough to feel how since the end of the Middle Ages it was possible for the European imagination to foresee what the Age of Discoveries would later confirm. The circumstances of Columbus's first voyage, subsequent expeditions and later adventures of conquest are well known, but perhaps we have not thought enough about the many implications of that encounter. Spain, daughter of multiple invasions by Iberians, Celts and Phoenicians, Carthaginians and Romans, Visigoths and Moors, struggled to be a homogeneous nation under the rule of the Catholic monarchs, but history took another course and imposed an imperial destiny. The same year of the banning of the Jews and the expulsion of the Moorish kings from Granada, facts that strengthened the ideal of a Spain closed in on itself and subject only to the precepts of Rome, the success of Columbus in his oceanic adventure extended a disturbing way the realm of concerns and possibilities of the kingdom. The Portuguese, for their part, had embarked on the circumnavigation of Africa and the conquest of the seas of the East, and much of the world seemed to depend at that time on the impulses and ambitions of the arms and the indicated men of the Iberian Peninsula. Thirty years had not elapsed since the discovery of America and the establishment of the Spanish nation, when the young heir Charles I of Spain also became Charles V of Germany and under his scepter the largest empire known in history until then was formed. That boy governed Spain and Germany, Flanders and Milan, Naples and the fleets of the Mediterranean, America and the Philippines, and under his command the greatest conquests and the greatest destructions of his time were accomplished, the devastation of Tenochtitlan and the subjugation of the Aztecs by Hernán Cortés in 1521, 
the violent sacco of Rome and other Italian cities in 1527, the kidnapping and murder of Atahualpa and the sack of Cusco by Francisco Pizarro in 1532, the subjugation of the Pearl Coasts of the Caribbean, the conquest of the Kingdom of Tuscaysusa in the Bogota Savannah in 1538, the war against Solomon at the Gates of the East, the discovery of the Amazon River in 1541, the meticulous advance of the conquerors on American territory. Under the imperial flag, where the double-headed eagle was interwoven, and to the war cry of Santiago, which meant death for the natives of America, the Spanish warriors advanced, Francisco Bobadilla against Coenabo and Anacayana in Hispaniola, an island today divided between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, Balboa and his father-in-law Pedro Rios de Vila over Panama, Hernan Cortes against Moctezuma and Cua Hudamac in the lands of Mexico, Diego Velázquez on Cuba, Juan Ponce de Leon against Guarayanex and Yauribo on the island of Borican, later to be called Puerto Rico, Diego de Ordaz on the Gulf of Peria, Ortal and Sedano by the Orinoco and against Bacunar on the island of Trinidad, Francisco de Garay on Jamaica, Ambrosio Alfinger, Giorgio Spira, Felipe de Houdin and Nicolas de Federman with their German conquerors over the lands of Venezuela and New Granada, Alonso de Ojeda and Rodrigo de Bastidas along the coast of Tierra Firme, Cabeza de Vaca over Florida. Francisco Pizarro and Diego de Almagro against Atahualpa in the Inca Mountains, Sebastian de Balalcazar through the lands of Pasta, Papayan, and Cali, Pedro de Heredia on the plains of Sinu, Gonzalo Jimenez de Quesada against Tuscaysusa in the Kingdom of the Chipchas and against Yuldama in the country of the Gualis, Hernando de Soto over Florida, Juan Diaz de Solis over the region of the Rio de la Plata, and Valdivia against the Araucanians of Chile. Francisco de Orellana first, and then Pedro de Urshua and his executioner Lope de Aguirre through the jungle and the Amazon River. Made to conquer, Spain and Portugal came to conquer, and it must be recognized that other peoples of Europe would hardly have been able to carry out such an excessive and brutal process, so meticulously full of heroism, cruelty, and hardship. Proof of this was the moderate success of the conquering expedition of the Germans, financed by the bankers Welser and Fugger, who needed to collect the money they had lent to Charles V to buy the crown of the German Empire. Those plumed companies led by the brave Ambrosio Alfinger, the sagacious Fetterman, and the beautiful and betrayed and bloodied Felipe de Houdin, saw their luck blighted by the adversity of American nature, and they were unable to survive the rudeness of the Spanish soldiers, who they saw them as rivals. It cannot be ignored that with the conquering Europe came the discovering Europe, and that this double presence betrays the discord that at that time tore the old world apart, and above all the surprising, distorted, and violent empire of Charles V. The Pizarras came but also Oviedo and Las Casas, the genocides came but also the observers of nature, the destroyers of towns and erasers of cultures came, but Juan de Castellanos also came, those who sought to loot came but also those who made an effort to live together. And that is why, because not only bandits, looters, and murderers arrived in America but also some representatives of Latin humanism and the Renaissance, that the mestizos of America are irrevocably European. America is the only continent that has linked its destiny in an indissoluble way to that of Europe. This did not happen with Asia, invaded successively by Alexander, by the Romans, by the Crusaders, by Napoleon's troops, by the British Empire. Just as Europe entered Turkey and Persia, Russia, and India, Ceylon and the Indo-Chinese Peninsula, it also left there again without substantially modifying those worlds. It came to America to stay, and to understand it you have to think about the complexity of Spain and Portugal in the 16th century. That traffickers, ex-convicts, violent captains and factional expeditionaries traveled is not strange. What is strange is that the conquest was accompanied by the rumors of the chroniclers, who insisted on describing and recognizing that new world, and that in an almost always unsuccessful they tried to convince Europe of the wonders they saw, and even of the wonders they imagined. It is useful to attempt a list, necessarily incomplete, of those who tried with their chronicles to respond to the irreducible strangeness of that historical encounter, and to describe the newly found orb and the realities that occupied it.
Columbus was undoubtedly the first, through the letters in which he reported his discovery, and the diaries in which he recorded, with varying accuracy, what he had seen, Amerigo Vespucio follows, whose letters affirmed the New World character of the continent and finally determined its name. One of the first historians was Gonzalo Fernández de Oviedo, author of a summary of the natural history of the Indies and later a general and natural history of the Indies, full of descriptions and observations obtained both during his stay in Santo Domingo and in Santa Maria la Antigua del Darien, the first and fleeting city of the jungles of Yoruba. Then there is Hernán Cortés, of whom the relationship letters not only recount administrative acts and warlike deeds, but also make geographical, social, political, and cultural observations of great importance. A fundamental chronicle was written by Bernal Díaz del Castillo in The True History of the Conquest of New Spain, which is not only a description full of direct knowledge and precious details of the Mexican world already with full American flavor, but a work with purposes intellectuals that inaugurates the controversy on approaches and evaluations of the conquest, in more than one sense a founding work of the critical conscience of the Mestizo America. Alonso de Zuazo was a chronicler of Hispaniola, Pascual de Andagoya, chronicler of Panama and general visitor of the Castillo de Oro Indians, Pedro de Alvarado, author of three reports from Guatemala for his boss Hernán Cortés, Francisco Antonio Pigafetta, excessive and fantastic chronicler of the fantastic and excessive circumnavigation of the world by Magellan and Elcano, Pedro de Valdivia and Antonio de Quiroga reported on the conquest of Chile, and Alonso de Ursula wrote, inspired by it. His beautiful and original poem La Araucana. Diego de Almagro sent the emperor accounts of his advance through Chile, after his alliance with Pizarro had been broken, Bartolomé de las Casas, the best known of all, in addition to his history of the Indies, wrote his famous brief account of the destruction of the Indies, which in its time was a powerful example of the critical spirit that coexisted in Spain with the dogmatism of the inquisitors and with the cruelty of the conquerors. Three general chroniclers, Pedro Martyr de Angulria, Francisco López de Gomara and Juan Gines de Sepulveda wrote their works in Spain, consulting the incessant documents that arrived from America, the first translating everything into Latin, the second developing the relations of Cortés and the third arguing with Las Casas based on information taken from Oviedo's books. Juan de Castellanos is not only the most extensive chronicler of the conquest of the Caribbean, Colombia, and Venezuela, of the first expeditions through the Amazon and of the first attacks by the English pirates, but he is the only one of them all who proposed turn those stories into a poem of disproportionate dimensions, elegies of illustrious men of the Indies, and that therefore granted autonomous literary value to the events it narrated, trying to tell and sing at the same time. The greatest chroniclers of the conquest of the Inca Empire are Pedro Cieza de Leon, who from 1535 was in Sinu, Yoruba, and Lima, and wrote a very complete and admirable history of Peru, and Augustin de Zarate, author of A History of the Discovery and Conquest of Peru, which ends with the death of Gonzalo Pizarro, defeated by La Gassia. The conquest of the Rio de la Plata was narrated by the German Ulderico Schmidel in his Derrotero y Viaja a España y las Indias, and by Pedro Fernández in the book Naufragios y Dados, which recounts the adventures of the almost mythical Álvar Núñez Cabeza de Vaca. But it is also necessary to mention Fray Antonio de Guevara, authors of significant letters such as Pedrarias de Vila, Hernando Pizarro, Cristóbal de Mina. Rapporteur of the Atahualpa kidnapping and the Cajamarca massacre, Bernardino de Sehagan, Pedro de Aguado, Baltasar Dorantes de Carranza, Juan Suarez de Peralta, Geronimo de Mendieta, Toribio de Benavente, and Geronimo de la Torre Aguirre. But of course, at this point it is necessary to note that not all those who described America saw America. Perhaps he is right who said that we only see in things what we put into them and one of the most curious chapters of our history would refer to the way in which many Europeans who had not yet left the Middle Ages found in America everything they had been looking for. In vain in Europe forever. The legend of El Dorado was a feverish and bloody extension of the medieval alchemists' obsession with gold. But it is important to point out that the alchemists were looking for something more than wealth in gold, they were looking for a kind of spiritual or symbolic dimension that gave this metal a mysterious superiority over the others.
In this there was a proximity with the meaning given to gold by the natives of America, for whom it was a manifestation of the solar divinity, sacred matter of their cults, ornament, and condensation of light. Even golden bats lavished, transmuting the darkness into objects of light. And one of the forgotten consequences, it is said, of the discovery of American gold, and of the way in which the gold wars multiplied the horror and suffering of human beings, was the abandonment by the alchemists of the search for the secret of the transmutation of metals. Gold, which had become the object of covetousness and plunder and the justification for all horror, seemed to lose its profound appeal to them. It was also said that the conquerors had found the fountain of youth on the island of Bimini, the legend of the Amazons that Aurelana saw in the jungle, although it was an intuitive recognition of the feminine divinity that presides over the mythical universe of these regions, was also an effort to find some familiar element in an incomprehensible world, even if it belonged to the kingdom of God. The Fantasy Everywhere delirious travelers saw giants and dwarfs in the native towns, mermaids and dragons in the manatees and alligators. And as the newly revealed Arabian Nights were to do in the 18th century, America's real riches, partial evidence and fanciful projections intoxicated the imagination of Europeans from the 16th century on. Erasmus of Rotterdam saw in America the providential territory where the religion of Christ would survive the impiety of that time, Thomas More saw in the American nations the prefiguration of his utopia, and Montaigne could affirm that he envied the simplicity and naturalness with which the children of Brazil lived naked in the proximity of nature, far from the intrigues of the courts and the artificiality of life in their world. Something in the conscience of that Europe lived longing for that reunion with the simplicity of life. Since the time of Diogenes, the ideal of a simple life, without artifice and without ostentation, has returned to the dream of the philosophers and the preaching of the prophets. Something in the primitive Christian cult of poverty, and in its medieval revival by Francis of Assisi, found its most secret desire in that simplicity, although perhaps in the case of America the natives were far from corresponding to the ascetic ideals of Christ and of the Italian saint. In the same times of the conquest, that ideal returned in these verses of Fray Luis de Leon. I want to live with me. I want to enjoy the good that I owe to heaven, alone, without a witness, free from love, from zeal, from hate, from hope, and from suspicion. And the Sevillian who wrote the Epistola Moral did not seem to yearn for anything else. A half-life I possessed. A style so fair and weighted, that no one who sees it notices it. With threatening crosses and generous swords, with abstract languages and spiritual religion, with heroism and cruelty, with the annihilation of entire races and the raising of fantastic cities, with the sowing of wheat and the construction of slender brigantines in the encased rivers of the mountains, with temples and cattle, maps and printing presses, navigations and chains, Europe was changing America forever, but inevitably, as that great American, German Arseniegos, has so well shown, also. With thousands of tons of gold and silver, with pearls and emeralds, with wood and legends, with the accumulation of capital and the work of its multitudes, with the evidence of its cultures and the singularity of its peoples, with its delusions and its visions, with its feverish myths, with the horizon of questions that it suspended over the timeless truths of tradition, America was changing Europe forever. It was impossible to foresee that from all these verifications and all these idealizations something as complex and as full of consequences as Rousseau's doctrine of the noble savage, which inspired the Romantics and the revolutionaries of the late 18th century, would emerge over the centuries. But also naturalism, ethnology and anthropology, the new awareness of the dignity of the natural universe and the new awareness of the validity of different cultures had, in the discovery of America and its immolation, a starting point. The Collect of the Worlds It is exciting to trace the moments of this dialogue between Europe and America, the meetings and disagreements that have marked this already long history of reciprocal dependencies and also disappointments and disappointments. The adventure of the 16th century marks the birth of a double consciousness for the children of Mestizo America, that of being children of both the conquered and the conquerors, that of being heirs to the victims and the executioners. This difficult condition tends to make many truths relative and seems to always require us, the children of that fusion, 
to think about everything at the same time from culture and from nature, from reason and from myth, from logical thought and from magical thinking. The American indigenous peoples were decimated by cultures blindly convinced of their superiority, the triumph of force seemed to be enough to grant philosophical legitimacy to the victors against the vanquished. Much was said about the barbarity of the natives, but the same emperor Moctezuma, who had once ordered the demolition of a temple because its structure and its layout did not conform to the correct astronomical guidelines, was the one who told Hernan Cortes with great sensibly that it was not necessary to topple the statues of the Aztec gods with such violence, that if the conquerors explained to them why he and his people were wrong, they would be willing to correct their mistakes. The extermination was also often justified by arguing the revulsion that the cannibalism of the natives caused in the Christians. But at the beginning of the 19th century Humboldt jokingly noted, I think, however, that the cannibalism of the inhabitants of those Antilles has been quite exaggerated in the tales of the first travelers. A serious and judicious historian, Herrera, has not disdained including those stories in the historical decades, he has even attested to this extraordinary accident that made the Caribs renounce their barbaric customs. The natives of a small island having devoured a Dominican friar kidnapped off the coast of Puerto Rico, they all got sick and did not want to eat anyone, religious or secular. Among the many things that must be considered about the nations that populated the territory of America at the arrival of the Spaniards, the most important are undoubtedly respect for some codes of honor, and the type of alliance they had with nature. Between the Aztec Empire and the Inca Empire there were numerous differences, but if they agreed on something it was in the way in which all their acts, the beautiful and the terrible alike, were inscribed in a ceremonial order and had their justification in the context of culture. To which they belonged. In light of our canons today, many ancient behaviors in all corners of the world are unacceptable. The biblical legend of Abraham meekly going to sacrifice his son Isaac in the mountains at God's command reveals the custom of human sacrifices, and even family sacrifices, within the primitive Jewish religion, and in the immolation of Christ himself symbolically offers us a revival of that figure of the sacrificed son. This custom of immolating human beings on the altars of divinity and truth was not an ancient custom abandoned by the Europeans, it was a custom alive at the time of the discovery of America, and when the soldiers and priests of the conquest sincerely declared their astonishment and their rejection before the ritual sacrifices that were carried out in the Aztec altars, they did not notice that in those same times the Holy Inquisition sacrificed in the altars of the Christian God countless human beings accused of impiety and heresy. The innumerable pyres that lit up the fields of religion are the evident part of that ritual that persisted at that time. At least it was a public and highly visible custom, like that of the Aztecs themselves, with the difference that they did not slander or demonize their victims in the manner of the Inquisition, but rather treated the sacrificed as sacred beings, but in Europe of that time there were crueler and less frank customs, and what the Holy Inquisition did in its dungeons, with racks, hooks and tongs, and with braziers that they brought to the feet of their immobilized victims, far from the public eye. It was less justifiable in the light of ceremonial codes. The interpretation of history bequeathed to us by our grandparents, the conquerors, put the emphasis on the barbarism of the natives of America, and did not consider the barbarism of the Europeans of their time. It is curious that the peoples who carried out one of the greatest genocides in the history of humanity, have been applied to declare barbarians and savages to the peoples who were their victims, perhaps trying to legitimize the massacre. The death of millions of Americans between the 16th and 17th centuries is usually attributed to only one of its causes, what we now call biological shock, which triggered great epidemics of pneumonia and smallpox in the most densely populated indigenous areas of the continent, and not there is no doubt that in certain regions the reduction of the population had mainly that cause. But seeing the engravings of the time and listening to the testimony of all those who witnessed the early days, we understand that other causes contributed decisively to the decline of the American population. It is not necessary to resort to the most distressed and alarmed historians, such as Bartolomé de las Casas, who was accused of spreading a black legend of the conquest by those who spread the pink legend. Many eyewitnesses recounted how the military clash took place and we cannot have many illusions about the humanity of the first conquerors, nor about their attitude towards the natives.
but a third element of the annihilation process was the rigor of the work imposed on the subjugated peoples. Juan de Castellanos, who was in America since 1539 and managed to talk with many early adventurers, when listing the causes of death, does not even remember the epidemics, instead he lists the other causes, including suicide out of desperation. And so it was that the men who came. In the first years they were such that they consumed innumerable natural Indians without restraint, so great was the haste that they gave them in the use of crops and metals, and the torments were so excessive that they killed themselves at times. The hardest hearts lament, in islands so ad plenum overcrowded, to see that out of millions of millions traces or footsteps are no longer seen, and that such widespread populations are all defeated and devastated, and of them there will be no living man that is their own thing sorry. We can well say that most of the native peoples of America respected at the time of the invasion codes of honor similar to those that had prevailed in Europe some twenty centuries ago, if we are to believe the Homeric poems. Only the reverential observance of those codes by the Aztecs could allow Hernan Cortes, at the head of only four hundred men, to take over in such a short time an empire of millions, and only the respect of the Incas for the laws of hospitality allowed Francisco Pizarro with 168 brutal soldiers, to have been able to assassinate in one afternoon 7,000 people from Atahualpa's entourage, and disconcert the army of the Son of the Sun in Cajamarca with his lightning-making cannons, when the Inca, who would have able to attack the invaders with his 80,000 archers, he accepted an invitation to dinner and, to show his confidence and his will for peace, he arrived at the camp with his entire court unarmed and dressed in ceremonial dress. From the perspective of strength and destructiveness, the Europeans were more advanced, and the American peoples were backward, naive, and docile. But from the perspective of a true civilization, one must always ask who is more civilized, the one who kills or the one who respects, if the one who is blinded by his dogma or the one who doubts, if the one who in the name of greed does not stop before anything or one who governs their actions and their passions by a coherent system of values. The second element that I have mentioned is the relationship of the native peoples with nature. It is enough to allude to it the discovery that Anne Osborne made of the myths of the UWA of the Sierra Nevada del Coqui in eastern Colombia. The anthropologist confirmed that on certain days the UWA community gathers to listen to the speaker narrate the myth of the flight of the earwigs. This consists of a long enumeration of words in the language of the community. Anne Osborne noticed that this enumeration caused a deep emotion in people, she wanted to find out what the words meant and discovered that they were an accurate mention of places. He then wanted to know if that sequence formed a precise route, and he not only learned that it was a description of the borders of the UWA country, but also found that route strewn with ancient ritual posts. But that border had not been drawn haphazardly, the UWA claimed descent from eagle men who arrived from the north long ago. Every year those eagles called earwigs, and whose scientific name is Elawids forficatus, come in migratory flocks from North America, and before continuing their course towards the south of the continent they fly over the country of the UWA following exactly the route that the myth describes. The annual return of the eagles marks for the community the moment to renew the alliance with the territory and to evoke the arrival of the ancestors, in time immemorial. This myth embodied in the present life of the community, would suffice to show the wisdom and depth of the relationships they maintain with the territory, but the UWA also have particular myths for the trees, for the fish, and for the many elements of their culture and their relationship with the world. Whoever knows the poetics of Holderlin or Novalis will understand that this relationship with nature, made of respect and a will to alliance, which the highest poets of Germany claimed as the only deep and true one, is somehow the one practiced by these people's American natives. And to go through the mythologies of the different indigenous nations of the territory is to find countless original ways of establishing a respectful and sacred relationship with the natural universe, expressed in myths of great beauty and profound meaning. They always knew how to live with the land, and they never conceived a social order that was at odds with it. Rather, they seemed to profess a philosophy close to the Tao of the Orientals, intervene minimally in nature, and only do so after complex rituals and ceremonies designed to elaborate the thought that guides these transformations. For this reason, despite the many civilizations that developed on the continent, 
the American land was still an almost virgin world at the arrival of the civilization that upset everything, and what could have most astonished the first Europeans must have been the exuberance of life in all its forms. That exuberance, with which the children of the continent knew how to live, could well be intolerable for the newcomers, and not only for the Spanish. Before, it would be said that of all the peoples that occupied America, the Spanish were the most capable of adapting and coexisting with a world so different from the one to which they belonged. Other peoples, before settling in a certain region, usually bring to it all the things that make them comfortable, eliminate everything that does not resemble them, and build an environment tailored to their customs and expectations. Before adapting to the world, they need to adapt the world to their lifestyle, and the strength of their character makes them feel that wherever they go, their land of origin arrives with them. That is why it is understood that the territory of the United States has been almost entirely Europeanized and that this has required the total extermination of the native peoples, the domestication of nature, the full power of science and technology. In general, the conquerors felt that the exuberance of American nature had to be combated and overcome. This is how Castellanos describes the attitude of the Catholic monarchs before the news of the discovery of a new world. They would like these singular kings. In these his broad lordships. That even the savannas and mangroves. And all the banks of the rivers. Vineyards and olive groves will return to them. And not huge empty fields. But to make the land profitable. And in them you will never see idle people. Everything tended to cause them anxiety and discomfort, the thickness of the forests, the torrential flow of the rivers, the abundance of animals, the enormity of the storms. Where a contemporary naturalist, entomologist or ornithologist might have seen the multiplicity of life's manifestations, the profusion of forms, colors, reproductive systems, symbioses, and life cycles, adventurers saw insufferable swarms of insects, pests and weeds because they came from a culture accustomed to only considering acceptable what was immediately useful to man. The natives find a justification for nature in itself, they do not disdain it in the name of reason or spirit, and through intuition, instinct and rhythm, languages that weave mythologies, they understand the world in its complexity, in a way that we still need to study with deep attention because the salvation of many essential things for the future could well depend on that familiarity and that knowledge. Perhaps today we are again capable of that subtlety, and it has certainly been a century of ethnology and anthropology, disciplines that finally sensitized the conquering nations, which has allowed Western societies to assume, almost for the first time, that the West not only has things to teach but things to learn from the cultures it initially only cared about dominating and plundering. Looting is secondary, a little more gold does not make a world definitely rich or poor but the indifference and rude contempt towards the cultural treasures of the peoples and their ancient knowledge do trace a style and configure a dangerous error. Just as the codices of the Aztecs were stupidly destroyed by the conquerors, there was a persistent effort, as German Arseniegos has shown, not to discover but rather to cover. For hiding everything that was specifically American, and the work of the true discoverers and the true civilizers became blurred, while our countries applied themselves to the senseless task of glorifying warriors and genocide as paladins. Men like Francisco Pizarro, like Hernan Cortés, like Sebastián de Belalcázar, like Alvarado and like Pedro de Heredia preside over an absurd mythology of butchers and conquerors throughout the continent, while men like Bartolomé de las Casas, like Vasco de Quiroga, like Fernández de Oviedo, like Juan de Castellanos, who made an effort to experience this process with respect, generosity and wonder, who worked their entire lives for the alliance of the worlds and for the construction of a shared culture, remain in a discreet shadow. Too similar to oblivion and even disdain. What came from Africa? In an effort to overcome what Nietzsche called the spirit of revenge, Jorge Luis Borges once wrote that Carlos V.S. decision to bring blacks from Africa to exhaust themselves in the laborious hells of the Antillean gold mines not only we owe him the atrocities of slavery and the 500,000 dead of the civil war in the United States, but also Handy's Blues, the success achieved in Paris by the oriental doctor-painter Don Pedro Figari, the impetuous film Hallelujah, The Dark. One who murdered Martin Fierro, the deplorable rumba El Monicero, 
the arrested and imprisoned Napoleonism of Toussaint Louverture, the Havanan mother of Tango, Candom. His ironic humor points to the essential, there are no events in history, however good they may be, that do not run the risk of producing harmful consequences, there are no evil events that do not run the risk of producing beneficial results. What is forbidden to us is justifying atrocious acts due to their possible beneficial consequences, or proscribing noble acts due to the risk of unfortunate consequences. Ethics is not defined by the consequences of acts but by the value that we grant to them in their present. It is already quite ironic and representative of the complexity of the world to see that the one who recommended the importation of blacks was the one who most vehemently condemned the oppression and annihilation of the Native Americans by the Spanish adventurers, Bartolomé de las Casas. It is impossible to know how many Africans were hunted on their continent by the safaris of the Dutch, Portuguese, Spanish, English, and other Europeans. The figure of between 13 and 15 million in three centuries could be approximate. One must try to imagine the raids on the beaches of Guinea, the Congo, and Angola, the meticulous suffering of millions of human beings captured and torn from their lands forever, separated from their loved ones by procedures that cannot be compared with the procedure of the Nazis with the Jews or the Gypsies half a century ago, transferred to a world they knew nothing about and in iniquitous conditions. You have to try to imagine the crossings. These were already ungrateful for the Spanish adventurers who enjoyed freedom and who traveled voluntarily, the holds of the ships were infected places, rest was almost impossible, the provisions were just, the water was measured, the physiological functions had to be fulfilled in a mortifying way. And the crossings were subject to the hazards of time and climate, with its risk of disease and storms. But that was a luxury compared to transporting slaves. Just look at the diagrams of the English slave ship Brooks, in the 17th century, which shows the cold efficiency in the arrangement of bodies to make the most of space. Hundreds of slaves lying next to each other, in parallel rows, following the layout of the superimposed platforms, produce the impression of motley immobile termite mounds and force one to think of those endless journeys, the impossible hygiene, the unlikely nutrition for those chained beings. Up to a quarter, or perhaps more, of the slaves captured and transported died before reaching their destination and were given over to the appetite of the sea. It is not certain that the names that the slaves brought corresponded to their place of origin. Angolas, Congos, Minas, Mandingos, Carabales used to be names of the shipping ports. From the moment they became slaves they no longer belonged to their community or family, in vain would they long to hear of their people and their world again and their destinations were even more diverse than their origins. First scattered throughout the Antilles, the silver mines of Mexico and Peru were later the destination of numerous shipments. In Brazil, the main entry points were for a long time Bahia and Pernambuco. They were taken to the other regions of the mainland by two borders, the port of Buenos Aires, at the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, which sent them to the Andean Mountains, and the receiving ports for the Caribbean which were Veracruz and Cartagena de Indias. To the derivations that Borges lists ironically, we could add many others. Beyond the hell that their transfer to the new lands implied and the infamy of the centuries of slavery, the presence of Africa is one of the most important components of the colonization of the continent and also represents one of the most colossal transfers of human masses in the history of the world. Recent times have seen the multiplication of its consequences, and one of the most important is the demographic growth of the Afro-American population and its growing presence in the social, cultural, and political life of the continent. America is inconceivable without the African contribution and without so many historical circumstances in which its presence has been felt, without the rebellion of the Black Maroons of Panama, subdued by the cruelty of Pedro de Urshua, without the struggles of the Ethiopian Galaman on the island of Cuba as recounted in the poem Miss Pejo de Paciencia without the black man who discovered the Mucuras covered in gold chagualas during Pedro de Heredia's expedition through Sinu, without the black servant who warned Pedro de Urshua in vain of Lope de Aguirre's conspiracy to kill him, without the thousands of tons of gold and silver that the slaves extracted in the mines of the Antilles, of the north of Mexico, of Potosi, and of New Granada, and that built the modernity of Europe.
without the Princess of Gambia in Maria by Jorge Isaacs and without those songs of Bogas. If the moon doesn't come together, Boga, Boga, that my black girl will be so alone, cry, cry. It is inconceivable without the black nurse in the poems of Aurelio Arturo, without the Caribbean sounds and the Cuban boleros, without the black and mulatto troops of the liberating armies, without the manumissions of the 19th century, without the battalion of Pardas and Morenos in Argentine independence, without the tangos and cumbias, without the mambo and salsa, without the carnivals of Rio, without the trumpets of Matanzas and the marimbas of Jamaica, without the drums and the rumbas of Papa Montero, without the voodoo of the Haitians and the Santeria of the Cubans, without the declaration of love by Helcius Martin Gongora. The marine algae and the fish are witnesses that I wrote your beloved name in the sand many times. Without the continental erudition of Pedro Henriquez Urena, without Chango and Yemea, without the Yoruba of the Caribbean and without the flowers in the sanctuary of the Virgin de la Caridad del Cabra in Santiago, without Benny Moore and without Celia Cruz, without Candelario Obeso and Nicolas Guillen, without the poem Aries Bucaneros by Luis Pales Matos, which figures in the rhythm of the Spanish language the motley plurality of Caribbean mulatto, and much of its drunkenness and joy. To the buccaneer dense perfumes. The raw aroma, the brave spice, bergamot and ginger, saffron and cinnamon. Oh, soft chumbo of the creole, of the warm mammy a mulatto. Oops, the wild sour sop that opens its witch flower in the black one. A poem where you feel the complexity and devilish passion of the lands of the continent. To the buccaneer the virgin lands, the indomitable water, the unprecedented sea, the horizons where the bitter pack of the storm howls. Oh, the closed-legged bushes, cunning jaguar, cunning viper. Hui, bogs of false decoration, carnivorous tree, tremendous liana. Oh, lethal shadow of the manzanillo, red haze of the prairies, enveloping miasma of the mangroves, malarial midge of the swamps. And finally, the masterful portrait of an entire era in that delusional Caribbean where worlds merged. At King Philip's Inn. The dice roll and the card flies, while the competing bags launch golden flashes of coins. An orgy night, the dregs of the world seethe in the back of the taverns, between the ringing of the doubloons and the tequid oak of the bottles. Perhaps if the conquest of America had been limited to the clash between haughty and white Europe, philosophical and ruthless, and the native peoples, ferocious or submissive, proud and bitter, discreet and thoughtful, our America today would be a more tense and less cheerful continent. But it is necessary to point out that one of the extenuating facts of this cosmic drama was paradoxically the arrival of the peoples of Africa. Stanislaw Zuleta once pointed out with astonishment that while many indigenous peoples opted for introspection and silence, due to a sort of psychological distance from their European invaders, the children of Africa, despite having lost more, because they were taken from their territory, their memory, and their possessions, deprived of their freedom and subjected to appalling oppression, they never lost their joy, their vitality, their sense of rhythm, their creativity, and their generosity. The theme is thought-provoking, although we cannot be sure whether it is more heinous to be snatched back to the original land and its mythical orders, but to retain the awareness that somewhere in the world that land is still firm and that order is still valid, or see how the motherland where the gods reigned is minutely desecrated and turned into an ergastula. However, it is true that joy and sensuality, vigor and beauty, musicality and simplicity, a sense of color and harmony, are profound contributions of Africa to the mosaic of American societies, despite the cruelty of which it was a victim, not only during the initial times of the slave trade but later, during the centuries of slavery, and still today, in times when cultural integration is based on the assumption that minorities have the privileges of equality only if they renounce their singularity, their memory, and their habits, and join the carnival of the indeterminate. But the vigorous cultures of African origin are throughout the continent a source of aesthetic creations and multiple talents, precisely because they have not broken with their condition, for being able to combine their vigorous languages with those of other cultures and to establish fruitful dialogues and creators with a flexibility that other communities have not yet reached. Of all the regions of Mestizo America, 
it is in the Caribbean where the participation of the children of Africa became more dynamic and definitive, although it is also their presence in the Brazilian territory that makes us feel on the coast of Brazil as a joyous prolongation of the Caribbean universe, so that Rio de Janeiro seems closer to Jamaica than to Montevideo. A good proof that the Mississippi Basin belongs in a powerful way to the Caribbean universe is that the culture of those former slave states of the South, thanks to the presence of African Americans, responds to the same concerns and weaves variations on the same themes. Than that of the Caribbean islands and coasts of South America. We find many common themes in the works of William Faulkner and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which define the extreme frontiers of that Caribbean world and clearly participate in their style. In Lusta Agosto, one of his greatest creations, Faulkner explores that terrible border between the world of whites and that of blacks through the fate of a man whose curse is to be a mulatto, to share in the properties of both races, this does not make it acceptable but on the contrary rejected by both sides, the hatred of the races seems to converge on it with special fury since it represents the greatest of transgressions, the evidence of a love between races that repel each other, the moment of the coexistence and contagion. With amazing detail, Faulkner shows in that pathetic Joe Christmas of his novel A Kind of Scapegoat, and exhibits a world where love is impossible because it requires the approximation of two realities and the renunciation of ironclad systems of prejudice. Not otherwise in Garcia Marquez's clear and sad novel of love and other demons we can notice that border in which what for blacks is life for whites is evil, where a young girl who grows up among blacks is seen by his own culture as a being infected by a kind of malignant plague. Another great creator of the Mississippi, Mark Twain, also makes the friendship between a white boy, Huckleberry Finn, and Jim, a runaway slave, a beautiful parable of innocence and freedom. Nothing like that shared universe of African origin, to bring the North and South American worlds closer together. The Americas What our history suggests is that there are several Mestizo Americas and that one of them is Latin America. There are in turn several Latin Americas and one of them is Hispanic America. But it is also evident that there are several Hispanic Americas, and that the way in which Mexico participates in Hispanity is not the same as the way in which Colombia or Argentina participate. But is it not also necessary to say that there are several Mexicos, as Simpson suggests in his book Many Mexicos, or several Colombias, as the poet Aurelio Arturo suggests when he speaks of a single leaf in which the winds that ran through the beautiful countries where green is of all colors vibrate, the winds that sang through the countries of Colombia. Or even, although they do not fully possess a great pre-Hispanic past, several Argentines, as Jorge Luis Borges seems to suspect, who always speaks of a Buenos Aires of centenarian Creoles and another of 19th century immigrants. Certainly there is the Mexico of Aztec splendor and the Mexico of the miners of the north during the colony the Caribbean Mexico of Tampico and Veracruz and the Mexico of the failed empire of the Habsburgs, the indomitable Mexico of the Reformation and the legendary Mexico of the Revolution. There is the Colombia of the Caribbean and that of the rainy forests of the Pacific, the Colombia of the Catholic small holdings of the Andes and the Colombia of the colonizers of the Llanos, the Colombia of the slave haciendas of Jorge Isaacs and the Colombia of the rubber plantations of the jungle of José Eustagio Rivera, the Colombia of the hundreds of original indigenous nations and the Colombia of more than a century of conquest wars, the Colombia of the Latinists and grammarians of Santafe in the 19th century, and the Colombia of the mafias and guerrillas of the late 20th century, and there is the Argentina of Buenos Aires and that of the Pampas, the white Argentina of the coastal cities and the indigenous Argentina of the mountains of Tucumán. This leads us to think about the way in which from the great original empires and the common fresco of the conquest, so many fragmentations and local fusions derived. History begins far away, and it is not possible to understand many things about our America without looking at its roots, which are sometimes very distant in space and time. We have learned to live this land as if it were really only five centuries old, and this custom favors the magical fact that every so often we are assailed by a vertigo of antiquity. We are like teenagers who are suddenly surprised by memories that only an old man can have. Past lives suddenly appear to us in the form of those stone titans of Easter Island or San Agustin, of those red pyramids of the jungles of Guatemala, 
of those golden cicadas of Malagana, whose perfect and exquisite realism reveals to us that we were wise old men long before we were inexperienced boys. It is true that we have five centuries, since what we are now, throughout the Mestizo continent, is necessarily the fusion of the worlds. Being called Argentina or Colombia or Bolivia supposes a very recent beginning, the resonance of silver in Latin, the memory of Christopher Columbus, the memory of Bolivar, a man from two centuries ago, exalted in the names of a world. It supposes accepting relative beginnings, and believing, by an act of faith, that those well-intentioned and recent words really name the antiquity of the Pampas, the mist of the mountains, the silhouette of the alpacas silhouetted against the ice cliffs. But we have to be willing that in the midst of a reality founded by the travelers of the Renaissance, millennial voices and forces suddenly arise, that in the midst of the peaceful Catholic faith, matriarchal nostalgia resurfaces, that in the center of the altar of the Church of San Francisco in Quito, the sculptor Legarda has made the evocation of the Inca Pachamama appear as a miraculous and beautiful apparition in the form of the winged virgin of the apocalypse. The formation of all peoples is full of conflicts, confrontations, and influences. Spain is a good example of these historical mosaics, with its Celtic villages dominated by Roman watchtowers, with its Carolingian romances shaken by Eastern delicacies, with its Christian cities centered by Moorish palaces, with its Cordoba Mosque, that shadow of infinite columns in whose center a Christian pulpit rests on the pagan image of a white bull that bellows towards the sky. And Spain also needs to reconcile itself with all its yesterdays and forget that bad fever of wanting to be only one thing when history has decided that it should be so many. The bad thing about our reality is not that it is so multiple, the bad thing is the claim that each new contribution is an absolute rupture, the denial of the past, the condemnation of its memory and definitive oblivion. We learn to summarize our history in stages saying, discovery, conquest, colony, independence, and republic. But that list already showed, in the midst of the Republic, the persistence of the conquest. From the moment in which the dreams of the Renaissance, the Age of Discoveries, the maps of Toscanelli, the prophecies of Seneca and Dante, the search for spices and the obsession of Columbus incorporated us into the spiritual and material map of the planet, not only did our new history begin, but world history truly began. Before there were only local, or regional, or at most continental histories. World history is a matter of the last five centuries, and is strictly contemporary with our existence as mestizo nations. How astonishing to understand that the Atlantic Ocean remained throughout history practically untouched by human ships and almost all invisible to the eyes of the species. But the story of our incorporation into the world is full of significant ups and downs, gold and silver, pearls, and emeralds, wood and natural products were the first instruments of that incorporation. The world market was also born there, and that never explored sea, the Atlantic, suddenly became the most navigated sea on the planet, and that Caribbean that we saw in the initial fresco populated by nations that barely traveled the blue shores in their canoes and their canoes, suddenly became a sea of caravels and brigantines, of galleys and frigates, and caravans of galleons crossed its waters fleets from Tierra Firme that came from Cádiz to Veracruz and Cartagena and Portobello, in the foliage of the Panamanian jungles, loaded with merchandise of all kinds, wine barrels, violins, tapestries, silks, furniture, books, and that returned, pushed by the southwest wind, heavy with gold and silver, precious stones, and exotic objects. We are already in the Caribbean of the 16th century, where the rude heroism of the men of conquest and the arrival in our land of that very recent invention of European culture, the individual, are added to the terror and suffering of the peoples. On the background of myths of timeless America, on the feathered serpent and the Inca solar god, on the Pleiades exalted as divinities in Central America and the lunar goddesses of the Chibchas, on the Bacaca of the Sabana and the serpent god of the Huitotos who he spawned the tree of water that nourishes the jungle, on the gods venerated in golden bats and in armies of living rock, jaguars and condors, frogs and stone spheres, a new saga of navigators and bandits arose. It is the vertiginous novel of the Caribbean, with its warriors and its lawyers, with its stone-walled cities and its forbidden loves, 
the lethal lips of Diana from Hispaniola and Malinche from Anahuac, the warlike speeches of Anacayana and the embassies of Catalina in Cartagena, the hells of Cubagua and the paradises of Margarita, the whale hunters of Florida and the warriors dressed as jaguars and bears in Trinidad, the tricks of Balboa and his flag waving in the salty wind of the South Sea. The conquest was vertiginous, and all its protagonists lived the enormous continent as a whole that they travelled as only the men of independence travelled it later. Each one of those terrible and amazing conquerors managed to be everywhere, today we find Pizarro in Santo Domingo and tomorrow in Panama, today he splashes in mud broths among the salamanders of Gorgona Island and tomorrow he enters the coast of Peru. Hernando de Soto is now approaching on his horse the impassive figure of Atahualpa and now he is moving away along the beaches of Florida, Cabeza de Vaca, whose last adventures in Florida are so well known, was first seen fighting in Argentina. That man who is founding San Sebastian de Mariquita, in the Magdalena Valley, Francisco Núñez Pedroso, was part of the group that killed Pizarro shortly before in the city of the Kings of Lima, that Lope de Aguirre that we see today almost anonymous and almost bland in Cartagena, will one day be proclaiming himself king under the tree-line sky of the Amazon jungle. The Colony The conquerors were able to experience our America as a whole, and tried to unify it even more, thanks to the general influence of language and religion. But something in colonial times was responsible for breaking that continental mosaic into pieces and inventing the patient separations that persist to this day. This is paradoxical, and shows that within the imperial government there was also a conflict between those who yearned to incorporate America into the world order, and those who only sought to obtain benefits from it by keeping it in the condition of a tributary subordinate. In the same way, it is easy to see that there was a struggle between those who looked at America and tried to discover it and those who began the arduous and increasingly active process of concealment, trying to make our America just an extension of Europe economically, politically and culturally, so as not to have to admit that, although united to Europe, the New World had to be necessarily different, because it could not get rid of its nature, its past, its own being, because it could not stop being what that it was to make a European physiognomy and culture appear in the mirror that the invaders placed before their eyes. However, the centuries of the colony are the centuries of that magical effort to convert America into a fraction, an extension, or even a magnification of the European continent. This was never achieved in Mestizo America, and on the other hand it was fundamentally achieved in North America, because there the only condition that could allow it was fulfilled, the almost total annihilation of the native population. It is evident that as long as indigenous communities remained, it was not possible to play the game of ignoring the past, of denying nature and feeling that one was witnessing the first day of creation. What a complex it all was. America was worth to Europe precisely because it was different, because of its mountains rich in precious metals, because of its intact nature after millennia, because of the wonderful eruption of a virgin world full of fruits and flowers, balsamic woods, splendid jungles, and villages. Vigorous and simple natives, before a world that had exhausted many of its resources, that had lost its simplicity and its naturalness. And yet one of the first temptations of the Europeans was to raise this nature, destroy that simplicity, and rapidly urbanize and Europeanize everything. After the first shock of astonishment, of which the chroniclers gave testimony and to which Castellanos sang desolate, incorporating everything unknown into poetry and profusely using indigenous words to name everything that had no name in Spanish. There are Caribs, Cachemas, Palomitas, Guabinas, Armadillos, Healthy Peach, if some seems dry up with the great heat of summer, it happens to take out between the cracks. The Indian as much as he can and the Christian, they make flour from it when it dries, they take out a thousand pumpkins of butter. There are also for these depopulated and fields so immense and empty infinite quantity of deer which are of two or three nachios, tapers and pigs so multiplied that they cover the banks of the rivers, there are tigers, bears, ounces and lions, primed on those occasions. White otters that have their styles and of pork the form and gestures, immense quantity of crocodiles whom everyone here calls caimans, whose ferocity and brave edges are the cause of great excesses, well, these snakes tend to devour a very large number of people. After that beginning, 
what prevailed afterwards was the rejection of what was different, the will to mold the clay of America so that it quickly resembled the world of its discoverers. Until 1520 the nucleus of the Spanish conquest was in the Antilles and from that moment it moved to the continent. It was fierce but the cultural and linguistic fusions that, as Manuel Alvar says, allowed the Spanish to take to all corners of America what they had learned in the Antilles could not be prevented. The miscegenation of the language did not initially occur with the great pre-Hispanic languages, Nahuatl and Quechua, but with the Caribbean languages. The first thing that entered Spanish were sharks and hurricanes, hammocks and caimitos, canoes and barbecues from the White Islands. Until that year of 1520, the gold on the surface lasted in the islands, the gold of the adornments and of the ritual objects of the temples, henceforth looting would continue on the mainland and kings would see one after another the looting of solar gold, Moctezuma in 1521, Atahualpa in 1532, Tuscaysusa in 1538. The time of the mining of the Mexican mountains and the Andes, which would soon demand the help of African labor. Then the time of the mine was born, which Tulio Halperin Donghai has called that insatiable devourer of men. The metals of America revolutionized the European economy, but our nations were not integrated into its economic circuits, because the entire economy of the colony was organized for the exclusive benefit of the metropolis, which required the greatest amount of metals with the least investment of resources. Thus, so that gold and silver would not remain in America at all, our countries were kept outside the monetary circulation for a long, long time. Only part of the gold could be taken directly in a legal way, that which was owed by the fifth of the king and by taxes, so that the rest had to be channeled through trade, and for this it was ensured that prices were very high. Of European products. Since then, the colonial economy revolved around mining production, dedicated to supplying metals to Europe, and trade was strengthened only as a way to move part of the remaining metals to Europe, those that were not smuggled. Thus, efforts were made to prevent the formation of autonomous local economies at all costs. The agricultural and livestock production of the American haciendas was oriented towards satisfying the needs of the mines or retreated towards a type of manorial economy of a feudal nature that favored the withdrawal of the continent towards that kind of late Middle Ages of which the philosophers, the one that finally brought Spain to its overseas colonies. Curious marginal economy, the only one of America, closed in on itself and almost incapable of establishing broader continental relations. As it was necessary to guarantee a minimum exchange to provide agricultural and livestock goods to the cities, this was left to the officials, to the colonial bureaucracy, which imposed a system of barter with the products of the indigenous communities and the farms, often forcing these communities to buy useless things, stagnant merchandise, thus obtaining enormous profits for themselves. But the strengthening of Mexican mining turned Mexico into a powerful partner or client of the other countries of the continent and at the end of the 18th century Spain reoriented its commercial system to strengthen its exclusive exchanges with each of the colonies and prevent them from strengthen relations between them. He also subdivided the Viceroyalty of Peru, forming the Viceroyalties of New Granada and the Rio de la Plata in the middle of the century, undoubtedly with the purpose of weakening the great nascent American nations. From the cattle of the Pampas to the tobacco of Cuba, everything had to be oriented towards the metropolis, and thus the Creoles were replaced by the peninsulars in the dynamics of colonial trade, but that effort was excessive for the weakened head of the kingdom. Already at this point, as was hardly natural given the enormity of America and the narrowness of the peninsula, Spain was inferior to its empire. Its precarious industry was unable to benefit from trade and the incessant river of precious metals, and Spain became only the onerous intermediary between our countries and the great capitals of industrial Europe. It could be said that the conquest was not strictly a social order but the process of disintegration of a system, of the centennial order of community empires and of the vast fabric of natural cultures, and the establishment of the European material and spiritual order. How perfect could this transfer from the European world of the Renaissance to the territory of America be? Here is a subject worthy of being followed in detail. There are the cities. Santo Domingo was born in 1494, 
and at least 60 cities were founded in the 60 years from 1508 to 1568. One city per year on the surface of a continent of exuberant nature and incalculable riches presents a picture worthy of legend and almost of mythology. These are some of the moments of that progression, San Juan de Puerto Rico in 1508, Santiago de Cuba in 1514, Havana in 1515, Veracruz in 1519, Panama in 1519, Mexico destroyed and refounded in 1521, Guatemala, Leon and Granada of Nicaragua in 1525, San Salvador and Santa Marta in 1525, Coro in 1527, Cartagena de Indias in 1533, Quito in 1534, the city of the Kings of Lima in 1535, Puebla de Los Angeles in 1536, Buenos Aires founded in 1536 and abandoned later to be reborn in 1980, Santiago de Cali in 1536, Asuncion in 1537, Santafe de Bogota in 1538, Charcas in 1539, Morelia in 1540. Santiago de Chile in 1541, Merida de Yucatán in 1542, Potosí in 1545, La Paz in 1549, Caracas in 1562, and San Agustín de la Florida, the oldest city in the United States, in 1565. Although many cities were born and died in a short time, all the mentioned ones still exist, and are therefore examples of that the conquest was establishing permanent realities. There are the temples, too, the convents and the universities that sought to prolong the European spiritual order in America. In Mexico, in 1559, there were 200 schools for indigenous children attached to convents, in Peru, until 1551 the Dominicans alone had already founded sixty. There, religion and the Spanish language were taught, and the unique musical talent of indigenous children was cultivated. Fray Geronimo de Mendieta has left us a living testimony of that moment, then very quickly they learned to read, as well as our romance as well as Latin and handwriting. And writing, therefore, was given to them very easily, in addition to writing, the Indians then began to write down and write down, both plain chant and organ chant, the first musical instruments they made and used were flutes, then chiremias, later ortos, and after them bowed viulas and now bugles and bassoons, they began out of their ingenuity to compose Christmas carols in four-voice organ singing and some masses and other works, in a few years they came out as good Latinos, who made and composed very measured verses and long and congruous sentences. In 1538 the University of Santo Tomas was founded in Santo Domingo, and in 1551 the Universities of Mexico and Lima were founded, with the same organization as the Spanish ones, following the Universities of Salamanca and Alcala de Henares as a model, and therefore divided into four faculties, theology, arts, law, and medicine. The 250 years that go from the middle of the 16th century to the end of the 18th century, are the time of the incorporation of America to the European mental order, the times that made us be part of Europe forever. Those universities did their share of the work, those schools taught the catechism and the language, those friars strove to incorporate the multitudes of Native Americans into the spirit of Christianity. The chroniclers and the intellectuals continued their stories, the officials transferred to the continent the rituals of legality and the formalism of the bureaucracies, and the poets already tried to forget that there were differences between the continents, and came to write poems that, ignoring all local color, seemed to take place in Avila or Toledo. Just as the time of cathedrals and monasteries arrived, so did the later time of American mystical poets like Mother Francisca Josefa del Castillo, from Tunja, whose astonishment, visions, Ecstasy and transverberations are what any Spanish nun could experience. His perception of the terrible visits of the devil, 
his description of the fantastic crystal cities of mysticism are admirable, and his verses have the grace and musicality of the first mystics of the Golden Age in the peninsula. He speaks delicately. From the lover I esteem, honey and milk distills between roses and lilies. His mellifluous word cuts like dew, and with it blooms the withered heart. So softly his delicate whistle is introduced, that the heart doubts if it is the heart itself. So effective it persuades, that, like a lit fire, it melts like wax the mountains and the cliffs. In that same city, the Gongorian adventure of Hernando Dominguez Camargo took place, whose heroic poem in honor of Ignacio de Loyola is one of the apexes of American culturanismo, and only because of its excessive leafiness can it be recognized as a poem of these equinoctial lands. Since the 16th century, the presence of eloquent and erudite poetesses in the American world had been striking, among them the anonymous lady who wrote in Peru an extensive discourse in praise of poetry, more or less contemporary with Cervantes' journey to Parnassus, and written with the same encyclopedic intention of covering many topics and mentioning all the versifiers of his time. In the first half of the 17th century, Lope de Vega published a poetic epistle written alternating hendecasyllables and heptasyllables, which he also attributed to a Peruvian poetess, in this case to the enigmatic Amaryllis who claimed with these words the granddaughter of heroic conquerors. I could well, Bellardo, if I wished in the grace of heaven, to tell of the deeds of my two grandfathers who conquered this new world and also built this city, who had vassals, and for their king they gave their life and blood, more is a long speech than the fame has already taken charge, if anything the misfortune of this land, which runs in this time, so many illustrious merits does not bury. The greatest voice of that female lineage, in the second half of the 17th century, was the Mexican S.O.R. Juana Inés de la Cruz, whose verses are as notable as her own image as a scholar, researcher, and intellectual celebrity of her time. Pedro Henriquez Urena has left in his book The Literary Currents of Hispanic America, a beautiful semblance of that woman who wrote, among so many, these beautiful verses. Stop, shadow of my elusive good image of the spell I love most, beautiful illusion, for whom I die joyfully, sweet fiction, for whom I live painfully. If the magnet of your attractive graces serves my obedient steel chest, why do you make me fall in love flattering, if you have to mock me later fugitive? More emblazoned you cannot be satisfied that your tyranny triumphs over me, that although you leave the narrow bond that your fantastic form girdled mocked, it matters little to mock your arms and chest, if my fantasy imprisons you. In the process of development of the colonial arts, the previous wisdom of the pre-Hispanic craftsmen had a notable weight. The musical aptitude of the indigenous was great, as described by Jesus Estrada, the skill of the Indians to play and to make musical instruments was generally recognized as a quality attached to their good taste for singing and in the temple. Of instruments. Everywhere the good examples of these musicians multiplied. Some are surprising, like that Indian from Tlaxcala who, seeing a Spaniard playing the rebeck, made another and begged the Spaniard to teach him how to play it, with only three lessons, before ten days, he would play the rebeck between the flutes a and d he would sing about all of them that is, he would throw the counterpoint on the steps that the flutes marked. Also important was the existence of true traditions of architects in Mexico, of builders and weavers in Peru, of goldsmiths in New Granada of potters and sculptors in Quito, who contributed their skill to the creation of that art governed by religion which, in the medieval way, it characterized the colony. The architecture of Mexico came to produce admirable constructions, and the only cathedral, facing the Zocalo, drawn in 1570, whose columns, similar to those of the Spanish Gothic cathedrals, support an enormous structure of three naves with two chapels, remains a monument overwhelming that testifies to the power of the Viceroyalty, the same can be said of civil works such as the Town Hall of Tlaxcala, from 1539, and the hospitals founded by Vasco de Quiroga. Temples inspired by the Gothic, by the Plateresque decoration of Sevillian buildings, palaces that imitate the severe excess and mannerism of El Escorial, Mudejar coffered ceilings that reveal the continuous presence and continuous evocation of the Hispano-Muslim world, imposing constructions such as the Church of the Society of Jesus in Cusco, 
amazing facades such as the Church of the Tabernacle in Mexico, Santa Prisca de Tosca with its superb towers, or the motley set of ornaments of the Zacatecas Cathedral, one of the most unique in the world, which must have been the work, it is said, of indigenous masters, began to grow throughout the continent. And the 17th and 18th centuries saw the rise of religious art in South America, the wood carvings of Quito artisans, who took expressiveness to astonishing levels in extremely realistic crucifixes, with skinned backs, bare ribs and the bodies bursting with wounds, which they apparently used to analogically denounce the torments suffered by the Indians and by the slaves, but also in images of moving beauty such as the virgins of Legarda. The monstrances of Peru, Mexico and New Granada are remarkable, studded with diamonds, pearls and emeralds, the paintings of angels from Bolivia, New Granada and Mexico, the altarpieces, and the profuse decoration of chapels such as the Rosario del Convento de Santo Domingo in Puebla, or the chapels of Tunja, full of ornaments inspired by American nature. Among the most unique monuments of this time is the Church of the Company in Arequipa, meticulously embroidered in stone, and which has among its decorative elements variations of the cat tiger, an ancestral figure of the ornamentation of the peoples of Titicaca. In the realms of the spirit, the triumph of Christianity meant a series of unforgettable wars in Europe. The first, in the last days of the Roman Empire, was the war against entire peoples who persisted in their pagan cults. The most vivid testimony remains the tragic adventure of Emperor Julian, trying to preserve the cult of the gods of Rome when the empire had already surrendered to the new faith. From that war against peoples in the interior of the continent, we passed to the war against tribes and sects, in the long crusades against heretics, and to the fierce crusades against Islam that filled a good part of the Middle Ages. It was about defeating and expelling foreign cultures and worshippers of other gods, but above all about eliminating nuanced differences with respect to orthodox worship. Thanks to the ferocity of these crusades, the heretical sects were finally defeated, and the Cathars of Occitania, or the combative Dulcinists, disappeared from the world. The war of religion to impose its hegemony over Europe was reduced to the fight against reluctant individuals, suspected of witchcraft or belonging to different religions. Since then, the court of the Holy Inquisition acted there, it was no longer a war between peoples, nor a battering of armies, but the implacable judgment against dissident individuals and almost always solitary. The religion of Christ had really made its way into Europe and the Christian mythical order had established itself as the sole support of the European social order. The final thrust of that purpose of a Catholic Europe ruled by the Roman Church occurred when the Catholic kings of Aragon and Castile outlawed the Jews and expelled Sultan Boabdil, his mother Isa and their subjects from Granada. But while the basic tenet of religion had triumphed, and now permeated the very soul of European civilization, disputes remained to be resolved chief among them being which nation would embody the orthodoxy of the triumphant Christian myth. It is noteworthy that it was precisely at the most resounding moment of its triumph that Catholicism saw the rise of reformist movements in many of the nations of Europe. Calvin's Swiss, Luther's Germans, Henry VIII's Anglicans, reformers everywhere rose up to reject the intention of the Church of Rome to set itself up as the only ship of Christ on earth, and it was just then complex of absolute triumph in Spain and of confusion and debate in the rest of Europe, when the Christianization of the innumerable kingdoms of America began. If we are Europeans, and this cannot be doubted, it is necessary to think in this way of the process immediately prior to the arrival of the evangelizers and the Christianizers on the American continent, since the indigenous peoples suddenly found themselves enrolled in a debate that they were unaware of the debate that fought the Italian and Spanish Catholicism with the reformist churches of the other countries. Our mestizo America fully entered world history as part of the Spanish-German Empire of Charles V, but in these lands and in those times the debate that at that time shook the soul of Europe, and that shocked above all the domains of the emperor, was not possible. Carlos had chosen to sustain the power of Catholicism in Portugal, Spain and Italy and to live with the Reformation in his German and Flemish lands, but his main religious and cultural concern was to besiege the Moors and prevent the Ottoman reconquest. What an exciting spiritual landscape in which our culture was inscribed from the beginning, 
and of which we could not be aware due to the curious fact that the debate did not come here, but only its consequence, the imposition, without alternatives, of the mental model dictated by the Crown and by the Church, with the support of the powerful court. A new proof that, despite being the forces and ideas of the Renaissance that had determined the discovery, it was mentally the Middle Ages that was established and lasted in our America for centuries. In this, too, this continent remained faithful to its destiny of paradoxes, first the Renaissance and then the Middle Ages, first serfdom and then slavery. Our history does not know how to obey Hegel's guidelines, the dream of a staggered and evolutionary history, which passes from brutal and barbaric forms to increasingly abstract forms of domination. From the imperial communism of the Incas we pass to encomienda servitude, and from this to the worst form of slavery, and yet, both that initial servitude and that subsequent slavery inscribed us in the sphere of mercantile society, they established the international market that gave rise to modernity and to the process of what Marx would call the original accumulation of capital. But neither could Marx understand with his European schemes the complexity of this world where everything arrived at the same time, Erasmus and Homer, the Bible and Utopia, classical antiquity and the break with it. We could almost say that the Inquisition came before Orthodoxy, and it is quite evident that the Counter-Reformation came first, and then, almost in vain, the Reformation. Christianity was the son of three different national traditions, Hebrew monotheism, Greek philosophy that had argued through Plato for the existence of a material world and a spiritual heaven, and the vocation of universality of the Roman Empire. But of those national cultures it was Rome that elaborated and preserved the substance of Catholicism, the Jews, who had contributed their God to that new religion, did not accept Christ and were not interested in being part of an evangelizing religion, since Judaism is not looking for followers around the world, and the Greeks would end up emancipating themselves from the tutelage of Rome and entering the orb of the Orthodox Church. Many other peoples of Europe also rejected the Church of Rome, and this helps us to understand the unique process of the Christianization of America. Erasmus of Rotterdam himself had understood the discovery of the new continent as a divine message that new lands were arriving for Christianity, since Europe had abandoned orthodoxy. Thus it says in Ecclesiastes, how much extension of land in the world, in which the evangelical seed had not yet been sown or has been so badly that the tares are more than the wheat. The smallest part of the world is Europe. The brightest region of all is Greece, with Asia Minor, where the Gospel first passed from Judea, with great success. But is not almost all in the hands of Muslims and enemies of the name of Christ? Already in Asia Minor, whose extension is immense, tell me, what is there that is ours? Palestine itself, from where the evangelical light first radiated, belongs to strangers. What is there that is ours in Africa? There is no doubt that, in so many countries, there are rough and simple peoples who could easily be attracted to Christ if people were sent to do the good sowing. And what shall we say of the hitherto unknown countries that are discovered every day, and of those who say they lie in regions where none of ours have reached to date? How much would be gained among them for Christ if active and faithful workers were sent to sow the good seed? It is notable in that paragraph that typical consideration that the world belongs by right to Europe. We even feel the severity and the tone of reproach with which this man says, what is there that is ours in Africa? That spirit, present even in the most lucid and humanistic consciences, made its way, producing complex results. The circumstance of having been Christianized by Rome, it was the Pope who divided America in the 16th century between Spain and Portugal, determined, as well as the linguistic composition, that the children of this America ended up being for the world Latinos. Due to one of those paradoxes of history, today in the world's airports the name Latinos is not identified with Italians or French but with the children of Mestizo America, and it is very possible that they seem more Latin the older they are. Whether it's Mestizo or Aboriginal aspect. But this also means that modernity shifted its paradigms towards the West, North America became Saxon America, English, Irish and other northern peoples, ours became Latin America. But even though the North insisted on being predominantly European, our America could stop listening to the plurality of its voices. Too complex is the history of religion in these countries.
The many syncretisms that occurred between Catholicism and the cults incorporated by the children of Africa have already been mentioned, but in the towns where the evangelization of the Indians took place, the mixture was no less complex and it is not possible to affirm that the Catholicism of American peoples resemble, despite the iconography and the unanimity of the ritual, the one professed by Portugal, Spain, or Italy. On the other hand, since theology is not the strong point of the Catholics, how can we prevent the saints from ending up being perceived as a vast gallery of minor and sometimes major divinities, to the point that the cult of certain saints in many cases exhausted the faith? Of the people? If in France itself, Christian almost since the triumph of the cross, Voltaire was able to say in the 18th century that Catholicism did not worship God but an almanac of virgins and saints, it is not surprising that the phenomenon was even more intense in America. Our immense American world has been conducive to the emergence of large heretical sects that even tried to configure themselves as autonomous religions, and perhaps there is nothing more Brazilian than the campaign of Antonio Cancel Jairo and his multitudes in the backlands of the great country. In addition, the cults are metamorphosing, and in our own time we have seen poor Colombians, educated in the inevitability of suffering and suddenly seduced by the eagerness for triumph and the desire for social promotion, pass from the atavistic cult of the bleeding heart of Jesus, to the untimely and tumultuous worship of the Divine Child. And the 18th century ends. The colony changed our condition in a complex way. It turned the children of the Spanish and Portuguese conquerors into American Creoles, and it turned the children of the Incas, the Aztecs, and the Chipchas into Latinos. There is no doubt that living for centuries in a territory ends up giving a people, as Louis Pale's mottos wanted, the physiognomy of a new race, and for this reason no American mestizo feels spontaneously Spanish or Portuguese, however white his face may be. But there is also no doubt that speaking a language for centuries and professing a religion also confers a different spiritual condition, and for this reason no American mestizo feels spontaneously indigenous no matter how Indian their features may be. A poet declared his American condition through these lines. May our land want to save us from oblivion for these four centuries that we have served in it. And Jorge Luis Borges, assuming the collective destiny as his personal destiny, responded in the United States to those who called him Hispanic with these words. No, I am not Spanish. 150 years ago I made the decision to stop being Spanish. Colonial times did not usually generate such debates because the predominance of the European mental universe was total, but that would not last long. The full transplantation of the Iberian culture was an illusion, the Creoles suffered discrimination even if their parents were peninsular, they could not access positions in the administration, the priority of the metropolis established the hierarchies and guaranteed hegemony without shadows, but prepared a radical rebellion of the colonies turning the Creoles against their will into allies of the Mestizos and Mulattoes, in the longing for a world where they could feel free and owners of some. Right. After two or three centuries, being an American was already something that made sense on its own. Creole aristocracies had grown up in northern Mexico, enriched by the mines of the Sierra and others in the Veracruz region, strengthened by trade. There were powerful Creoles in the Rio de la Plata, dedicated to ranching, in Peru, enriched by trade around the mining areas, in Venezuela, strengthened by the close relationship with Spain and the Canary Islands, in the haciendas and commerce of New Granada. And then came the end of the 18th century, with its enormous upheavals in North America and Europe. The gradual population of the eastern United States, beginning with the landing of the Mayflower settlers in 1607, imperceptibly began the formation of what would become the most powerful nation in the world three centuries later. The territory was gigantic, extremely rich, and much more akin, due to its latitude and nature, to the European world. The settlement of the settlers was homogeneous, those, Puritans, came with their families and did not allow themselves the slightest possibility of an approximation or coexistence with the native peoples. These were generally nomads and warriors, like so many in South America who waged war to the death or opted for collective suicide. There was no mestizage in the North like the one that was propitiated in the South by the very conditions in which the conquerors traveled, a lone men thrown into adventure, 
who did not bring their families because they did not come to settle down but to seek a quick fortune to reintegrate into their world. But miscegenation was also favored by the social order of the indigenous civilizations that surrendered or made an alliance with the invaders, by the humanitarian conscience of a sector of the Iberian culture, and by the policy of protection of the natives that made its way in Spain with the debates fostered by Bartolomé de las Casas and Francisco de Vitoria. Unlike the northern territories, which did not send their wealth to the metropolises, Mestizo America paid tribute to Europe for three centuries, a good part of its wealth in metals, pearls, precious stones and other natural products, as a direct contribution and as payment of the expensive goods that were brought to the continent. This trade was carried out not only on the waters of the Caribbean and the Atlantic but also on the abysses of the Pacific, because the search for spices and exotic merchandise from the East was one of the causes of the discovery, the gold and silver of America they also served as the unexpected wealth, and halfway, for Europe to acquire all those goods, so that the West Indies were also a port of gold on the way to the more remote but now more accessible East Indies. Confused and motley centuries, centuries of sailors and rogues, traffickers and corsairs, centuries that filled the coffers of German bankers with gold and that formed the industry of the English and the Flemish, centuries that covered the beds of the sea with jewels and gold doubloons, centuries of buccaneers rum and gunpowder, of the black flag with a skull on two crossbones, of endless stories of taverns and frigates, of entire races that were the sweet fruit of forbidden love and of entire Races that bore the curse of being born on the bed of rape and crime, centuries in which the world was vaster and men more masters of it, centuries that familiarized humanity like never before with the enormous world in which it inhabited. Another fact was fundamental for the coming age, that America was a new world also because its ancient cultures had not impoverished nature. The virgin forests and the transparent rivers, the plains alight with fireflies at sunset, the opulence of the beaches full of voracious and full life, the banks of the rivers dark with tapers, the mountains reddened with deer, the abundance of snakes and the jaguars, the pink islands of flamingos and the purple ranges of sietequeros and silver ranges of yarumos, the infinite variety of birds of all colors, of all beaks and of all shapes, from tiny white larks to electric green quetzals, from what the Mexican poet Lopez Villarde called the green lightning of parrots, to the endless profusion of hanging aureole nests, from the wood pigeon sung by José Eustagio Rivera, which afflicts the jungle with its soft complaint, to the Che Jaces of the Argentine Pampas whom Esque Subi saw passing by the raiders shouting Cheja, Cheja. Perhaps that is why Hegel, who unfortunately never saw it, would think that in America there was only nature, while in Europe there was history, the triumph of the universal spirit. And it is true that in Europe the spirit was inflamed. Throughout the 18th century, the Age of Enlightenment, reason subjected an order of centuries to ruthless criticism, dreaming that it was doing so to found the longed-for kingdom of universal justice, and ignoring that it was only in its power to tear down the edifice of aristocratic and ecclesiastical privileges that did not allow the advance of the new historical forces. The destinies of the continents had joined the discovery had shaken many things in the minds of the philosophers and in the order of economics. Now, together with the work of thinkers and peoples, these ideas and these riches also helped unleash new forces, and we would not stop feeling on our soil the breath of the storms that shook the soul of Europe. The critique launched by rationalisms against a centuries-old spiritual order revived interest in nature there, and that end of the century was as exciting as the vertiginous end of the 20th century although without a doubt more hopeful. It was the time of reason and revolution, reason unraveled the spiritual fabric of the past, the revolution would undo its material fabric. And from now on it would be said that everything was going to be the true beginning of an age of freedom, equality and fraternity. Those two successive phenomena, rationalism and romanticism, turned their eyes towards nature, and found something new in it. Although the leaders of the industry began to see it as an inexhaustible warehouse of resources, the philosophers, naturalists and artists of Europe at that time rediscovered the pagan sense of nature, and began to live what Baudelaire would call the memory of naked ages, the nostalgia for another European past, the one in which nature was sacred and divine. Moving in that chiaroscuro horizon of reason and passion, lucidity and love of adventure, a young German, 
Baron Alexander of Humboldt undertook in the penultimate year of the 18th century his journey to the equinoctial regions of the New World, the mythical journey of the European spirit by the almost nameless and undoubtedly unscathed nature of America. Humboldt first visited Venezuela, where he recognized the coast and the islands, and later he entered the Orinoco Basin, until he reached evidence that there was a natural communication between the Orinoco and the Negro River, a tributary of the Amazon, through the channel Casi Curet. He then traveled to Cuba, where he carefully studied the country, and from there he reached the coasts of New Granada, went up the Magdalena to Honda, ascended to Santafe de Bogota where he was received by the naturalist and botanist José Celestino Mutis, director of the remarkable expedition Botany, crossed the valleys and the mountain ranges to Cartago, traveled to Papayan and Pasta, continued on his way to Quito, climbed Chimborazo and reached the territory of Peru. Throughout this strenuous journey of several years, he studied nature, made geographical observations, studied the unknown flora and fauna of America, and left a meticulous trail of his passage not only in the history of the countries he traveled but through them in the natural and human sciences of their time. He still traveled to Mexico, then called New Spain, where after a year he wrote a detailed study of that country, then the most important in the American colonial world, and where half of the population lived. Humboldt's volumes are a thorough examination of some regions of our America, the full view of the science of his time on a continent that had been very partially incorporated into the order of the West, which had been seen above all as provider and tributary. He has done more for America than all the conquerors together wrote Simon Bolivar. Humboldt reflected on human communities, on the way in which peoples had been incorporated into religion, on the political situation, analyzed the behavior of communities and individuals in light of the complex history of the conquest, he saw nature through the eyes of natural science and political economy at the same time, he saw the reserves, the wealth of metals, the agricultural possibilities, he saw the structure of the Spanish Empire, its progressive weakness, the subordinate condition of the Creoles. He had eyes and ears for everything, and his admirable prose left us a colossal fresco of these regions of the continent in the days before independence. Before returning to Europe, where he would use all these discoveries, data, and verifications in his major work, Cosmos, which attempts to elaborate a theory of the planet as a whole and of life on it as a set of interdependent processes, very close to the thought of contemporary environmentalists, he visited the United States, the newly born republic, where it is still possible to follow his course through the valleys, mountains, and lakes that bear his name. But the traces left by the equinoctial world were perhaps the most intense and suggestive of his life, and we can approach what this man saw and thought here, the founder of modern geography and the rediscoverer of the aesthetic sense of landscape, with his insatiable curiosity and his inexhaustible vitality, reading this fragment of his travel diary through the Orinoco where he experiences the same shock as Holderlin at the certainty that the human species is only a humble fraction of the mysterious and multiform planetary life, those the historyless banks of the Kasi Curet, uninhabited and covered in jungle, then occupied my imagination. There, in the middle of the new continent, one almost gets used to considering man as something that does not necessarily belong to the natural order. The ground is densely covered with plants, whose free development finds no obstacle. A thick layer of topsoil proves that the organic forces have acted incessantly, without interruption. Alligators and boas are the owners of the river, the jaguar, the peccary, the tapir, and the monkeys roam the jungle without fear or danger, they dwell there, their homeland of origin. This spectacle of living nature, in which man is nothing, has something paradoxical and oppressive about it. Here in a fertile territory, adorned with perennial greenery, one searches in vain for traces of human action, one thinks one is relegated to a different world from the one in which one was born. Despite his perfect belonging to the European mental order, Humboldt perceived the harmony of the cosmos, the interdependence of the orders of life, and even warned how annoying man can be to the world. Many of his observations would take centuries to be perceived in their complexity, but that trip was not only full of repercussions for Europe in the 19th century, our America had in him one of the most powerful stimuli in the struggle for its independence. The Dream of Freedom
The revolution of the United States was not only a war of independence but the clarion call of the liberal society, the society of the rights of man, of the equality of citizens and of the new civil era. The United States was Europe transferred to a vaster horizon, freer and richer, to an almost inexhaustible territory where it was possible to found democracy, the ideal of the future. That democratic ideal was similar to the Greek one, that is, it only operated for those who beforehand could be seen as equals, and the emptiness of radiant North American democracy, the emptiness even of the ambitious declaration of human rights promulgated by the good people of Virginia, which would inspire that of the French, was that it did not shelter the slaves. Once the indigenous peoples had been destroyed, all European immigrants were in a position to accept each other as equals, since the vast and rich territory of the United States did not present a past of rights or property regimes that would hinder that equality. The indigenous peoples had not been excessively numerous, and they succumbed like bison before the rifles of civilization, leaving in the hands of the immigrants, equaled by their status as settlers, a world that was truly the promised land. It is not surprising that under these conditions, democracy, together with wealth, rationality and the Protestant ethic, in which man is saved by works and not by faith, configured a picture of prosperity and transformation of the world. Which is still amazing. Meanwhile, our countries lived a much more complex and difficult reality. Here the challenge of mergers had been assumed from the beginning, but at the same time the human difficulty of different cultures understanding each other and different beings living together was experienced. The United States would suffer a similar problem when the time came for the freedom of the slaves, because that circumstance did put the sincerity of democracy to the test, and no one ignores the conflict in which they sank for years and years, after the War of Secession, and the way in which integration has been sought in our century by denying the origins of races and dissolving all their peculiarities in the supposed cosmopolitanism of a global society. The world may look at Mestizo America as a region of disorder, compared to homogeneous societies and cultures, but no one should ignore that the real difficulties of the meeting of the worlds were faced here. In other regions great things will have been achieved in terms of prosperity, productivity and technological progress, but the most significant advances in human history must be expected from the peoples who lived through the shock and accepted the challenge of miscegenation, which century after century they had to learn to coexist, to merge, to exchange their traditions to build with their embrace a plurality of languages that would be the seedbed of the future. Alongside its prosperity, its scientific and technical power, its undoubted internal democracy, that of the North is also a culture of waste and spectacle, its is a lifestyle that perpetuated and magnified the conflict between Western man and the nature and its contempt for matter. No one expressed this better than the poet Auden, they say that Americans are materialists but if I see anything in them it is a lack of respect for matter. Perhaps the only one who had understood that original establishment of democracy as a call to alliance with nature, as a reconciliation with human nature itself, and as a mystical search for brotherhood and happiness in harmony with the world was the indefatigable singer Walt Whitman, who could not have known that after a century and a half his name would become one of the trademarks of the great shopping centers of Long Island. But there is always the risk that poets and philosophers preach freedom, and their use of fructuaries immediately reduce it to nothing more than freedom of trade. North American independence, and then the cannon fire of the French Revolution, affected our America in another immediate way. We had a great city, Mexico, an imperial metropolis built with its mestizo physiognomy on the ruins of the amazing empire. The economic crisis unleashed by the revolutions made sugar scarce and suddenly Cuba became the great supplier of sugar to the United States and Europe. In a few years, Havana became a capital as populous as Mexico, but nestled in the waters of the Caribbean, with magnificent architecture but also with a cultural and, in particular, musical life full of fusions. Crossroads between Europe and America, crossroads of races and traditions, Artists also converged there and perhaps no country on the continent came to have a musical wealth like that of that fortunate island. In economic terms, the tendency to specialize the colonies in monoculture and the specific production of some good that the metropolis required as a consumer or as an intermediary for the rest of the continent was strengthened. Silver from Mexico, 
gold from New Granada, silver from Peru, cattle from Buenos Aires, cocoa from Venezuela, tobacco and sugar from Havana, each colony traded only with Spain, and thus the old ties that had once they had united the sister nations. Each of these spheres of wealth had exotic and exhibitionist representatives in the great capitals, there, the opulent rich of Mexico and Peru, the ostentatious Mantuans of Caracas, and the magnates of Havana were looked upon with admiring mockery. But among them also the great rebels were born, because they were the ones who directly witnessed the European insurrection against an order of centuries, who read the articles of the Encyclopedia and the ironic demolitions of Voltaire, and were enthusiastic about the Declaration of Rights of the Man and the Citizen, so necessary for rich Creoles who were nevertheless discriminated against in their own countries. With the beginning of the 19th century, the longing for independence of our peoples arrived and grew, and a new era of upheavals began for the continent. Independence The memorable picture of Mestizo America minutes before independence is in the writings of Baron Humboldt, from the detailed description of nature, economic observations, geographical projections, morbidity studies, and reflection on cultural complexity, to population calculations. According to him, in the Hispanic region there were between 13 and 16 million people and only 200,000 of them were Spanish. All sorts of transportation and communication difficulties persisted. The continent, which had been traveled on foot for millennia, with the arrival of Europeans had gone from traveling on foot to horses and carts, but that vertigo was recent. Rivers were the other important means of transportation. The infinite Amazon and its countless tributaries, the green Magdalena where travelers saw disturbing alligators sleeping in the sun on the shores, the Orinoco, the Piranha, the Negro River. The great waterways had been filled with boats, the Caribbean was the new center of the world market, Europe's products flowed to the Viceroyalty of Mexico, to the Viceroyalty of Peru, and from the middle of the century also to the new Viceroyalty of New Granada, which encompassed the government of Venezuela and the equatorial territory of Quito. Soon the Viceroyalty of the Rio de la Plata emerged, whose work, in the slave trade and metal marketing, included up to Upper Peru. The region most modified by the 18th century had been Brazil. Since 1717 it had become a kingdom and was governed by a viceroy. First, the Sugar North was formed, in the fertile lands of Bahia and Pernambuco, then the Sertao Livestock Center, the dry plateaus of the Central Zone, and then came the discovery of gold and diamonds in Minas Geras, causing massive immigration. That in a very short time reached three million people. In 1763 the seat of government moved from Bahia to Rio de Janeiro, converted into the legendary port of gold. The peninsular aristocracies were perhaps more powerful than anywhere else, and the truth is that there was never a real confrontation between the Creoles and the Portuguese. Almost all of the clergy in Brazil belonged to these powerful classes, and had an enormous influence on social life, but only in the hidden regions of the Amazon were Jesuit missions established such as those that almost constituted the country in neighboring Paraguay. If historians agree on something, it is that, throughout our America, the colony had lasted too long. Spain had ceased to be the metropolis, in the full sense of the term, to become a very costly intermediary between America and the new European metropolises. At the end of the 18th century, a history of seditions began in different countries, very diverse movements, which despite not being fully directed against the crown, showed the growing dissatisfaction of the population, and revealed that power on the continent was wearing thin. Rush The administrative reform that sought to reaffirm the domain of the peninsula was one of the causes, taxes had increased, everywhere a poorly concealed hatred grew for the Iberian merchants who displaced the Creoles. In Peru, the caste war broke out. Indians against whites and mestizos in Lower Peru, Indians and mestizos against whites in Upper Peru, Tulio Halperin Donghai tells us, and in New Granada the great uprising of the Comuneros del Socorro. In Brazil, in 1789, the same year as the French Revolution, the secessionist and republican adventure of Minas Geras began and ended, where Chief Tiradentes was sacrificed. The following year a conspiracy of the French was discovered in Santiago de Chile, 
and simultaneously in Buenos Aires also the French, fascinated no doubt by their own revolution and eager to join it from a distance, stimulated in the slaves the hope of freedom. Through a Republican Revolution Thus began the list of the precursors, of the martyrs for the cause of freedom, of the exiles, and of the intellectuals influenced by the Enlightenment who wanted to modify the extreme contrast that existed between the active peoples and eager for autonomy in Europe. Revolutionary and the passive peoples of America, often sunk in ignorance, unaware of state affairs, isolated from the outside world. In 1794, in Santafe de Bogota, Antonio Nerino translated and published the Declaration of the Rights of Man, a fact for which he was exiled, and at the same time Francisco de Miranda toured Europe making known the situation of the Latin American countries and inciting the powers to take advantage of the advantages that opened up for them with the imminent dissolution of the Spanish Empire. The fight for independence was not really going to be the fight for absolute economic autonomy, although some harbored that illusion but to redefine the terms of the colonial pact with Europe, and basically to achieve broader access to the markets previously controlled by Spain and Portugal, and for redefining the role of the European powers before the American countries. Being part of Iberia, our America was European territory. The colony had strengthened that belonging, leaving languages and religion with us, and inscribing our economies in the sphere of the world market. It would be important to know with greater certainty what part of the formation of our nations corresponded to the work of the Jews and the Moors expelled from Spain at the time of the discovery, but not much has been demonstrated, although it is increasingly being studied the influence of those civilizations on the way of life of the Caribbean peoples, on habits that now seem typically American to us, on the hedonism that characterizes these regions, and even on the type of relationship with religion and royal authority. The American Enlightenment, like the nascent Spanish Enlightenment, was not very prone to a radical break with tradition. So many centuries of medieval order are not easily abandoned, and in many regions faith in the monarchy as the head of the mystical body of the kingdom fervently survived. But the time had come to stop being Spanish, although this did not mean ceasing to be European at all. The idea of independence grew. Since the American Revolution in 1776, and even more so since the beginning of the French Revolution in 1789, what were once just ideas had become nations, and that weighed heavily on the Creole imagination. They could remember that long ago the head of Charles I of England had fallen, that a few minutes ago the head of Louis XVI had fallen, why couldn't the Spanish crown also collapse? When Bolivar, then a rich and unfortunate young man, was walking in Rome through the ruins of the Imperial Forum, he must have thought, in the spirit of the Romanticism of those years, that there is no empire that time does not subjugate and that, therefore, also Spain it would pass and it would be oblivion and rebel. That young man who on the ruins of Rome swore to fight for the freedom of his land, would later affirm, in the Charter of Jamaica, that at the dissolution of Spanish colonial power the republics were seen as the fragments of Rome at the fall of the empire. The recourse to separate from Spain would be to seek the tutelage of the other great nations of Europe, and Bolivar often complains that the powers do not understand with the necessary speed the importance of supporting the American cause and, once the siege of the Spanish empire has been demolished, find in these new nations a space for the projection of their influences. Enlightenment thought had sown the first seeds. The spontaneous rebel movements against the heaviness of the colonial administration, against its bureaucracies and its exclusions, made it possible to give these new ideas a popular support. The French Revolution inflamed the spirits, fueled the imagination, inflamed the speeches of Creoles tired of feeling despised, tired of being subaltern, eager to assume a leading role. Great Britain had persisted for centuries in the work of separating Spain from its Indies, or at least hindering their relations. But fate knows how to move its pieces ironically, and the Napoleonic era changed the order of things on the board of Europe. The imperial armies fell on Spain and handcuffed the royal power, which ended up giving wings to the independence movements across the sea. Argentina, oxygenated by the sudden freedom of trade, began to feel close to the remote ports that it could access, from Hamburg and Istanbul, from New York and the ports of the East.
perhaps it already sensed its future status as a cosmopolis, the migrations that a century later would converge on it, and that prefiguration of the real and symbolic Aleph of Borges, the secular march of the world towards Buenos Aires. In the 18th century, the European powers had had to resign themselves to smuggling in order to trade with America. The independence of these colonies would allow them to participate in the conditions they had always longed for, since the time when the English king rancorfully mocked the Treaty of Tordesillas, who divided the American territory between the Spanish and the Portuguese with the arbitration of the Pope, demanding that Adam's testament be shown to him to validate that decision. England, in particular, felt that longing for America. Finally, in 1806, he took possession of Buenos Aires, and the treasure he obtained there was paraded in triumph through the streets of London, like the fulfillment of a long-cherished dream. But Spain very soon recovered the city with the help of the French. From 1808 Ferdinand VII was a prisoner of France. The British, enemies of Napoleon, joined Spain against the French, who sought to extend their new institutions to the peninsula. The system of government was to transform the Indies into overseas provinces, with greater autonomy and freedom of trade. The plans were vast and firm, but the triumph of England completely frustrated them. All the early expressions of American rebellion were not directed against the crown, because paradoxically, in contrast to the dusty and immobile powers of the colonial bureaucracy, royal authority seemed to be the only force showing any interest in modernization. Not only had he favored Humboldt's trip with a truly enlightened spirit, but he had sponsored intellectual enterprises of the importance of the botanical expedition in New Granada, where the wise naturalist José Celestino Mutis trained a whole generation of natural science researchers, he classified an important part of the unknown tropical flora and directed the remarkable scientific and aesthetic work of scholars and artists such as Rizzo, who according to Humboldt were the best plant painters. In the world in their time, the authors of the beautiful prints of the expedition. But after centuries of muttering their disagreement and muttering their rebellion, those Creole elites finally gave the almost simultaneous cry for independence in the first and second decades of the 19th century, and formed provisional governing boards, taking advantage of the inability of the Spanish to to put order in his empire in pieces, and also taking advantage of Napoleon's claw on the peninsula. That first movement for independence suddenly put the Creoles in possession, after brief and bloody battles and many political maneuvers, of the immense territory of the previously Spanish America. Even then, this America was a very complex mosaic of ethnic groups, economic sectors, social classes, and traditions, and to look at the process of independence is to look again at the disorder of a kaleidoscope. In Mexico the revolution was initially Indian and mestizo. It was led by Miguel Hidalgo, the enlightened priest of Dolores, in the north-central mining area, and was followed by fervent crowds. His was one of those paradoxical insurrections, typical of our America. She confronted the privileged peninsular in the name of independence, the king, religion, and the Virgin of Guadalupe, but in reality she threatened the power of the Spaniards and the Creole miners and merchants and was ready to confiscate the enormous church properties. Hoisting ecclesiastical pavilions and effigies of the Indian Virgin, they seized Guanajuato, Querétaro, San Luis Potosí, and in October 1810 they advanced on Mexico. That fervent force of 80,000 poorly armed and poorly organized men was defeated by an army of 7,000 men led by General Trujillo at the Monte de las Cruces, and there the fragility of these popular movements was seen. The enemies had contained them but they were practically undone. Hidalgo could have reorganized his men and nothing would stop them from finally seizing the capital, but discouragement at the first defeat shattered the morale of the Indian and Mestizo troops, and the priest Hidalgo was captured and executed in Chihuahua. He died repentant and recommending his people not to repeat the rebellion, but his advice was not listened to, and another priest, Morelos, rose up in the south. In 1812 it already dominated the entire region. The indigenous hosts were also after him, but if the first movement had been defeated by a lack of confidence, this one was held back by a parliamentary vocation. Morello summoned different sectors of Mexican society to the Congress of Chilpancinga, the moderate opposition that the Creoles formed there disintegrated the movement, 
and Morelos was finally defeated and executed in 1815. The two revolutions, however, alerted the powerful Creoles and peninsulars of Mexico, the richest in the continent, and faced with the danger of those popular rebellions that are both so religious and so capable of dispensing with authority and the Church, in the name of the law and of God they undertook the counter-revolution. From the dialogues between the Creole officers and the surviving rebels, the alliance between Iturbida and Guerrero was born, which proclaimed independence, unity in the Catholic faith, and equality between peninsulars and Creoles, and which left in the hands of King Ferdinand VII the appointment of a royal infant to rule the newly independent kingdom. From those events in Mexico and their echo in the general captaincy of Guatemala, to the insurrection of the Creoles of the Rio de la Plata who led their brave armies from the Pampas and the coast to the misty mountains of Peru, the political events of those twenty years, between 1810 and 1830, are confusing and poignant. 1810 was a year of revolution in Spain itself and of the successive cries of independence, on April 19 in Caracas, on May 25 in Buenos Aires, on July 20 in Bogotá on September 18 in Santiago de Chile. Those first movements displaced the viceroys with greater or lesser speed, they flirted with the idea of appointing kings of the peninsular house in the Andean mountains, in the Anahuac plateaus and even in the Pampas, and finally saw the strengthening of the republican ideal born of the French influence. While Colonel Garcia Carrasco established himself in Chile, and Liniers undertook his movement in Buenos Aires, a sister of the captive king, the Infanta Carlotta Joaquina, installed in Rio de Janeiro, tried to have herself appointed interim sovereign of the continent, but her claim was not echoed. And the projected queen ended up betraying her Creole allies. The events follow one another torrentially. The struggle of the factions in revolutionary France had its reflections in these American struggles, the alliances, the sudden blows of force or ingenuity, the defeat of the parties, the trials, the exiles and the consequent proscriptions were the rhythm of the time. There was a first revolution in Peru, which did not obtain sufficient support, and Viceroy Abascal became stronger, turning the scene of the old Inca Empire into the main royalist center of the continent. The armies that came from the Rio de la Plata were defeated, and the revolution of independence lost the opportunity to finance itself with the rich metals of Peru. An insurrection of countrymen arose in Uruguay led by José Artigas. Its popular character, as in Mexico, aroused the misgivings of the Creoles, but Artigas, harassed by the Portuguese, advanced towards Argentina, occupied Ontrios and Corrientes, and in 1815 advanced towards Córdoba. The movement of the Lateral Lodge, guided by Alvier and San Martin in Buenos Aires, and the movement of Carrera, a large landowner, and O'Higgins, the natural son of a viceroy of Peru, in Chile, were the main forces that by the south faced the royalist fort of Lima. How to truly encompass this complex movement that once again, as in the savage century of the conquest, disintegrated the existing economic, political and cultural system, once again messed up the sleep of nations, interrupted the process of establishing an order, and opened a new age of challenges for the continent. In Venezuela, it was Miranda himself, the forerunner who had toured the kingdoms of Europe drawing attention to our countries, who had led the rebellion. The Coco masters controlled everything there, and they took their domination so seriously that, confronted with the rebels, they declared that the Caracas earthquake, which occurred at the time, was a punishment from heaven. The rebellion was of rich creoles, and when Miranda was handed over to the royalists, everything seemed to die because the same Creoles who had started it rushed to declare it over. But the rebellion had already excited a more determined sector, the mulattoes from the coasts of Cumana and Margarita Island, the old region of pearls, led by the Jamaican PR. Bolivar then appeared, but the royalists managed to get mestizo horsemen from the plains to enter the war in favor of the crown. The Criollos belonged to the Coco Mountains, the mulattoes to the coast, these centaurs to the cattle plain that extends between the mountain range and the Orinoco Basin. All those territories, which centuries ago had been the scene of the advance of the German conquerors, of the fierce campaign of Lope de Aguirre and of the romantic expedition of the Baron of Humboldt, 
were now the field of new historical dramas, and the Llaneros defeated the Bolivar's troops, who had to take refuge, as he had done before, in New Granada. There, like the first time, he experienced the desperation that the Creoles of this territory were unable to agree on political issues. The dissensions between Nerino, for the state of Cundinamarca, and Jorge Tadio Lozano and his allies for the other provinces, failed to find an agreement. The rebellion in Caracas was defeated, now Ferdinand VII had just regained his throne, and in 1815 Murillo landed in Venezuela with 10,000 men, determined to reconquer the continent, and prepared to advance against New Granada. This already had its royalist stronghold in the old Inca regions, in Pasta and Papayan, allies of Quito and Lima, but its main enemy was its own internal discord. As Halperin Donghai tells us, Bolivar, returned to New Granada after the fall of the Second Venezuelan Revolution, abandoned the struggle when it became clear that, even in its agony, the New Granadan movement was reluctant to unify. Then Murillo entered Cartagena and then Bogotá. The first revolution was dead. Bolívar passed on to Jamaica, and bided his time in the shadow of the British flag, seeing how America seemed to become a Spanish fortress again. But the real war was on its way, and with it not only the head-on clash between the Royalists and the American rebels, but also the intensification of the fissures within the continental insurrection. The conflict of the Creole whites, eager to replace the aristocracies and bureaucracies of the metropolis, with the mestizos, Indians, blacks and mulattoes condemned to perpetuate themselves in conditions of inferiority and exclusion. The conflict between the mining and agricultural sectors incorporated into world trade and those seeking only the constitution of local economies. The interest of the great metropolises is not always inclined to favor the fair and balanced development of the internal economies of the countries. The prolongation of the geographical fragmentation encouraged by the colony and sustained by the national castes in the midst of the fires of war. The growing conflicts between the powerful civil sectors, determined to defend first their commercial or agricultural interests, and the armies, converted into patient vanguards of the common interest of the peoples but inclined to impose authoritarian orders on societies. Everything at that age is both passionate and energetic fervently thrown towards the ideal and violently restrained by the pressure of circumstances, eager to build a liberal, republican, enlightened continent that would give the world an example of youthful vigor and maturity. Organization, and continually frustrated by factional clashes, lack of communication and mistrust, by geographical and economic difficulties, by national and personal differences. The precursors had fulfilled their proselytizing and heroic work the first insurrections had achieved the substitution of governments, the viceroys had fled, the properties of the peninsulars had suffered the first confiscations, the nascent nations began to give themselves their new republican physiognomy, French ified and enlightened, when the recovery came, not of Spanish power but of Spanish pertinacity, determined to achieve the reconquest of the vast empire so suddenly lost. And there began the second part, perhaps no more heroic but much more tragic, of independence. The Jamaican Letter When on September 6, 1815, Simon Bolivar sent his famous letter from a Southern American to a gentleman from this island from Jamaica, he began by explaining that the breadth and complexity of the continent was such that no one could give a full account of its situation. At that time, thus, I find myself in a conflict between the desire to reciprocate the confidence with which you favor me and the impediment of satisfying it, both due to the lack of documents and books, as well as due to the limited knowledge I have of a country as immense, varied and unknown as the New World. In my opinion it is impossible to answer the questions with which you have honored me. The Baron of Humboldt himself, with his universality of theoretical and practical knowledge, would hardly do it exactly because although a part of the statistics and revolution of America is known, I dare to assure you that the greater part is covered in darkness and, consequently, only more or less approximate conjectures can be offered, especially with regard to the future fate and the true projects of the Americans, for as many combinations as the history of nations provides, ours is susceptible to as many by its physical position, by the vicissitudes of war, and by the calculations of politics.
he tells him that there are about a million inhabitants in the provinces of the Rio de la Plata, who are already moving with arms towards Upper Peru and disturbing the supporters of the king in Lima. That in Chile there are 800,000 yearning for independence. That in Peru there are a million and a half, and two and a half million in the regions of New Granada, Quito, Panama, and Santa Marta. Venezuela, for its part, had a million, but has lost a quarter in the War of Independence. In New Spain Mexico there were in 1808, according to what Baron de Humboldt tells us, 7,800,000 souls including Guatemala. Since that time, the insurrection that has shaken almost all the provinces has significantly reduced that count, which seems exact, for more than a million men have perished, as you will see in Mr. Walton's exposition, which faithfully describes the bloody crimes committed in that opulent empire. After making this general account of the situation of the countries, he does not fail to warn clearly that there are regions where Spanish domination will last a long time, the islands of Puerto Rico and Cuba, which, between them, can form a population of 700 to 800,000 souls, they are the ones that the Spaniards most easily possess, because they are out of contact with the independents. But aren't these insular Americans? Aren't they harassed? Don't you wish your well-being? A total of 16 million people in 2,000 leagues of longitude and 900 of latitude, facing an empire that although it was, at one time, the vastest empire in the world, its remains are now powerless to dominate the new hemisphere and even to stay in the old. Then Bolivar, who knows the situation in Spain too well, which has become a mere intermediary between the enormous American continent and the new European powers, comments on the situation on the peninsula, what madness of our enemy, trying to reconquer America, without marine, without treasure and almost without soldiers, because those who have, are hardly enough to hold their own people in violent obedience and defend themselves from their neighbors. On the other hand, will this nation be able to do the exclusive trade of half the world, without manufactures, without territorial productions, without arts, without sciences, without politics? And he complains that Europe does not assume the cause of American independence with greater commitment, Europe itself, for the sake of sound politics, should have prepared and executed the project of American independence, not only because the balance of the world demands it, but because this is the legitimate and safe means of acquiring overseas business establishments. In addition to the geographical and human picture that he draws, Bolivar shows very well in these pages his talent as a politician, his knowledge of the Europe of his time, his ability as a strategist. However, at this point it was not clear even to him what was to come, nor what order they were in a position to build. It is still more difficult to foresee the future fate of the new world, to establish principles about its policy and almost to prophesy the nature of the government that it will adopt. Any idea regarding the future of this country seems risky to me. Could it have been foreseen when the human race was in its infancy? Surrounded by so much uncertainty, ignorance, and error, what would be the regime that it would embrace for its conservation? Who would have dared to say, such a nation will be a republic or a monarchy, the latter will be small, the former large? In my opinion, this is the picture of our situation. These reflections on the immediate reality of war and politics are based on more general considerations. Bolivar like undoubtedly a good part of the leaders of the American independence, to a greater or lesser extent, had an urgent need to understand the human composition of the continent, to know what could be done, in political and philosophical terms, with that ready burning clay to be molded. We are a small human race, he says, we have a world apart, surrounded by vast seas, new in almost all the arts and sciences, although in a certain way old in the uses of civil society. I consider the current state of America, like when the Roman Empire collapsed, each dismemberment formed a political system, according to their interests and situation or following the particular ambition of some chiefs, families, or corporations, with this remarkable difference, that those scattered members returned to re-establish their ancient nations with the alterations that things or events demanded, plus us, who barely conserve vestiges of what was once, and who on the other hand are not. Indians or Europeans, 
but a middle species between the legitimate owners of the country and the Spanish usurpers, in short, being Americans by birth and our rights are those of Europe, we have to dispute these with those of the country and that we maintain ourselves in it against the invasion of the invaders, thus we find ourselves in the most extraordinary and complicated case, despite the fact that it is a kind of divination to indicate what will be the result of the policy line that America follows. I dare to venture some conjectures, which, of course, I characterize as arbitrary, dictated by a rational desire and not by probable reasoning. Like Humboldt, one of the things that most worried Bolivar was the tremendous inequality that was inherited from the colony. In almost every country, indigenous peoples had been stripped of their rich tradition, of their awareness of being at the center of a world, of their dignity and hastily turned into worshippers of a mental order in which they would never be seen in conditions of equality. Due to their tremendous arrogance, the crown, the businessmen, and the church were willing to have subjects, to have servants and to have faithful, but not to allow a process of dignity of human beings to take place here, and even less of exaltation of free beings, capable of discretion and judgment. For centuries the Catholic Church would continue to prohibit free reading in America, which had been the instrument of the Enlightenment to build a citizen's conscience and a responsible individual capable of sustaining the scaffolding of the republics. Bolivar continually questioned himself about how to found a political order in which the serfs and slaves had access to freedom, the discriminated creoles had access to equality, and both had access to fraternity, principles that were so eloquently proclaimed in France by the canons of the revolution. But if it was difficult in Paris to make the French accede to liberty, equality, and fraternity, in Paris, where everyone was part of a homogeneous nation with more than four centuries of unified existence, united by a long tradition, what to expect from peoples made up of Indians, Creoles, and Blacks, Mestizos, Mulattoes, and Zambos? What to expect from those Creoles more willing to gain notoriety and power than to live with Mulatto and with the Indians? what to expect from these remnants of the old native cultures. What to do with these syncretic religions. What to do with the rich patriots who were willing to fight for independence but not give their many slaves their freedom. What to do with those miners and ranchers who lived by sending their metals and products to Spain. What to do with those merchants who lived from trade with the metropolises. What to do with those who had learned the thousand nuances of cheating in the bureaucracy with the already flourishing tradition of devious legalism, that empire of lawyers who tightened and tightened the nuts of the law to thrive on its gaps and parasitize from its ambiguities. Bolivar knew that the Spanish domination had not allowed the formation of an elite capable of governing, of directing, of forming modern states, and he knew that it was not a matter of waiting for that maturity to occur, because as long as colonial domination persisted, no Creole could train in the practice of administration or deploy their talent in it. Thus, he goes on to say, we were, as I have just explained, abstracted and, let's say, absent from the universe insofar as it is related to the science of government and administration of the state. We were never viceroys or governors, but for very extraordinary reasons, archbishops and bishops rarely, diplomats never, military, only as subordinates noble, without royal privileges, in short, we were neither magistrates, nor financiers, and hardly even merchants, everything is a direct contravention of our institutions. So he is forced to paint an unadorned pathetic picture of the plight of the heirs to the colonial administration. The Americans have risen suddenly and without previous knowledge, and, what is more sensible, without the practice of public business to represent on the world stage the eminent dignities of legislators, magistrates, treasury administrators, diplomats, general and how many supreme and subordinate authorities form the hierarchy of a regularly organized state. On the other hand, the custom of not seeing human beings in adversaries, typical of the conquerors and in those times also of royal armies, Bolivar recalls that the Mexicans struggled in vain to make them respect the law of nations, the junta proposed that war be waged as between brothers and fellow citizens, since it should not be more cruel than between foreign nations, that the rights of nations and of war, inviolable for the infidels and barbarians themselves, should be more so for Christians, subject to a sovereign and to the same laws, 
that the prisoners should not be treated as criminals of lace majesty nor should those who surrendered their weapons be beheaded, but rather be held hostage to be exchanged, that peaceful populations should not be entered with blood and fire, should not be decimated nor fifth to sacrifice them, was perpetuated by strange inheritance in the Creoles who came to become owners of the states. It is known that many indigenous people resisted the idea of independence because they rightly feared that the mestizos who would take over the states could become more exclusive and more contemptuous of Indians, blacks, and mulattoes than the Spaniards themselves. Also in his time, many slaves rejected the incomprehensible idea that slavery should be abolished, since without extensive and long-term educational and social work to change values, build an ethic of equality, and effectively offer educational opportunities, political, legal and economic, the freedom of the slaves was limited, as Estanislao Zuleta has said, to leaving them free of food and shelter. The path that Bolivar saw was the path of generosity, and after his generous proposals it was the path that was least followed. He saw his America, at least the daughter of Spain, as a single nation, but he could not find the political system in which that vastness and geographical diversity that we have spoken about here that ethnic complexity, that social turbulence, could fit. He believed in the need for a slow and paternal pedagogical work that would teach races, social classes, regions, and traditions to coexist, promoting the best of all of them and establishing that creative dialogue within the framework of legislation rich in guarantees, which would allow them to overcome in a short time the trauma of a century of savage conquests and two centuries of colonial arrogance, more than anyone else. I want to see America form the greatest nation in the world, except for its size and wealth, than for his freedom and glory. Although I aspire to the perfection of the government of my country, I cannot persuade myself that the new world is for the moment governed by a great republic, since it is impossible, I do not dare to wish for it, and I even less wish for a universal monarchy in America, because this project, without being useful, is also impossible. The abuses that currently exist would not be reformed and our regeneration would be fruitless. The American states have needed the care of paternal governments to heal the wounds and wounds of despotism and war. Just as there had always been a Caribbean America, an Andean America and an Amazonian America, an America of the northern deserts and an America of the southern pampas, a white America, an Indian America and a black America had also been defined. Or better yet, a predominantly white Euro-America, like Argentina, or Chile, an indigenous and mestizo Indo-America, in Mexico, Guatemala, Ecuador, Peru, or Bolivia, a predominantly black and mulatto Afro-America, in Cuba, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, or Brazil. This did not mean that they were not all mestizos to a greater or lesser degree, but many elements that characterized the countries derived from that original composition. Each of these Americas would have unique elements to contribute to the mosaic of civilization, and it was very difficult for the solution of these conflicts to come about through the almost magical discovery of a political system suited to their needs. In addition, all political systems are the result of tradition and experience, and Mestizo America was a new experiment in world history. The conquest of its formal independence would be just the first step in a long search that required the experiment of social coexistence within the framework of new legislation, economic strengthening governed by the ideal of autonomy and cultural independence. Simon Rodriguez rightly said that we would only find solutions when we did not think of ourselves as different from one country to another and when we did not believe in more borders than the natural ones of the continent. Two centuries later, these conditions for the existence of Mestizo America as a solidary nation with firm commitments and shared responsibilities regarding the destiny of the world have not yet been fully met, but despite the apparent chaos, we have come a long way. Miscegenation, which was our great difficulty, is also our great opportunity on the stage of contemporary culture, since this tendency towards miscegenation and millage is one of the main characteristics of modernity. The world no longer tends towards any form of racial or cultural purity, but towards all kinds of fusions. This explains the value of mestizo cultures as the full face of the time. Their challenges are the most compelling, since in the face of the persistent danger of fascism, 
which claims to claim the superiority of pure races, pure languages, single religions, or homogeneous cultures, and which absurdly seek to impose them on the entire world, the only alternative is to find the value of the mergers and show the mestizo civilization as the true face of the future. Thus, our countries, on which the hegemonic power of certain cultures carried out so many atrocities and so much violence, have been forced before any other to be the laboratories of this new planetary age. That is what the ideology of that great man of action and great dreamer of futures who was the liberator Bolivar pointed to, from a time when neither ethnology nor anthropology had given cultures their vindication and justification. There is in his ideas more a kind of dark intuition than a precise conceptual development. In the final paragraph of his letter we will see him trust more in the possibility of an American Union than of a European Union, since Europe seemed to him more divided in political terms than our America. In our time we have seen that Europe, more radically separated in cultural and social terms, has begun to coalesce into one great political community. United by tradition and language, perhaps the day will not be far away when the still improbable dream of a unity of nations of our America will be fulfilled as outlined in those words of the letter of Jamaica. It is a grandiose idea to try to form the entire new world into a single nation with a single bond linking its parts to each other and to the whole. Since it has an origin, a language, some customs, and a religion, it should, therefore, have a single government that would confederate the different states that are to be formed, but it is not possible, because remote climates, diverse situations, opposing interests, dissimilar characters, divide America. How beautiful it would be if the Isthmus of Panama were for us what Corinth was for the Greeks. Hopefully one day we will have the fortune to install there an august congress of the representatives of the republics, kingdoms, and empires, to treat and discuss the high interests of peace and war, with the nations of the other parts of the world. This kind of corporation may take place at some happy time of our regeneration, another hope is unfounded similar to that of Abbe St. Pierre, who conceived the laudable delusion of convening a European Congress to decide on the fate and interests of those nations. The right to the present. What we were witnessing with the political independence of America was the effort to return to the nations of the continent their American condition. The very idea of a nation as a people established in a territory was contradicted by the colonial system. For Spain and Portugal it was easier to believe in the empire, they were in the center, they were in the style of Platonic Christian mythology the ancient and voluntary soul of a world, and the body expanded beyond the ocean, through lands and fortunate islands in which the kings scarcely believed. It is surprising that no king of Spain has ever come to see the vast land that gave him those tons of gold and silver, that mahogany, and those pearls. Spain believed too much in itself, too little in the planetary skin of its empire. A king who had the power of Caesar and the curiosity of Aristotle, an Alexander capable of exploring and governing at the same time, would have been necessary, but there was not in Spain, and perhaps not even in Europe at that time, a ruler like that, and the only Alexander we had was Humboldt. This meant that Spain was lost to its imperial destiny, that America was lost to the Spanish monarchy, although certainly not to Spanish culture, much less to European civilization. Even that cruel war that history imposed was inspired by the enlightened ideas of the French and the liberalism of the English, so that no one wanted to break with Europe except with an unjust and secular subjection. With Spain, our subsequent relations would be throughout the entire 19th century marked by misunderstanding and tension. It would be difficult for peninsulars to look at these peoples as their equals after having created the habit of seeing them as subalterns and for Americans the memory of that historical enmity would last longer than it should. On the other hand, throughout the 19th century, Cuba and Puerto Rico remained Spanish colonies, and this helped prolong the illusion of a Spanish empire that had actually withdrawn from the main stage of history in the middle of the century. 17, and had been seriously undermined by the independence of mainland America. Some say that if the Spanish crown had moved to American lands, independence would not have happened. But, due to the example of the United States, due to the thought of the Enlightenment, due to the French Revolution, independence was at the gates, and the truth is that this hypothetical fact would only have postponed it. The example is in Brazil, 
where the threatened court of the Portuguese kings moved, and where the exiled monarchs ruled for decades. This gave a period of romantic singularity to Brazilian history, and perhaps to its people a different awareness of its own dignity, because for a more symbolic than material fact, Brazil could have at one moment the awareness that its body coincided with his spirit and abandon the ghostly colonial condition. The kings returned to the peninsula, leaving their son enthroned as emperor of Brazil, and although this changed something fundamental in the conscience of that vast country, it did not prevent independence, which in a less bloody way was proclaimed by the king himself. Emperor From Mexico to Patagonia, the other independence process was arduous and bloody. Due to their own military and economic weakness, the attempt to recover America by the Spanish had to be relentless, and the reconquest ended up being a second version, shorter but no less atrocious, of the conquest itself. Now not only did the Indians clash with the Spaniards and the blacks with their old masters, but also sons with fathers and brothers with brothers. America's conscience was rising and a shadow of old grievances seemed to inspire the heroism of the new warriors. There were also paradoxes. By a magical act the sons of the conquerors accused the peninsulars of having assassinated Atahualpa and of having betrayed Moctezuma, white hands, daughters of Castile or Asturias, raised their swords against the white Europe that had destroyed the Incas and the Zipas. But that fight was important, even with its mistakes, because it was the catharsis of a world trying to expel the excess of ghosts that overwhelmed its reality. And the truth is that they did not fully achieve it because the American world continued to be full of unknown ghosts, unnamed ghosts that only two centuries of culture of independence have been conjuring up and liberating in the slow process of finally conquering the right to the present. The towns mobilized against the reconquest, and many improvised their physiognomy in the very process of waging war on their enemies. Mexico would be Mexico forever because its profile was too powerful from the beginning and the country of the Mayans became independent in Guatemala. With few exceptions, the islands would each be a country. Chile, isolated by its chain of mountains and extending from the Magellanic extreme to the deserts of the north, would continue to be faithful to its Araucanian profile. Buenos Aires, which was not displaced by Montevideo, preserved its primacy over the extensive cattle pampa, which for a long time would feed Europe but could not maintain its influence over Upper Peru, where its armies of lancers went to fight the great battles. The greatest difficulty in defining national profiles would occur in the northern Andes region, the Caribbean coast and the Panamanian isthmus. From there came the main revolutionary warrior impetus. Just as Venezuela had spawned that romantic traveler, Francisco de Miranda, who left his name on the Arc de Triomphe de El Atoyal, as one of the heroes of the Napoleonic armies, so it spawned Bolivar, who would be the inspiring genius of the difficult battles that were liberating the territories and shaping the nations. There was no doubt that the center of the old Inca Empire would be an independent nation, the Peru of silver mountains and deserted beaches. Bolivar tried to make the Viceroyalty of New Granada, which united the government of Venezuela, the Kingdom of Santa Marta, the Isthmus of Panama, the Kingdom of New Granada, and the government of Quito, and of had it been achieved, the world would have seen the birth of one of the most vigorous and remarkable republics on the continent. Uniting the Caribbean front of Venezuela and Santa Marta, where the main walled fortress of South America stood, Cartagena de Indias, with the arm of Panama where Bolivar had seen the perfect space to found the capital of the New World and where Humboldt had foreseen the construction of an important interoceanic canal uniting the Orinoco and Amazon basins, the extreme north of the Andes and the equinoctial coast of the Pacific, that country, to which Bolivar gave the name of Columbus, was as large as Brazil but even more diverse and rich in biological resources, geographical and human. The dream did not last, Gran Colombia was fragmented into three parts, Venezuela, Colombia and Ecuador, and almost a century later it would be fragmented once more when the United States encouraged the separation of Panama from the territory of Colombia, to become partners of the Isthmus in the construction of the Interoceanic Canal. The beginning of Republican life meant the emergence of a series of challenges that the nations had not foreseen. Two realities called to persist for a long time then appeared, militarism and violence. 
military power arose from the campaigns themselves, and Bolivar was one of its spurs. Born among the wealthy Manchuans of Venezuela, the liberator gave all his wealth to the revolutionary cause, and from a certain point on he had to confront the aristocrats from whom he had sprung. The lords of the cocoa and sugar mill regions did not see the promise of abolishing slavery very favorably, and Bolivar ended up creating a kind of military caste that over time became one of the main instruments of social advancement, since that the excluded social sectors only managed to gain access to levels of power through the army. But at the same time, these sectors tried to make themselves indispensable, they needed permanent work to justify their existence, and they became so costly for societies that at times they consumed up to half the budget of the republics. As expected, independence did not bring about all the changes it promised, and this stimulated the outbreak of successive rebellions by sectors that felt their expectations were frustrated. So rich was the mosaic of groups, ethnic groups, social classes, and cultures, that it was very difficult to find the appropriate institutions for this plurality from the beginning. Violence, a violence that would have been unthinkable in colonial times, gradually became part of the landscape of our America. Memory, as Borges says, is porous to oblivion, and the two centuries of colonial stillness had almost succeeded in erasing from memory the atrocious century of the conquest, when it was easy for travelers to cross plains full of human skulls and skeletons. Broken up the colony was a time of relative peace, and it is enough to read Humboldt's books to see to what extent at the beginning of the 19th century, shortly before the rebellions and battles, South America was an almost idyllic region that a traveler could traverse. With astonishing security, where the only real dangers were the rapids of the rivers and the abundance of natural life. And even this was not truly threatening to those lucid travelers who were capable of loving the nature that others feared. Humboldt writes, as I said before, the marshy plain located between Javita and the Pimican Pier has a very bad reputation in the country due to the numerous poisonous snakes that inhabit it. Before settling in the hut, the Indians killed two mapanaries, from 1.3 to 2.6 meters long. It is a beautiful animal, with a white belly, with red spots on a black background on the back, it is very poisonous. Since there was a great deal of grass in the barracks and we had to sleep on the ground because we were unable to hang our hammocks we spent the night worried. In the morning, when lifting a jaguar skin that had served as a bed for one of the servants, a large snake appeared. As the Indians say, these reptiles move slowly as long as they are not chased, and they approach the man in search of warmth. In the Magdalena it was the case that a snake got into the bed of one of our companions, and spent part of the night there without doing him any harm. I do not claim to be an advocate of vipers and rattlesnakes, but it can be said that if these poisonous animals were as aggressive as is believed, in some areas of America, such as the Orinoco and the humid mountains of Choco, man would have succumbed before the infinite number of said animals. American nature lost in the eyes of reason that reputation for cruelty that had even been one of the justifications for the barbarism of the conquerors. The colonial regime rested on two clear medieval assumptions, the hierarchies were established, the religious ideology varnished inequality, injustice, even atrocity with cosmic justifications, the imbalance seemed written in the laws of the world, the superiority of the white and Christian Europe was evident in the faces, in the ceremonies, in the firmness of the returning stars. And suddenly all that was knocked down by a cyclone of justice that claimed the right of all human beings to freedom, dignity, equality. The text of the new law, the new order of the cosmos equally fascinated the imagination of the Creoles eager for vindication and eager to be the successors of the peninsulars, the mestizos, and the slaves. Only the indigenous people, who had achieved a certain legislation, not of course egalitarian, but at least indulgent, born more from the guilty conscience of the crown than from its humanism, looked with suspicion at this new order in which they could not expect to be looked at. As equals by arrogant creoles, accustomed for centuries to parasitizing servitude. For this reason, the last royalist strongholds were the old indigenous regions, and one of the first Colombian guerrillas was precisely in Pasta the guerrilla supporters of the king, who in vain sought the restoration of a world as definitively lost as that of the forgotten Inca, who covered his face with a veil so as not to blind his subjects. Violence was thus, 
paradoxically, one of the consequences of freedom. Or if you like, the legacy of a world where speech seemed less and less like reality. Thanks to independence, the countries claimed to be liberal, democratic republics, where human rights prevailed, where equality of citizens prevailed before the law, where no one could be discriminated against because of their race, their creed, or their social condition. To try to comply with these precepts, the European republics had at least the certainty that all their nationals were united by tradition, by customs, by the memory of common myths, of the founding heroes, of the fathers of the country, of the national poets. A tradition is not improvised, and France came to the revolution after uninterrupted processes of cohesion that generated a minimum of national solidarity. But here every century broke a social order, and broke it fiercely and forever. The colony, which illusorily made us Europeans, now had to give way to the republics that made us Creoles again, but now mestizos, half European, a little African, vaguely American. The barely rooted faith of religion had to give way to the cult of reason, to the doctrine of equality, to civil life. Violence was, therefore, among us, an inevitable consequence of the entrenchment of ideals, of the vague awareness of having rights and the indignation that these were not fulfilled in practice. There are poor societies, such as those of some Eastern countries, where poverty does not generate violence, but it is because a long philosophical and religious tradition inscribes that inequality within a cosmic system of deficiencies and compensations, while our countries rest powerfully on a fraudulent discourse of equality that creates real frustrations and powerful resentments. And without a doubt, violence will continue to exist until our nations achieve a credible democracy and make the minimum assumptions of equality proclaimed by their laws a reality. The image of a Hispanic America captive of authoritarian armies, of punctilious jurists, of exasperating bureaucracies, basically reveals or betrays that our central problem was the lack of deep traditions. Our convictions were always new, so they could always seem provisional. Positive law, the action of force and the threat of weapons are only required in peace, in the exercise of normal citizen existence, when daily life is not governed by strong customs or by a balanced social contract. For the elementary reason that what governs societies is fundamentally ethics, not positive law, nor the police, nor the judges, nor the courts. Those are extreme instances to correct what tradition and customs fail to control. When traditions are lacking, society floats dangerously in a vacuum, and it is necessary to multiply, often in vain, positive legislation, everything has to be regulated, everything has to be intervened by the norm nothing seems obvious. That is why extreme legalism is the other face of illegality, its necessary complement. But to this is added the threatening fact that in the last century we have entered the West into a time of hasty death of custom and of all power of fashion, this fact, which endangers the existence of all societies, is first affecting those whose tradition has less deep roots. The states founded in our America after the conquest were more fragile than anywhere else because their discourse had always been under suspicion. From the beginning, to put it in an extreme way, thieves forbade theft, murderers punished crime, violators of the ancestral family laws wanted to impose the respectability and inviolability of the family order. The law was never so relative and it was never so authoritative at the same time. The children of Mestizo America grew up with minimal confidence in the state, and we affirmed ourselves in an extreme individualism that in some countries for long periods made it almost impossible to govern. People believed in themselves and in their family. Society, the state, the public good, seemed to him more or less incomprehensible abstractions. The man least suspected of hatred for the European tradition, Jorge Luis Borges, has reasoned in his essay our poor individualism this characteristic of the American mestizos, and does not necessarily see it as something negative. He thinks, like Spencer, that the greatest danger of our time is the gradual interference of the state in the internal affairs of individuals, and he thinks that in the face of this evil, in the face of this danger of unanimous ceremonies, of living and dying mechanically shouted faced with what he calls mere discipline usurping the place of lucidity, our insolent individualism will perhaps find justification and duties.
but the main question is whether we can find a point of balance between the interests of the community and the interests of the individual, if we can be somewhere between these two extremes, the rigidity of life in statist countries, with infinitely annoying bureaucratic apparatuses and a poor and submissive individuality, and the extreme disorder of life in anarchized countries, where there is no other law than the will of arbitrary individuals. Perhaps we can understand Valerie's sentiment in the same sense when he states that the two main enemies of the world are order and disorder. The war and the peace. Karabobo, Boyaka, Pichincha, Iakuchojunan, those words escaped their old purely geographical meaning to become milestones in a mythology, the names of the battles that gave freedom to Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. Thus also the names of Hidalgo, Morelos, Bolivar, San Martin, O'Higgins, Narino, Sucre, Cordoba, Piz, Flores, escaped genealogy to become the mythical names of the epic of independence. Names of people that became names of regions, as happened with Humboldt himself, who today names lakes, plains, mountains, flowers, and ocean currents. Men like Narino, intellectual precursors of independence, later appear as warriors in difficult battles against adverse armies, climates, and regions. Great warriors of the liberation campaign ended up contributing to the period of immobility of the republics, when after the heroic beginnings, the continent atomized into isolated countries and sometimes even in conflict with each other. The republican age was losing the heroic timber that had given birth to it, and mestizo America was entering an age of gloom. Because those men of the last years of the 18th century and the first years of the 19th had formed the most universal and most contemporary generation that our America had ever produced. They knew the world and made themselves known. His struggle occupied a bright place in contemporary history, in the world landscape of the first half of the century. We see the statues of these heroes next to the Alexander III Bridge, or in the squares of Rome or Moscow we see Simon Bolivar Avenue that crosses the entire eastern part of Paris from north to south, we see their statue in the Central Park of New York, and we understand that those men came to mean something superior to the world, that they made themselves admired by it. There are intellectuals who defend the historical superiority of men like Bolivar or San Martin over personalities like Napoleon Bonaparte. It is not difficult to recognize an ethical superiority of these American heroes over the French, Napoleon was an ambitious warrior determined to redesign Europe to his liking and to ennoble and magnify his family, Bolivar, a generous statesman who gave everything for the freedom of a world. Napoleon bequeathed to Europe the revolutionary certainty that an individual from the people was capable of building a brief and ferocious continental empire, but after his passing we only find the ruins of ideals and the prostration of societies, the work of our liberators was much more lasting wherever their intelligence passed directing their sword, the dream of nations is still alive. But it is necessary to learn to ennoble collective dreams, and not idealize individuals too much. The triumph of Europe over the native cultures of America took the form of the triumph of some individuals over some peoples, and since then the bad illusion prevailed among us that history is only the story of some faces and some biographies. The West abounds in the mindless cult of individuals, and this growing and trivial cult has led to a growing contempt for communities, reduced to the role of manipulated and faceless masses. The future has to know how to recover its importance, forge and sustain shared dreams again. Our countries made an effort to build their republican systems, their representative democracies, their civil codes, their public finances. But the American 19th century also saw in more than one place the gradual replacement of the heroes of independence by the tyrants of the republics, and the first thing Bolivar's dream succumbed to was the ambition and strength of character of some individuals who each seized their republic to build an isolated world, sometimes indifferent to the fate of the rest of the continent, sometimes even hostile to it. Those caudillos and tyrants even loved their country disproportionately, but always in the selfish form of a sick nationalism that forgot the old continental destiny, and that lost sight of the horizon of solidarity that had protected independence. While the world advanced towards intercommunication, towards the strengthening of that world market that had been born with the discovery, how often our America was lost in an illusion of closed and autistic nations. Children of a lucid, generous, and continental army.
the countries saw the growth of isolated national armies that once were even willing to confront their neighbors or actually did. Never in the European way, certainly, but our history did not justify such hostilities, and did not even authorize them because of the illusion that has so deceived Europe, of the purity of a race, a language, or a tradition. Our deepest reason for being as nations was to overcome those old ethnic idols. All in all, few regions of the world show such a poor history of wars between nations in the last two centuries as our America. The Chaco War, the invasion of the United States by Pancho Villa's troops, the conflicts in Colombia and Peru, the so-called soccer war between Honduras and El Salvador, the recent clashes between Peru and Ecuador, while other continents, and in particular Europe, show in those same two centuries the most discouraging succession of international conflicts that history remembers. And, certainly, even the perverse violence entrenched in Colombian society has needed almost a hundred years to complete the million deaths that France produced in just one year of the revolution, and in our entire mestizo continent there is not a single example of wars like the First European War, capable of producing 20 million dead, or like the War of 39-45 that ruthless factory of death that produced a balance of almost 50 million. But with the unforgettable burden of the original genocide, and children of an epoch of generous and collective independence, we American mestizos do not have the right to invent wars between nations and rather the duty to reject them all is imposed on us. Now we see with fraternal curiosity that the Europe of eternal discord has tried to build an international order capable of arbitrating its tensions, agreeing on a continental economy, establishing a coordinated policy, a single currency, and we can read in this the promise that it will also in our America, a continental agreement will one day be possible, our differences being much smaller. Of course, in this formation of supernations there is a lot of hegemonic ambition and the latent danger of large-scale conflicts, when the world tends to segment itself not in the plurality of its cultures but in extensive hostile empires and a challenge of the present and the future is to clearly define the limits of alliances between nations in the perspective, not of creating selfish empires, but of advancing along the path of human solidarity and the protection of the planet as our home. Common. We already know that these alliances cannot be based on the denial of the physiognomies of each country, but must be able to promote them, to correct their gentile vanities and to find in them the value of what is unique and therefore precious. These national profiles are the result of the original composition of the countries, of their own geographical and human nature, and of the ups and downs of their history. We no longer conceive of Mexico without the firm adventure of the reform, in which the continent saw how an indigenous man, Benito Juarez, acceded to the status of head of state, defined the spirit of the institutions, and faced with courage and greatness to mighty empires of their time. We cannot conceive of Argentina without the civilizing work of Domingo Faustino Sarmiento, whose dilemma between civilization and barbarism, and whose deep sociological and literary meditation gave his country a profile in the continental order, or without José Hernández, who found the poetic tone to to exalt to the music of the language the landscape of the Pampas and the stormy and difficult life of the Gauchos. We cannot conceive of Ecuador without Alfaro, Chile, and Venezuela without the legal and grammatical work of Andres Bello, Cuba without Marti and Masio, Colombia without contradictory men such as Tomas Cipriano de Mosquera or Rafael Núñez, or without passionate explorers of their country and sensitive creators like Jorge Isaacs or José Eustachio Rivera. The countries gathered together in a village life, but that life continually alternated between the creative efforts of thinkers, patriots, and artists, and the convulsion of civil wars that were the natural consequence of the discord that Bolivar had warned of and that the independence had failed to heal. They were trying to build their reason for being as nations on a past of violent disintegration and unrestrained looting. We have a duty to be lenient with the precariousness of our first century of independent life, because what was being invented there was something totally new, the problems that were faced were not experienced by any other nation on earth, and each civilized achievement however modest that it was was the fruit of much patience and advances in the unknown. The foreseeable thing was that countless cases of violence and intolerance would be experienced, and that the impatience of an order would drift towards authoritarianism, since it was early for the turbulent nations to conquer their democratic maturity.
This is how the 19th century passed, the century of the taciturn Dr. Francia, governing as a single country in the world the territory of the old Jesuit missions, Paraguay. Century of roses in Argentina and the growing rumor of Italian and Jewish, Polish, and Russian immigrants. Century of the eternal Colombian war between liberals and conservatives. Century of the Catholic Church reigning powerfully over the spirits where three centuries ago the powerful solar myths and the feminine divinities of America prevailed. Our 20th century literature would later lean on those ages to interrogate those other episodes that also contributed to forming our modern identities and further dismantling continental memory, the enlightened despotism of Dr. Francia, in novels such as Yoel Supremo, by R.O.A. Bastos, The Massive Heresy of Antonio Cancel Hiro, in The War of the End of the World, by Mario Vargas Llosa, the drama of Maximiliano de Habsburgo in Mexico and the final madness of his wife Carlotta, in Noticias del Imperio, by Fernando del Paso, Bolivar's agony over a feverish river, in The General in His Labyrinth, by Gabriel Garcia Marquez or The Ashes of the Liberator, by Fernando Cruz Cronfly, the archetypal representation of the Latin American dictator, in so many works from El Señor Presidente by Miguel Ángel Asturias to the Autumn of the Patriarch, the story of the provincial Gaminal, Lord of Lives and Estates, elaborated with poetic intensity in Juan Rolfo's Pedro Paramo. Or the search for the meaning of episodes as mysterious as the private conversation between Bolívar and San Martín, which decided the fate of the liberating campaign, in stories such as Guayaquil, by Jorge Luis Borges. Tracing the processes of the 19th century would be almost impossible. We live a dream in all countries, that of discovering what it meant to be American, but that dream was the father of some deceptions, that of fierce nationalism, that of foolish provincialism, that of the veneration of some prejudices. If our history shows anything, it is that this America cannot be understood if it is isolated in regions, in countries, in compartments. And it is that elusive era that we simplify and believe we understand by giving it the name of modernity, which brought us some notions that could help us understand the destiny, made of effort and promises, of our continent. In Search of Modernity Since the mid-19th century, the culture of our America undertook with greater passion than ever the search for its true face. Until then we were good Spaniards, good Latinists, good scholars in the classical way but our own world intimidated us. Literature, for example, perpetuated itself in exoticism, or in that other form of inauthenticity that is the hyperbolic celebration of a few local traits. The search for landscape began, in the poems of Othon and Altamirano, in those of Julio Arboleda, in those of Subi, in those of José Marmol. That landscape was still too foreign, memories of the watercolorist's salon, and perhaps the best of our nature was more finely captured by those European draftsmen who accompanied the expeditions of great travelers like Hamilton, and who later reproduced from a distance, inspired by their own traditions, the American landscape. Europe began to experience the nostalgia of lost nature, but also, of course, that magnification of distant lands that can be perceived in the first romantics. From there would come the adventures towards exotic lands of Gauguin, Rambo, Stevenson. While our poets strove to parody European classicism, Europe yearned for the tropics, the virgin lands, the equinoctial countries, the overwhelmed ports of the South Seas. In all the Romantics there is this idealization of remote lands, Byron's desire to join the armies of Bolivar, the way Goethe followed Humboldt's travels through America on a map, Baudelaire's voyage to the Indian Ocean, the ballad of the Coleridge's old sailor, who ventures through fantastic seas, Victor Hugo's songs to the volcanoes of Central America, the word Darien at the end of a Keats sonnet. Our land became illustrious, except for us, we had not yet taken root in our world, and on the other hand the Castilian language remained in the limbo of silence, at the same time that all the languages of the West were creating a great literature. To trace the political events of our America in the 19th century is to run the risk of losing ourselves in a chaos of confusing circumstances. Civil wars, tyrannies, oppression of the spirits, the Catholic index and the consequent prohibition of free reading, the confinement in village republics, 
the impossibility of having a continental profile again, of being part of the universe again. On the other hand, to look at the field of culture is to witness a growing process that would very soon bear amazing fruit. The facts could be seen coming, a journalist from Buenos Aires took up his pen to write a defense of the poor gauchos persecuted by justice, and Martin Fierro broke into song. That poem by José Hernández seemed only a picturesque and original literary work, it was the discovery after centuries of the poetic voice of this America, there was suddenly the immensity of the pampa, its vegetation, the tumultuous trot of the haciendas, the birds and the men nestled in the landscape, the intonation of hitherto unnoticed peasants, now resolved into heroes and singers. Here I begin to sing to the compass of the vigila, that the man who reveals it an extraordinary sorrow, like the solitary bird with his singing he consoles himself. This search for the landscape, physiognomies, memory, had also been undertaken by the plastic arts of those years. The painters still used the language of European art, and there was still a long way to go before the rich languages of the art of the Native Americans were received by our artists with the naturalness with which the colonial artificers received them, but the themes were beginning to be their own. Painters like the Colombian José María Espinosa, made an effort to weave an art of today in times of independence, and have left us the admirable iconography of heroes like Bolívar, but also exquisite collections of portraits of people of his time, as well as the critical art of his caricatures. The issues of immediate reality were beginning to make demands on our sensibilities. This is how it is possible to see it in the discovery of Pulque by the Mexican José Obregón, from 1869, where, like the old classic scenes on Roman or Egyptian themes, there are already Aztec faces in idealized architectures trying to emerge in the language of the time, the same can be said of the Tlaitkol, from Tlaxcatlan, from 1851, a naked titan with his classic fig leaf, whose body, however, is already that of an American Indian and throughout the continent the siege of the landscape and the search for what was singular in it, such as those snowy mountains, deep parched valleys and massifs of agave that we see in the painting Hacienda de Chimalpa, painted in 1893 by the also Mexican José María Velasco. The first novels of the 19th century are testimony to that quest that is both self-sacrificing and fascinated. There was nothing more difficult than reaching the familiar and the immediate, and Holderlin already said that the divine is precisely that which cannot be explained, that which is immediate and simple. Long discovered by others, we faced the greatest challenge, that of discovering ourselves. But the instruments of that search, full of deviations and imitations, had been developed more to lose us than to find us. Become what you are, said Pinder twenty-five centuries ago. And it is true that it was not enough for us to be, we needed the full consciousness of that existence, and in it a double fire of will and pride. One can become something without the mediation of his will at all, as a consequence of historical fatalities. But the moment comes when one discovers that it is there, that history gravitates around it, that we have to decide if we want to be like that, if we change or if we give up. Those exploratory novels from the time of Roses in Argentina, of the reform in Mexico, of the haciendas of Valle del Cauca in Colombia, were called Amalia, Clemencia, Maria. The search for the homeland was confused with the search for beloved creatures. I loved a country that is a maiden to me, Aurelio Arturo would later say. This search for countries was also an exercise in love. Poetry continued to make an effort to name reality, but above all it made an effort to convert the language that our enemies had left us into a truly American language an immediate and precise instrument of a sensibility, of a way of being in the world. For Spanish to stop being our bad conscience and become our song. And at the end of the century a new literary generation came to renew the language that had been silent for many generations. You have to compare the voice of those poets of the end of the century with everything that had preceded them, to feel that now language was finally something of its own, something alive, mischievous, eloquent, full of nuances. Manuel Gutierrez Najera, a young Mexican journalist with a melancholic soul, tried to describe his girlfriend, whom, lending her his own pseudonym, he called the Duchess Job, and the painting he achieved, the music he weaved with his triplet, 
shows an unexpected and totally new mental vivacity. In sweet after-dinner talk, while I devour strawberry after strawberry, and downstairs your dog Bob snores, I'll make you a portrait of the Duchess that Duke Job adores, sometimes. It's not the Countess, that Villasana caricature, nor the Poblana of Petticoat Red that Preto loved, it's not the maid with knobby feet, nor the one who dreams of gummy bears. And with the Michelo roosters. My little Duchess, the one who adores me, doesn't have the air of a great lady, she's the Grisetta of Paul de Kock, she doesn't dance Boston, and she doesn't know the high enjoyment of racing and the pleasures of the five o'clock. We came from a severe and ceremonious language. Here we are suddenly before a smiling, fluent and charmingly effective language. If someone reaches her, if she requires her, she is light as a zebra. Keep going to the warehouse. But woe to the Tuno if he extends his arm, no one saves him from the umbrella blow that unloads on his temple. But of course, this renewed discovery of the language is also the consequence of a complex and convulsive history. Hasn't Mexico just gone through the painful experience of another colonial adventure? Now it has been France, the court of the Second Empire, Napoleon's own nephew, who has conceived the project of putting a perfumed prince of the House of Habsburg to reign over the Mexicans. This has been the way to collect from Mexico the debts aggravated by a liberal revolution that has been going on for more than three years. A liberal revolution, the Reformation, which has raised its hand against the enormous properties of the Church, has separated the Church and the state, has established secular education, and has turned Mexico into a contemporary country of the European liberal democracies. The Indian soul of the great country has risen up in insurrection and has affirmed itself in the principles of modernity, just as before it had devoutly accepted the religion that came from the sea. Benito Juarez, a Zapotec Indian who ruled Oaxaca, the city of silver, has now taken over the entire country, and it is then that Imperial Europe attacks and occupies Veracruz in 1862, and two years later consecrates Maximilian of Habsburg, brother of the Emperor of Austria, as Emperor of the Mexicans. Maximiliano has been convinced by his protectors that the Mexican people have claimed his presence through a plebiscite. The clergy have jubilantly applauded this invasion and this restoration project of all that preceded it, including, of course, the old property regime, but they do not count on the fact that these confiscated properties have new owners and these will support the Republican cause. The clashes continue, the French withdraw leaving Maximilian installed in the illusion of his own legitimacy. And the triumphant troops of Juarez finally capture and shoot Emperor Maximilian, showing in that royal blood, spilled in Querétaro, that Mexico does not accept new colonialist adventures. With the French expelled and defeated, poets can now receive France's contribution, not as an imposition of ominous powers but as a dialogue of sensibilities. Gutierrez Najera's verses both hide and reveal that historical background, what is in them, what will mark his generation from then on, is the contribution of the music of symbolism and French Parnassianism. And there an amazing fact occurs, that a distant poet, not particularly interested in the history and even less in the geography of distant lands, Paul Verlaine himself, unintentionally becomes the encourager of a poetic adventure of considerable historical repercussions. A passionate egoist, a lyrical poet ruled by what Edmund Wilson called the pathos of emotional instability, someone who sins ardently today and repents utterly tomorrow, who today is a ungoverned satyr and tomorrow a mortifying ascetic, but who in each of his metamorphoses is an incessantly sensitive and musical consciousness, faithful to his passions, whether they be debauchery or contrition, this curious poet of capricious individualism nonetheless becomes the inspirer of a continental. Rebellion in America. The fact deserves attention. Against his fame in France for being a libertine and even a deprave, the poets of our America will always have a privileged place for him in their hearts. Father and magical teacher, Ruben Dario calls him, Angelic Verlin, Leon de Grave tells him, and Borges, giving thanks for the wonders he found in the world, for bread and salt, for mahogany, cedar and sandalwood, for tiger stripes. Thanks also for his favorite poet with these words, for Verlin, innocent as the birds.
How to understand that a French poet who only thought of himself and his own passions, ends up being the instrument for the spiritual liberation of silenced societies? Perhaps we can answer it this way, what our countries needed at that moment in their history was sincerity, passion, and freedom, and those words fully name Verlaine. By abandoning the tutelage of Spain we were looking for the voice of the other great Latin culture, by breaking with our subjection to narrow and oppressive traditions, we were looking for the influence of powerful individualities, by breaking with the rigidity of our habits, we were looking for a more sensual world, more harmonious and more rhythmic. As Ruben Dario will say immediately, upon taking full possession of that influence. It was a soft air of slow turns, the fairy harmony rhythmicized its flights, and there were vague phrases and faint sighs between the sobs of the cellos. The rebirth of our consciousness would also be made of these nuances of sensitivity. To fulfill the vast tasks that the future demanded of it, Mestizo America had to be capable of bold searches and powerful renovations, the one carried out by modernism was full of that subtlety, and the intuition of our poets was completely right. There is no other way to explain that, each one by his side, all the great poets of our countries have found themselves with that same influence and have allowed it to work renovations on their spirit. A great book, it is said, is never the spontaneous fruit of a talent, rather a whole world tended towards it and many contemporaries will have tried to write it. The anthology of our modernists will forever show a truth that our factious politicians and our selfish businessmen have always denied, that the sensitivity of our peoples reveals extraordinary affinities, that although there is no economic alliance, no political agreement, no geographical homogeneity, there is a continental culture, that we are culturally a single nation, a huge nation capable of working in alliance without meaning to, inspired by his profound genius. That is why Borges is justified in saying that Ruben Dario and his modernists can well be called liberators. Our America was willing to receive France's contribution, only if it helped her to be more herself, not if she wanted to impose herself to steal her being. Once political independence was achieved, the continent had to wait the rest of the century to promulgate its spiritual independence, and modernism was that great declaration of freedom, that conquest of new rhythms and themes of a new naturalness in expression. Furthermore, our independence, which seemed to consist of separating us from Spain, at the same time brought us closer to the other nations of Europe. Now we received the contributions of the great French poetry, without a doubt also of the English poetry of his time, and even of North American poetry, through France. Baudelaire had translated Edgar Allan Poe, and our poets were influenced by the poetry of the North of this same continent, by way of an oceanic detour. Someone has rightly said that in the 19th century French was the language that allowed the two halves of America to dialogue. Manuel Gutierrez Najera in Mexico, José Marti and Julian del Casal in Havana, José Asuncion Silva and Guillermo Valencia in Colombia, Manuel González Prada in Peru, Ricardo Jaimes Frere in Bolivia, Leopoldo Lugans in Argentina, Julio Herrera and Rysig in Uruguay and Ruben Dario in Nicaragua, the list is incomplete, not only renewed the language in America but also managed, through Dario's poetic, critical and personal work, to bring his revolution to a Spain that longed for it and felt it, but had not fully found the path to that renewal. The process was completed, the Castilian language was reborn in America, Mestizo America once again had a place in contemporary history, modernity reached our peoples, and it did not arrive in the trivial form of a plethora of objects or technical skills, but in harmony with the deep dictates of history, in the form of a sensitivity capable of questioning the era that was born. Not in vain were we children of deep civilizations, not in vain did Greek and Roman, Mayan and Aztec, Spanish and Jewish, Moorish and Inca cultures encourage our origins alike, an exciting and tremendous century was about to begin where we would need the combined inheritance of all those civilizations so as not to succumb to the great dangers that loomed on the horizon of history, the temptation of the pure races, which reacted against the growing human fusions, the temptation to destroy nature in the name of a senseless and suicidal human comfort, the temptation to enthrone the state as the redemptive instrument of humanity and the teacher of morality, the temptation to turn the world into a supermarket, culture into a spectacle, 
and the tragic human adventure on Earth into a simple business stripped of memory and hope. The 20th Century Throughout the 19th century, our land had lived under the powerful influence of England, its main trading partner and who traced the patterns of economic and political events. But the formula of the Monroe Doctrine, America for Americans, had already been heard, and in the North the custom of confusing the adjective Americans with the adjective Americans had become general. Thus, the play on words consciously formulated by President Monroe not only meant that the European powers had to say goodbye to their influence on the continent, but that the vast territory, from Labrador to Tierra del Fuego, was already promised to a nation. As England withdrew, the United States assumed in the Caribbean the role of tax collector, military protector of the internal order of some countries and even openly exercised government under a vague illusion of autonomy. The powerful country had the hasty habit of immediately recognizing political regimes, no matter how improvised, if they were favorable to its interests, and that is how it recognized the regime of William Walker, the adventurer who in the second half of the century tried take over Nicaragua. Fortunately, the international reaction forced him to retract that hasty recognition. In 1898 the Spanish-American War broke out, the conclusion of the Cuban War of Independence which stripped Spain of its last possessions in the Caribbean and inaugurated North American control of the area. The next step for the United States was to secure control of the projected interoceanic canal on the Isthmus of Panama. Lesseps' French project required large investments and his company failed. The United States was interested in taking on the construction. The railway that until then linked the two coasts of the Isthmus and allowed the transshipment of goods had to be replaced by a canal like the one that Humboldt had recommended almost a century ago. That channel would ensure its controllers enormous power in economic and strategic terms. But Panama was Colombian territory, and the government of Bogota did not seem very inclined to accept the conditions of the capitalist partner. While England dominated pragmatically and without sermons, American domination was full of exhortations and reprimands, although it was no less pragmatic. When the North American government sent its project to the Colombian Congress, it had already moved all the necessary cards so that its plans could not be frustrated. It was enough for Congress to formulate objections to the proposed contract, for an independence insurrection to break out in Panama. The ships of the United States Navy were ready to prevent the landing of Colombian troops in the waters of both seas and in a few days the government of the North had recognized the sovereignty of the new state and signed with it a contract identical to the one it had sent. To the Colombians I took Panama declared President Teodoro Roosevelt, who had baptized without euphemisms and with insolent frankness his policy towards the peoples of the South, as the big stick policy. More than Colombia, the whole of Mestizo America reacted with indignation, but the blow was complete. In the last decades of the previous century, the metropolises had tried to secure control of the productive lands of the continent, the coffee-growing regions of Guatemala were controlled by the Germans, the sugar-growing land of Cuba by the Americans, and the banana-producing areas of Puerto Rico, by the United States. Haiti and Santo Domingo, specifically by the gentlemen of Boston. There was increasingly an economy of producing regions, another of storage systems and another of means of transportation in which different planetary powers competed. The modernization process was intense, in 1878 Argentina had 2,200 kilometers of railways and more than 700 of telegraphs, Chile, 1,500 and more than 4,000, Brazil 2,000 and 7,000, Colombia 100 and more than 2,000, Venezuela 100. Mexico 611,000. But while in some countries these figures did not change greatly, in 1914 Argentina already had a railway network of 33,000 kilometers, had built the great port at enormous cost, and had made the swampy area of the province of Buenos Aires practicable through the canal construction. At the end of the century, Argentine exports of cereals and meats increased which will have grown ten times between 1898 and 1928, producing the great prosperity of the country and its new presence in the world arena. And all this was parallel to the waves of immigrants that sustained the new productivity.
Brazilian coffee, which was the basis for the growth of the prosperous city of Sao Paulo, was a moving strip that moved forward, modifying the landscape and sometimes devastating nature in an alarming way. These bonanzas of intensively cultivated products, marked by the consumption needs of the metropolises, altered the surface of our America more than all the previous centuries of conquest and colonization. At the rhythm of the requirements of overseas consumers, the banana republics, the coffee growers, and the oil companies grew. Sometimes agricultural production reached such a dynamic that it did not simply satisfy immediate demands but offered the possibility of accumulating harvests for future sales. Brazilian coffee, for example, stockpiled in warehouses in Germany, was surprised there by the outbreak of the First World War. But the technical revolution in the United States would soon change our world in another way. After the steam engine, the harvesting machine, new means of communication and transportation arose. The railroad had been above all a legacy of the English age, the United States brings a new age. The internal combustion engine is already spreading and with it the invention of the century that is beginning, automotive transport. The popularization of the automobile initially precipitated the boom in rubber, the development, which would continue throughout the century, of the oil industry, the growing demand for the exploitation of hydrocarbons. At the beginning of the century it was not possible to imagine from these fields, still asleep in another age, how much those inventions would alter the surface of our earth and the dynamics of its economy. The rubber fever came in the Amazon. In 1910, rubber reaches 25% of Brazilian exports, the collectors, the rubber tappers, ceaselessly bleed the great trees, and the capital of that delusional empire is seen emerging, Manaus. The city has large luxury hotels facing the jungle landscape, a hundred thousand inhabitants and a great classical theater that celebrates seasons of Italian opera next to the Amazonian stream. This colossal but controlled exploitation competes with destructive exploitation in other regions of the Amazon basin, in Peru and Colombia, where the rubber plantations become true concentration camps, where there is no gradual extraction and they are destroyed by like the trees and the lives of the workers. To those hells corresponds the intense novel Law of Origin, by José Eustachio Rivera, a lawyer from Huila who traveled as a member of a commission for the drawing of the borders between Colombia and Venezuela continued alone his recognition of those regions, and made an effort to denounce the atrocities of the Casa Arana against the settlers and the Indians. His work is a vigorous recreation of the reality of the jungle and the way in which a new stage of the endless conquest of America was sweeping through the land. When the cultivation of other varieties of rubber in the Far East made Amazonian rubber lose its profitability, everything vanished, just as Nueva Cadiz, the ephemeral city of pearls, had vanished. Tudela, the fleeting city of emeralds, the Eldorados of America, eternally renewed with each new wealth, and ghost towns, whose buildings could tell terrible stories, were slowly invaded by vegetation and humidity in the heart of the jungle. The great exploitation of oil had already begun. Mexico led its exploitation, followed by Venezuela and Colombia. After the reform, the regime of Porfirio Diaz, which lasted almost absolute power for 30 years, was re-elected several times by a perfectly oiled electoral machinery, undertook large-scale oil exploitation, while carrying out the tasks of extensive modernization in material terms. The highways, the railways, the new urban profile of Mexico City with its great promenades, its palace of fine arts, its inherited imperial architecture. The influence of the expelled France was felt equally in the urban design, in the customs, in the culture, but a deep ferment of rebellion encouraged in the peasant and indigenous regions. The violence was already coming, which is usually among us the expression of a social malaise long silenced and a consequence of exclusion, the daughter of secular stratifications. Gentile or racial violence does not abound in Mestizo America but there is violence exercised from power and sometimes blind and brutal claims against injustice, inequality, and abuse. The greatest consequence of those years of absolute power of Don Porfirio, which had defined and built so many positive things for the future, was the Mexican Revolution. At the end of his long regime, as a farewell act and in an interview for the press, Porfirio Diaz called for the emergence of an opposition.
Madero, a northern landowner, responded by launching his candidacy to compete with the dictator. The perfect electoral machine would not stop responding to 30 years of experience, 10 million votes for Porfirio Diaz and just over a hundred votes for his opponent. Later, sensing the ferment of the rebellions, Diaz withdraws and Madero assumes power. Then, as in the old days of Hidalgo and Morelos, peasant and Indian movements resurfaced, now led by Emiliano Zapata in the sugar lands of Morelos. Confronted with Zapata, Madero makes the mistake of trusting Huerta, who is in charge of betraying him and, with the agreement of the United States minister, in alliance with a nephew of Diaz, of assassinating him. However, another popular movement is already emerging in the north, that of Pancho Villa. Villa, Zapata, and Obregón allied themselves with Carranza. Obregón's government comes, and then that of Obregón, and the displacement of the popular chiefs, as had already happened a century ago, but the final result is a restoration with emphasis on the main themes of the reform that Juarez had begun halfway through. Century before. And throughout the revolution, oil flows relentlessly from the country to the port of Tampico, to leave there for world markets. That revolt kept the country convulsed for decades. Like all revolutions, it was a slightly oriented chaos, a storm whose winds had a vague direction. The episodes were too variegated, the succession of leaders vertiginous, the succession of rulers themselves a gallery of momentary portraits. Above that chaos are the scene of the death of General Bernardo Reyes, about to become head of the Mexican nation, and the literary destiny inherited by his son, Alfonso Reyes, who, fleeing from that din of political conflicts, found the path of his spirit, and bequeathed to his America a profound work of reflection on our Greek and Latin sources, on our complex cultural roots and on what we are as Americans. That Homer in Cuernavaca made an effort to ally the classical traditions with our Creole and Mestizo sensibilities in the discourse of the time. Life, which denied his father the government of Mexico, gave his son the orientation of the literary generations, the conquest of more lasting transformations. Alfonso Reyes is also, among many things, a man from the Caribbean, who feels the affinity between the old seas of Homer and the sea of corsairs and galleons, who feels the secret kinship of Mexico with Egypt and with the Greece of tragedy, and he is undoubtedly the great innovator of Castilian prose, just as the modernists had been the innovators of verse. What we are now witnessing is a constant in our history. The rumors of the chroniclers of the Indies and the verses of Ursula and Castellanos, of Balbuena and Pedro de Ona correspond to the rapacious wars of the conquest. To the rebellions of the late 18th century, repressed at times with ferocity, the work of the disciples of the Enlightenment, the reflections of naturalists, the plates of American flora. To the wars of independence, the intelligent and innovative prose of Simon Rodriguez, the prose of Bolivar, of Bello the verses that tried to be faithful to that epic, the rumor of the grammarians and the work of painters and architects. Something in our spirit always strives to respond to the storms of violence and the whirlwinds of war, with inordinate efforts to understand, to save the mind, to save sensitivity. Before each one of our historical tragedies, the artists and the musicians, the artificers of language, the thinkers, always seem to respond with those beautiful words from the Odyssey, the gods create misfortunes so that human generations do not lack something to sing about. And this is carried out equally by intellectuals and peoples, scholars and peasants. One can follow the course of the Mexican Revolution, the stories of Madero and Huerta, of Obregón and Reyes, of Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa in the history books, but one can also trace it in the rumor of the corridos of the revolution. Emiliano Zapata shouted I want land and freedom, and the government laughed when they were going to bury him. Corridos that know how to jump from historical facts to find circumstantial details, which give its fullness to a moment lost in time. Siete Leguas, the horse that Villa esteemed the most when he heard the train's whistle he stopped and whinnied. And that sometimes seemed to compete with historiography in the mention of the precise facts, of the places, of the statistics. Homeland Mexico February 23 Carranza let Americans pass, 2,000 soldiers, 200 airplanes looking for Villa, wanting to kill him.
One of the frequencies of the century in our America is the way in which, from tragedies and different historical circumstances, figures and images of a mythical nature emerge for the popular imagination, which sometimes become planetary icons. Mythical are already Ruben Dario, son of Nicaragua and Chile, Argentina and Spain, mythical Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa, mythical would later be the much-discussed image of Eva Perón in half-century Argentina, mythical Carlos Gardel amid the smoke from his burned-out plane, the mythical Cadillo Jorge Elier Gaten sacrificed by the old discord of the Colombians, mythical the dark regime of the Tun Tun Makuts in the Haiti of the tyrant Duvalier, and mythical, the archetypal image of the Latin American dictator formed in a mosaic with a bit of Dr. Francia and Roses, of Juan Vicente Gomez and Duvalier, of Trujillo and Somoza, of Batista and Stroessner, of Perón and Pinochet. The beautiful Maria Felix and the passionate Augustin Lara are also part of the myth, Benny Moore and Bola Deneve, the guerrilla Ernesto Guevara and the priest Camilo Torres, Fidel Castro, hated and loved without mitigating factors with opposite and symmetrical passions, Salvador Allende under the bombardment of the Chilean army, and sub-commander Marcos, a virtual guerrilla from the Mayan shadows of the Lacandana jungle, mythical Pablo Neruda, after Whitman the great singer of nature. Mythical Gabriel Garcia Marquez surrounded by his cloud of fantastic creatures, mythical Juan Rolfo girded by his Jalisco of the undead, mythical Jorge Luis Borges, blind in the iridescent center of an infinite library. Throughout the century, the continent will struggle between authoritarian solutions and revolutionary solutions, between dictatorships and rebellions, between the two mentioned dangers, order and disorder. Between forces hell-bent on upholding the status quo and protecting tradition, and forces summoning the future and determined to lay waste to conquer it. It is interesting to see in this oscillation the persistent movements of an America whose recent eruption in the history of the West seems to impose a vertiginous social dynamic on it. The urgent and rushing future produces fear and horror of the void at the same time, and the pendulum swings back to the other extreme, violently rejecting novelty and clinging to memory. But perhaps it is the lack of commitment of the continental elites with the reforms that guarantee a serene but effective incorporation of historical innovations, which means that everything has to reach extreme tension and explode before suspicion of the need for some reforms. In this, the leaders of our mestizo America have seldom been able to be perceptive in understanding history. Perhaps from the beginning they assumed modernity not as a conviction but as a gesture of condescension or as a profitable cunning and remain trapped in a stately ideology that is incompatible with truly liberal societies and with the preaching of democracy. Liberal nations have developed their productivity, science and technology on the basis of assumptions of freedom and principles of equality without which modern society is unsustainable. Nations that are no longer unified by a homogeneous faith, by a closed national ideology, by a doctrine, require another type of social cohesive, and without that cohesion that generates the elementary solidarity necessary for social life to exist, there is no state that can be legitimate or a community that can survive. That is why very often the armies created by the leaders of the independence to liberate their nations ended up being instances of power that even intimidated the communities that paid them and gave them their reason for existing. One of the characteristics of the century in this America has been militarism, in the form of repeated barracks that have imposed sometimes for decades, contradictory military regimes in all countries. One could go around the map of the century not saying Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, Peru, Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, Cuba, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, but saying Videla, Pinochet, Stroessner, Perez Jimenez, Rojas, Noriega, Batista, Somoza, Trujillo. One can see those who stand out for their cruelty like Duvalier, for their popularity like Perón, for their patriotism like Torrios, and in all cases they will have to admit that there has not been a process of true citizen formation, of true equality before the law, of true criteria formation so that civil society can maintain its control over such an important and dangerous instrument. But even when power is civil, when elections are held and the schemes of representative democracy are respected, it is evident that the nature of democracy can be altered until it is no more than a grotesque imitation.
and it is there where it is noted that a shared memory, some behavior agreements, some rules of the game, some common projects, national or international, a complex education, some citizen pacts, a minimum solidarity are the key that a society does not disintegrate. And a state does not collapse in the hands of corruption, official violence, dirty wars, private violence, or the mafias. What we are. A century after independence, the continent of 16 million inhabitants had become one of 40 million. But what can that figure from the beginning of the 20th century mean if at the dawn of the 21st century history surprises us with a population of almost 400 million? If we have six or seven of the biggest cities in the world. If Mexico City already seems like the prelude to Ballard's Infinite City, if from the towers of Sao Paulo one already feels at night in the landscapes of science fiction seeing endless jungles of skyscrapers, if in a more than symbolic way the universe is in a basement in Buenos Aires? The 19th century made us Americans and the 20th century made us planetary, protagonists of today's world in turmoil in which all doctrines were put to the test and all proved insufficient to offer historical solutions, in which we are witnessing exhaustion of a civilization and it is not clear on the horizon what could replace it. The technical scientific optimism of the industrial age uses advertising to promise us an infinitely technified world, a world where communications keep us informed, where means of transportation make us masters of space, where electronic brains put oceans of information at our disposal accumulated memory and where the networks of information highways carry and bring the rumor of the crowds leaning out of the phosphorescent balcony of the future. But it is enough to leave the seductive screens to find ourselves with the spectacle of a world where large crowds have not had access to elementary technical innovations such as housing deeds, basic services. The paradise of elementary America that we have delighted in describing in the first pages of this book today shows very contradictory conditions a world that is both exalted and violated by what we call modernity. Although the productive wealth of the continent is enormous and its natural reserves still exist, intensive farming has made the desert grow in many parts, deforestation is advancing over the countries, pollution is not a cry from Cassandra, the misery and violence that accompanying it are not fantastic imaginations of Victor Hugo or Dickens, updated and exaggerated by José Eustachio Rivera or Fernando Vallejo. However, if we think of the fetid and bandit-ridden Europe of the 17th century, or the crowds of filthy paupers that filled Dickens's London or Victor Hugo's Paris, we have no right to think that these historical realities are necessarily the prelude dolphin. Societies know how to find their conscience and their future. A clamorous reality fills our cities, but we would be unfair if we maintained that we only have the misery and violence of the torn South American suburbs, of the favelas of Rio of the northeastern communes of Medellin, of the slums of Buenos Aires or the precarious strength besieged from the streets of Havana. In all the cities of our America ultramodern sectors compete with the most sophisticated in the world, opulent businesses and exquisite supermarkets coexist with scarcity and misery, and this makes us think that those who say that the terms first world and third world have lost their geographical connotation are right. The truth is that there is a first world in Guadalajara, Medellin, and Valparaiso, and there is a third world in New York, London, and Paris. We are a small human race, as Bolivar wrote, and now we are much more so than in his time, the Jews and Poles of Argentina, the Germans and Japanese of Brazil, the Japanese and Germans of Peru, the Chinese of all parts, the Hindus, the Turks, the Syrians, the Koreans. To our old races and our old mixtures peoples were added and added, and the future, in which we have the duty to believe, will be even more motley. Economists have been crying out since the middle of the century that our population was growing at an uncontrollable rate, far exceeding the growth of the economy. Now things are more serious, the population is growing at the expected rate but economic growth slows or stops. How to enumerate the circumstances of the century? Not only is it impossible, it must also be said that now the world knows much more about our America than it did a hundred years ago, that we are truly contemporaries of all men, and that the information circulating today has become so profuse that we have to know even of the nearby neighbors, luxury that our grandparents did not have. The republics had perfected isolation and lack of communication, 
the republics made us unlikely inhabitants of remote countries, of isolated countries, of unknown countries. Didn't our unruly nature contribute to it? No doubt. Those jungles, that mountain range, those misty mountains, those ice ridges, those deserts, those rugged coastlines, those endless plains, those parched canyons, did not seem designed to make communication and exchange easy for us. At the end of the 19th century, the railways began to open connecting roads and challenged the uncontrollable nature, at the beginning of the century, automobiles and their highways traced a different dream over the geographies. Two decades had not passed and the conquest of the air began. Before the first quarter of the century Colombia had, in partnership with the Germans, the second commercial airline in the world, Skadta. The possibility for the powerful sectors to travel through the air did not favor the rapprochement of the peoples, because the problem of traveling for the ruling classes was resolved, the task of laying roads between the countries was abandoned, and once again the tradition of confinement at their own borders. Some had benefited from copious immigration, sometimes unwillingly received by the elites, but which incorporated into the spirit of the countries a necessary awareness of current affairs and the planet. At the beginning of the century, Argentina, benefiting from prosperity, could look down on impoverished Europe. General Roca's liberalization processes and the establishment of universal suffrage were followed by the triumph of the Irigoyen radicals and economic plenitude. Then the consequences would begin. Of so much wealth in a social framework that had not managed to form a mature citizenry, capable of sustaining democracy. The coups d'etat came, and then the Peronist dictatorship, so loved by the people it flattered and bought, so hated by the intellectuals it despised, so full of successes and errors, but after which Argentina would find it difficult to return to what it was for half a century, one of the axes of European civilization magnified by absence and refined by imagination. The second half of the century saw her sink into the abyss of militarism, in the nights of dirty war and exile in an impossible war against one of the world powers, and recognizing herself in amazement in the American mirror of her neighbors. Brazil, where the population grew and the beautiful cities spread out, was a happy country that looked to the future with singular optimism, it was precisely here that great futuristic projects arose such as the almost fantastic city of Brasilia, one of the few cities in the world that has not grown to the rhythm of human contingencies and misadventures, but rather passed from the mind and the abstract outline to reality without being thwarted one iota by chance. But allied with the beautiful and sensual and vertiginous cities of the Atlantic side, the history of the jungle also advanced, the mud termite mounds of modern mines grew, almost worse than those of the 16th century, the banks of the Amazon were populated with enormous cities, and mercury from industrial operations drifted down rivers. European cities had been growing gradually century after century, those of this America were expanding like wildfire and it can be said that they were seen to grow. In them the babel of languages and races mixed at different rates. Mexico, governed since the revolution by a single great party, preserved its austere indigenous face although it would also tend to project the spirit of the white creoles in its cinema and music. There the affable and unmistakable faces of Pedro Infante and Jorge Negrete alternated, with the distinguished and melancholic accent of Augustin Lara, the beautiful mestizo face of Maria Felix, and the gollymatic dialect of Cantinflas, the witty and poor mestizo. We feel the soul of this country in the caravan of Indian shadows of the revolution or of Rolfo's stories, in Fulgur Sedano. Iduvijas Dieta, Juan Preciado, those names that rose from the tombs at the spell of the poet to persist in the dreams of the living. And in the conscience of a city that was already the largest in the world five centuries ago and that continued to grow in the shadow of its imperial party, feeling the forgotten presence of ancient laws, as if Moctezuma's feather headband refused to abandon his place at the apex of the Pyramid of the Sun. Central America had entered the 20th century fighting for the ideal of union along the Isthmus, a dream that the great men of the 19th century shared with Ruben Daria, but what opened the way was fragmentation, and each country had its own specific face. The colorful Mayan of Guatemala, with its artisan markets and its tropical forests, with the discovery of its red pyramids and its peasant life. 
he found a memorable setting in the fictions of Miguel Angel Asturias, increasing political attempts reached their peak with the Arbenz Revolution in 1950, which distanced itself from the all-powerful coffee lords, and who had to go into exile after the North American intervention, political instability and dictatorships reigned over the dryness of the suburbs of Honduras, and over the pleasant Salvadoran countryside, came the formation of a state without an army in Costa Rica, the eternalization of the Somoza dynasty in Nicaragua, finally thwarted by a popular revolution that was prevented from becoming Marxist by its coincidence with the retreat of socialism in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe the generous effort of the people to build a democracy on the ruins of an insolent fief ruined by war and earthquakes. The gradual Panamanian conquest of its autonomy, almost always alienated, which was in the hands of the United States since the adventure of the canal, and which was perpetuated under docile governments until the arrival of the strong General Torrios, who claimed the commitment to return the interoceanic canal, who became Panamanian again on the last day of the 20th century. How can we not also remember the clouds of U.S. paratroopers descending to capture General Noriega, a former Pentagon ally, in his own capital? Unlike its neighbor Colombia, where popular leaders have never been allowed access to power, Venezuela has seen the periodic rise of characters such as dictators Juan Vicente Gómez and Marcos Pérez Jiménez, whose actions are always controversial and at odds with democratic principles. They do not seem to have configured bloodthirsty and anti-popular tyrannies, and instead more than once they made works that Venezuelans continue to view with appreciation and respect. National guides often show visitors the tunnels that connect the Maixa airport with the city of Caracas, emphasizing that they were built under Perez Jimenez almost 50 years ago and that they are in perfect condition even with the original lighting. The remarkable civil peace that permeates the country is attributable to the fact that the succession of ruling dynasties was broken very early, to the fact that the country has always accepted its mestizo and mulatto composition, to the fact that it has always been open to the winds of immigration and trade with the world, since its army, quite marked by Bolivar's footprint, does not usually look favorably on having to face its own people. No less important is the fact that Venezuela floats on a sea of oil and that the oil boom of half a century turned the average Venezuelan into a kind of potentate, ostentatious about his prosperity and given to luxury. It is said that in the days of oil splendor, Venezuela not only became the world's leading importer of Scotch whiskey, but there were those who imported ice made with water from the highlands of Scotland, so that it would not alter the flavor of the mixtures. And pure malts. Also there as in other countries, the traditional parties ended up losing their modesty, and finally corruption, together with waste, gave a good account of the brief splendor. The end of the century has brought its cyclical strong man, with the typical face of the Venezuelan. Of the people, and the country has placed many of its hopes for the century that is beginning in the hands of Hugo Chavez. It is difficult to predict where the unique Bolivarian adventure of the ex-coup leader will lead, but given the peaceful tradition of Venezuelans, it is very likely that some of the changes that the country requires will be undertaken without the bloodshed that they would cost in neighboring lands. The central facts of Chile occurred in the second half of the century, when a coalition of communists and socialists acceded to the government in democratic elections. It was even thought that Chile would be the first country in the world to establish socialism without the need for a bloody revolution, but once the reforms began and the interests of the powerful and of the United States were affected, the faithful Chilean army flew in defense of the homeland threatened by the reforms of Salvador Allende, by the poems of Pablo Neruda and by the songs of Victor Jara and the Para brothers. The bombing of the Palacio de la Moneda, the death of President Allende under that attack, and the dictatorship of General Pinochet for more than two decades, were a fundamental part of the recent history of the continent, not only because of the immediate political drama, which also precipitated the death of Nobel laureate Pablo Neruda, but because of the long drama of the exile of Chileans which, especially in Europe, is one of the faces of contemporary history. The road has been long in the old land of the Inca to reach the veiled dictatorship of President Fujimori, the son of Japanese immigrants, who defeated the seasoned intellectual Mario Vargas Llosa in the elections, dissolved parliament, 
opted for solutions of force against the radical Maoist guerrillas of Abimael Guzman, Chairman Gonzalo, and ruled with a heavy hand during the last years of the century. Only in perspective is it possible to judge fully, and the truth is that in governments that are not unrestrained tyrannies, only when they pass does the panorama of their time become visible and all the successes and errors can be weighed. Central issues of dictatorships also show the history of Uruguay and Paraguay, Bolivia, and Ecuador. The white countries and the Indian countries, those that speak Spanish and those that speak Quechua, the most unmistakable and the most incompatible, have found in the persistence of their coups a more essential affinity, and although at the end of the century they tried to renew their republican profile and its democratic institutions, already the beginning of the 21st century has seen in Ecuador the curious alliance of the army with an indigenous movement to overthrow a president. Until 1930, Colombia experienced 50 years of hegemony that made it the most conservative country on the continent. Throughout this century, he postponed the necessary liberal reforms, the same ones carried out by Juarez and Obregón in Mexico, Roca, and Irigoyen in Argentina, the dictators in Venezuela and Alfaro in Ecuador since the beginning of the century. He later lived through the brief spring of hope with the inflamed oratory of Jorge Elier Gaten and lived through his mourning for decades. The violence fueled by parties expelled the crowds to the cities, an aristocratic pact tenuously governed the disorderly process of urbanization, and the corruption of many politicians coupled with the indifference of the people allowed the country to become hostage to guerrillas, drug traffickers, and common criminals, so that with one of the richest and most beautiful natures of the continent, with an amazing cultural diversity and with an exemplary human resourcefulness, it is the only country that reaches the gates of the 21st century torn by civil war. Society hesitates and delays in building the necessary modern and creative citizen alliance, which by reinvigorating and relegitimizing the state, rebuilds the economy, reinvents democracy, and pacifies the territory. In the last years of the century, a president of aristocratic origin, supported by a sector of businessmen and by other social forces, tried in vain to open the way to a political negotiation with the armed rebels that would avert the danger of a devastating and prolonged war and could not prevent the new century from beginning with the same omen of wars with which the fateful 20th century began in Colombia. Long and detailed as his maps would be the history of the islands in the Caribbean now full of independent nations. There is the contrast of the two halves of that island that Columbus called Hispaniola, the half colonized by Spain, the Dominican Republic, a vigorous and cultured country that had its terrible tyrant in Trujillo, and the half colonized by the French which had over its multitudes of mulattoes, its beauty, and its African rituals the dictatorship of Duvalier and his dark ton ton Makuts. It would seem that speaking of the countries of this mestizo America in the 20th century forces, among many things, to speak of dictatorships. This is true but not anomalous, the names of Mussolini and Franco, Hitler and Stalin, Tito and Enver Hakka, Oliveira Salazar, and Sosescu are also familiar to the spectator of 20th century Europe. What this reveals is that even in the 20th century we have continued to be subject to the European model, inclined to respond to conflicts with authoritarianism, to substitute the weakness of peoples or their bewilderment with the all-embracing decisions of a strong man. In all cases, even in the most paternal, this is proof of the weakness or inability of the communities to sustain democratic realities. The fact cannot alarm us too much if, in any case, even France, which had just gone through the most equalizing, terrorist and philosophical revolution in history, found itself twenty years later subjected to the refined but bloody, novelistic but incendiary, brief but inexhaustible effects, of a single man. But the 20th century was also among us a century of popular revolutions. The most notable were that of Mexico, the country that in 1910 once again saw the righteous face of its Indians and its peasants, and that was conditioned by the effects of that disorderly and significant force throughout the century. The peaceful revolution in Chile, which succumbed under the power of the army. The popular and Nicaraguan anti-dictatorship which after a few years of bloody civil war led to an exercise in reconciliation. And the Cuban. At the end of 1958, a group of patriotic guerrillas, who had landed shortly before on the southern coast and had established themselves in the Sierra Maestra, 
advanced through the island of Cuba, awakening excessive popular fervor, and expelled the dictator Fulgencio Batista. On January 1, 1959, the Cuban Revolution triumphantly entered Havana, and one of the most striking episodes of the century in our America began there. It was a patriotic rebellion, but its leaders, and in particular Fidel Castro, seemed to have more serious historical purposes than simply replacing the dictator with a nondescript president like those that abounded on the continent. A severe policy of nationalizations and property confiscation aroused the alarm of the great North American neighbor, and after an initial enthusiastic greeting, the United States government decreed a blockade of the island. The revolution was bound to fail because it could not survive this blockade by the powerful continental gendarme, absolute owner of Caribbean waters since the war against Spain in 1898. Even the powerful Cubans who had emigrated to Miami were preparing a military intervention on the island, similar to that of the guerrillas, from Playa Giron, also called the Bay of Pigs. The invasion failed, because the revolution had aroused popular enthusiasm, but the blockade promised to be effective. It was then that the post-war order came to the aid of the Cuban rebels. The other great planetary power, the Soviet Union, came in to support the revolutionary government, and overnight Cuba was transformed into a socialist country, under the very nose of the United States. From that moment on, the Soviet Union bought Cuban sugar at a price of gold, began to provide the island with its vehicles, its products, and its technology and an artificial pause in a long history of poverty and tyranny allowed the idealistic Cuban rulers undertake a series of unexpected experiments in the field of social life. Cuba banished illiteracy, developed an admirable public health system in a continent with poor health, a generous administration gave the Cuban people high doses of pride and dignity, but at the same time political discourse demonized the upper classes, traditionally selfish and even unpatriotic who took refuge in Miami to defend their capitals from the generosity of the revolutionaries. The price of no longer having the hungry and downtrodden poor inside was to have the scorned and offended rich outside, and the Cuban Revolution was the subject of an angry campaign of opposition throughout the continent. In those times, when the revolution was still all ideality and cordiality with the people, the legend of a bloodthirsty tyranny was created. However, the revolution was dignifying and teaching coexistence to the Cuban people, and its anti-clerical atheism was no stronger than that of the Mexican reform of Benito Juarez a century ago, which prohibited priests and nuns from going out into the street with their cassocks and your habits. Nobody ignores that the Cuban economy lived in a state of exception and unreality, but that unreality propitiated by the convenience of the Soviets was allowing Cuba the exercise, unprecedented in our America of a generous administration interested in giving well-being to a people. But after almost 30 years of subsidizing the Cuban economy, the collapse of the Soviet Union came, the European economies that depended on that gigantic empire fell like cards one after another, and nobody gave a penny for the fate of Cuba, condemned to fall finally resoundingly in the clutches of the US blockade, to which it had been subjected since 1962. Curiously, Cuba resisted. It was clear that it would never be the socialist country it had longed to be, because the very model of socialism succumbed to the powerful market economy, but the stubbornness of the Cuban leaders and people refused to give in to the suffocating blockade of the empire, identical to pirate sieges of cities in the 18th century. The empire, outraged by some nationalizations, by the independence of a country that was always unrestricted in its own neighborhood, and by Cuba's alliance with its communist enemies, never took into account the generous experiments that the revolution had undertaken, and he let ideological differences erase in his eyes an effort that, beyond ideologies, was valuable as an exercise in administration and politics, as an example of the cultural uniqueness of the countries of Mestizo America. The revolutionary government was unruly and sometimes lurched blindly, but the Americans had been capable of supporting Somoza, Batista, and Duvalier. Hatred of dictators was not exactly their main characteristic, and rather they only asked for unlimited fidelity. On the other hand, there were many things in Cuba to consider as valuable historical experiments. The fall of the Soviet Union could mark the moment of American intelligence. <laughs>
Being evident that socialism was already disappearing like a castle of fog, the United States could afford to be generous and allow Cuba to return to a market economy enriched by some exercises of popular dignity and coexistence, and for this it would have it was enough to suspend the blockade. Cuba would have no other alternative than to negotiate on capitalist terms with its neighbors, and the lack of historical alternatives would return it to the West, without denying the conquests of its adventure. There was no more peaceful and cordial people in our America, which is understandable because the new generations had grown up protected and risk-free. The inevitable passivity into which people rude by paternalism fall into, to whom everything is given if they obey and if they try not to think too much and not take too many initiatives, could certainly be criticized. No state knows how to be generous, and in that the states are very similar to corporations, they cannot do good without proclaiming from the rooftops that they have done it and without immediately claiming the stunned gratitude of those who receive it. Only individuals, capable of all rancor and all greed, are capable of all generosity. The violence of the Cuban Revolution was less than the violence of all the dictatorships that had been seen in the Caribbean, and some of its rigors, as Shakespeare would say, had been capable of be ennobled by the generosity of certain ideals. In other words, the happiness they sought for their people excused many errors and some excesses. But the United States was adamant. Cuba would fall. The tycoons would return to their mansions the corporations to their thousands of hectares and the masters to their slaves, why make concessions to the uncomfortable enemy? But Cuba steered the helm over the stormy sea. Accustomed to facing hurricanes, she assumed that the market economy was upon her but that the country would enter it better if it did not succumb, like Russia, to the power of the mafias and the invasion of merchandise. If the process was controlled, especially to avoid the almost inevitable civil war that would ensue, and the revenge of the exiled minorities against the people who had supported the revolution. The government gave the most difficult lurch, allowing the free circulation of currency, the hated dollar became the almost official currency. It gave the second lurch, it was open to tourism. The idle and hateful consumerism of vacationers began to leave their dollars in the hands of the virtuous state. In moral terms, the situation became cloudy. But the issue at this point was less moral than political. There was the dilemma of all or nothing, but the Cuban leaders chose to save what they could, and die of contradictions but not of surrender. Ten years after the confused fall of the Soviet Union in the power of corporations and mafias, Cuba continues to resist. We do not know if he will be able to avoid the road until he reaches the port of economic reactivation and we will never know what might have been of his experience if a senseless and cruel block had not impeded his mobility and creativity from the beginning. We don't even know if, not bound by the blockade, it would have needed to be as authoritarian with its population as it ended up being. The best of the Cuban Revolution was achieved with passion and imagination despite the blockade. We do not know if the worst could have been prevented if the blockade had not kept the island in a state of war for 40 years. We don't even know if the absence of a blockade would have made it easier for the United States to intervene on the island and subtly dictate its will. Everything that Cuba became in these 40 years may have been a consequence of the force that indignation gives, of the reaction of a wounded sovereignty, and the true cause of that stubborn resistance could secretly be imperial arrogance. Let's say that that indomitable rebellion, that invincible pride, is also part of who we are and enters into the very complex freshness of our continental destiny. Thus, this story ends where it began, on the beaches of the Caribbean, where the struggle continues between the powers that rule the world and those who believe that other paths, other dreams, other ways of thinking about life are possible. One of the many questions that this long history poses to us is whether, given our singularity, we are entitled to our own mistakes or if we are fatally condemned to the mistakes imposed on us by high empires. But still, our destiny sometimes seems to obey that memorable phrase of T.S. Eliot, if we can never be right, we had better change our way of being wrong from time to time. Mestizo America Our continent has grown in difficulty. It is true that life has not been easy for us. Due to a complex network of historical causes, we took on the challenge of miscegenation and it has been an arduous challenge. We grew up on a continent that for a long time, 
like an anomalous form of geometry, had its center outside. We learned to look at ourselves from outside ourselves, to judge ourselves from what we were not, to see the strangeness in the physiognomy of our brothers. To feel distant things familiar and distant things familiar. We saw our mixed races emerge from the bowels of ruthless wars, of which we always feel ashamed. We learned to be ashamed of our idleness, of the idleness inherited from our naive ancestors who made birds and frogs and grass hoppers with the gold that the German bankers, the Spanish kings, the English pirates knew how to exchange into power. We also learned to be ashamed of the brutality of our Spanish and Portuguese grandparents, whose rapacious hands destroyed ancient cultures, exquisite works of art, monuments of architecture that were also monuments of astronomy in half a century. We were melancholic and we were passionate, we fought for centuries with our brothers, and we never knew if we were doing it to be faithful to our evil European blood or our evil American blood. We saw the centuries pass over this geography without having learned to love it, and even to deplore the time that corrodes everything, we only knew how to do it with verses from Quevedo or Shakespeare. Slow was the conquest of our natural voice, slow how our Spanish guitars learned the melancholy of the Andes, how our European palates learned to paint copper-skinned men, how our lips learned not only to name unknown nightingales but mockingbirds and quetzals. But before we learned to love this excessive nature, the mythical jungles and mountains with old relics, the deserts with howling coyotes and the rivers with tapers and capybaras, everything began to vanish under the wind of change. There were ships and railways, there were highways and plains, cities grew with expelled crowds, and there were no mythologies presiding over those cities but a murmur of wind over motionless shadows. Wires, embankments, dead paper, leftovers from Buenos Aires. That is how the poet spoke in his insomnia. This city where we have not lived our childhood, he told us, to allude to how recent our presence in this urban world was. And looking at the changes in style in his country, he suddenly sentenced, the child God wrote you a stable slash and the devil's oil wells. And now we are here, and the world around us can no longer be described, it is motley and turbulent, it is copious and unfathomable. We managed to hear the noise of shops and new settlements, the rumble of highways, the roar of helicopters. We see the living rivers and the dying rivers, the species that survive and the species that are extinct, the hidden jaguars and the last anacondas, the spider monkeys and the spectacled bears, the intact native forests and the felled forests, the snow mountain ranges and the black green jungle crisscrossed with muddy threads. Someone continues to repeat the myths of the origin next to the big trees, but the electric saws also advance cutting down the future of humanity. The wind brings the heavy clouds back from the Atlantic and the rain floods the canoes again. There are hundreds of thousands of people in those riverside slums of Manaus, in those poorly covered boats that are their homes. We open Newsweek magazine and an invisible hand has written the disturbing news that the future of the Amazon will be urban. We see refineries and sugar mills, plains of African palm and white cotton fields. Coffee, bananas, oil, sugar are still here. But also the coca fields, which are no longer for the mystical rites of the old indigenous communities, for wise shamans who seek knowledge. Also the poppy flowers, which now feed ignoble powers. Shots are heard in those hills of Medellin. The children hide in the slums. The young prepare to die. Others watch in luxurious halls and on gigantic screens all the wonders of the world. Tangos are still playing in those cafes, boleros on those terraces with palm trees, mambos at those parties by the sea, salsa in those dark nightclubs shaken by lightning, but now those mestizo monosyllables are also ours, jazz and pop, rock and rap. How to know what this world of ours is? We know something about its past something about its present, something about the dreams of its great men, something about the music of its poets, something about the proposals of its wise men. From the nocturnal phosphorescent cities, we no longer know if history takes a precise course, if it advances in some direction or if to contemplate it, as the philosopher said, is to look at a spectacle as random as the changes in the clouds or as the trail of foam that they leave the boats on the piranha. Here we were never interested in systems, Life is too complex to dream that a few schemes solve it. 
but the passion for living is in every street, in every body. Day by day we feel that we belong more to the world, that we are contemporaries of the human race, and that the same future looms over the entire planet. And there is something that is becoming more and more evident and that it is necessary to repeat, Mestizo America, which does not exist as a political unit and that for centuries has been denied as an economic unit, is, culturally, a nation. Whenever a great historical movement arose, an intellectual generation, a literary school, an artistic trend, it arose simultaneously throughout the continent. This is what happened with the Enlightenment generation, with the Independence generation, with the modernists of the late 19th century, with that admirable movement that has been inappropriately called the boom of Latin American literature. Similar adventures, shared concerns, parallel languages, similar searches, works that end up forming a body that all countries receive with gratitude and honor as their own. Our writers, whom a little over a century ago nobody even read in neighboring countries, today are among the most widely read and influential authors on the planet, to say Juan Rolfo is to talk about how the Spanish language has been capable of to bring forth from oblivion the deep mythology of mestizo peoples who continue to be faithful, without knowing it, to very ancient shadows, it is to see that Mexico where the dead are alive and accompany the living, that Mexico where the search for the mythical father, the lost emperor, power and pyramid is so important, who governed everything, who generated everything, and who later was it was crumbling like a heap of stones. Saying Gabriel Garcia Marquez is talking about how the splendor of the Spanish language was allied in the Caribbean with the magical thinking of the indigenous peoples and with the devilish sensuality and vigorous joy of the children of Africa, seeing the sun's blood traveling of its own accord along the path that leads to its origin, the emblematic red line of blood searching for its source, and how cultural richness begets vastly seductive new ways of retelling the timeless stories of man. To say Jorge Luis Borges is to speak of how the memory of humanity has moved to our America, and now turns us into the guardians of the planetary libraries, into the peoples who settle accounts with the tradition of civilization and open the doors of their future. These things are not accidental, a history so stormy and so long, so silenced and so misunderstood had to bear fruit, and these fruits are no longer among us memorials of grievances or docile toasts to the greatness of the metropolises, they are, by the on the contrary, a courageous and eloquent takeover of those traditions and the eruption of an originality that seeks paths for languages, paths for the imagination, paths for the future. Our culture is reaching its maturity, but it is evident that we are witnessing a beginning, and we can expect great things from that motley tumult of dreams and experiences that Mestizo America is today. In that list of creators and artists, which would be inexhaustible, any son of our America can inquire, but it is more important that we all feel part of that creative process, that this passionate awareness of our importance to the world grows. What we say of literature we can say of the rest of the languages, of the plastic arts, of music. The Bolero orchestras of the 1940s were already a good example of how continental our culture is, its Mexican or Puerto Rican composers, its Cuban or Dominican musicians, its Venezuelan, Colombian or Argentine singers. There are also the tangos, born from the habaneras, the Colombian bambucos reborn in Mexico, the Mexican mariachis that fill the avenues of the capitals of South America, the corridos, and the rancheras the Cuyo music that is heard in all the villages even Colombian Andes, the Cucas and the Zambas, the Ecuadorian corridors and the Peruvian Creole valsicitos, the black music of the Pacific, the Alabaos and the Curulaos, the music of the Lainras harps, the music of the Vallenato accordions, of the Mexican marimbas, of the Bandonians from Buenos Aires, and all the fusions that our time begins to elaborate through the dialogue of these traditions with the rest of the planetary music. One would have to look to Asia and Africa to find continents with music that is so present in the communities, with such an active creative energy, with such a wealth of melodies and rhythms, but perhaps nowhere can richer and more attractive fusions be expected. It is doubtful that anywhere in the world there is such a lively dialogue between academic music and these popular expressions, a broader effort to listen to them and learn from them. Here we are, between memory and hope with the certainty of a continental conscience knocking at our door, with the shared treasure of languages and aesthetic expressions, 
with the hunch that in the face of the increasingly urgent challenges of reality today, no one is better equipped than the mestizos of America to think and imagine, to consider the facts and propose paths in the century that is opening before us. Now it is necessary to think about the tasks that await the children of this part of the world, and in light of the long journey we have made for the body and soul of the youngest of the continents, to answer the best question that we can ask ourselves today, why, despite our many present difficulties, we can affirm with all conviction that Mestizo America is the country of the future. The country of the future. In few places in the world is it still possible to find a nature as alive and diverse as in our America. Despite five centuries of Europeanization, in the sad sense of domestication of the natural universe, deforestation, extinction of fauna, plundering of the earth for the thoughtless cycles of industry, our continent abounds in natural treasures, fog factories, as the poet would say, sources of water and oxygen, an ancient wisdom that has to do with the diversity of plants and knowledge of their virtues. We have already seen how pharmacological laboratories are interested in collecting the scattered knowledge of indigenous doctors, and even in seizing this treasure through the greed of patents. Now it is necessary to reconcile the ancestral respect for nature with the need to guarantee the subsistence of an immense continental community. The reasonable use of resources, through what is called sustainable development, must start from two different considerations. One, to really ask what this development consists of, and how much is it designed to cover the material and spiritual needs of the children of our continent, and secondly, how to ensure that the relationship with nature exceeds the framework of a utilitarian sustainability, which is undoubtedly necessary, and becomes a relationship of true cordiality with a world that will not ultimately be favorable to us except to the extent that we strive to understand it. It could be said that one of the most dramatic constants in the history of our peoples is the way in which this will to dominate without nuances almost never allowed us to populate the territory with lucidity and clairvoyance using its gifts in the most sensible and profitable way. In recent times we have seen how millennial cultivation plants such as coca, which were always used in a peaceful and creative way by native communities for their rituals of knowledge or to access the mystical ecstasy typical of their cultures, have been taken from their ancestral use by the frenzy of industrial society, and they become unlucky powers, which in an environment of poverty and inequality enhance the brutality of the mafias and stimulate the rapacity of the market. The industrial drugs derived from it are consumed copiously by rich societies, in need of increasingly stronger stimulants, and thus reveals the brutal imbalance that exists in the world today between the jaded and opulent consumer societies, and the societies that have a subsistence economy. The crisis unleashed by drugs derived from tropical plants exposes the folly of a model of civilization based not on education but on prohibition, not on knowledge but on profit not on the reasonable use and transformation of natural substances but in the production of industrial derivatives that cause a blind demonization. Thus, instead of being educated and protected, communities are left defenseless to economic irrationality, political chaos and spiritual confusion. I would say that on the subject of the way we use nature, and how we allow it to continue to be considered a symbol of evil instead of learning to relate to it with the necessary wisdom, the words of Friar Lorenzo in the Romeo and Shakespeare's Juliet, Ah, great is the mighty grace that resides in herbs, plants, stones, and their true qualities, for there is nothing so vile that lives on earth without giving the earth some special good, nor is there anything so good that, diverted from its good use, it does not rebel against its origin, falling into harm. Virtue itself becomes vice when misapplied, and vice is sometimes dignified in action. Within the tender bark of this feeble flower resides a poison and a medical potency, because, when smelling, it animates with each part to each part, and being tested, it kills all the senses in the heart. Two kings thus confronted in camp in man as in herbs, grace, and rude will, and when the worst prevails, very soon the death worm devours that plant. Reflection on this double potential should teach us to transform the knowledge and use of natural assets into benefit for the people and wisdom for our culture. It is up to our rigor and firmness of character to prevent their exploitation from becoming hell for our communities. In the future, when the depletion of food reserves or wars for water is announced, treasures such as the Amazon jungle and cloud forests will be vital for humanity, 
and it will depend on our foresight whether these resources are a blessing, not a only for others but also for us and for our children, a natural gift shared with the world and not a new chapter in the ruthless conquest of America. Also the ethnic and cultural complexity, which until now has been one of our greatest difficulties, will gradually become one of our greatest virtues. The world is not advancing towards pure races and cultures but rather towards miscegenations, but these suppose great disagreements, identification difficulties, rejections and repulsions, so the example of Mestizo America, which has been learning this difficult integration for five centuries, will be inalienable and invaluable for all peoples. In our America, there are already countries like Cuba, like Brazil and like Venezuela, where racial problems, without having been totally eliminated, are secondary, where it is possible to attend the noble spectacle of different races that look at each other as equals, love each other freely and mixed without emphasis. But in addition to this physical integration there is another that is part of the same exercise of coexistence, the dialogue of cultures. Without him jazz would not have been possible in the Mississippi Basin, which fused traditional African music with the instruments of European orchestras, without him Picasso's Cubism would not have been possible, which combined the knowledge of Western painting with inspiration of the arts of Africa, nor the art of Diego Rivera, the mestizo iconography of Frida Kahlo and the corporeal jungles of Wilfredo Lam, the painting of Fernando Botero or that of the Caribbean New Yorker Jean Michel. Basquiat Without him salsa and rap would not be possible, the music of Villalobos or the Chapoliao birds of the Laneros harpists, the mischief of the Vallenato accordions and the melancholy of the Buenos Aires Bandonian, to which Alberto Gomez sang. You are a caterpillar who wanted to be a butterfly before he died. A century of ethnology and anthropology has taught us to value the richness and complexity of native cultures, which were victims for centuries of the arrogance of the conquering metropolises. Still, that vigorous work of scholars like Claude Levi Strauss, like Gerardo Reichel Dolmatov, like Anne Osborne, or like their countless followers throughout the continent, has not been sufficiently projected towards the communities, and it is common to find in our America the prejudices and exclusions typical of colonial barbarism. Perhaps the most important thing that we have received from these adventures of thought and sensibility is not even the appreciation of the refined works of art of the American indigenous peoples, or the respect for their family order or the will to establish a dialogue with their customs to access integrated cultures that receive and perpetuate the best of each tradition, but rather the considerable change that this century has caused in the content of the concepts of civilization and barbarism. Now it is possible for us to see in the demographic recovery of the indigenous peoples and in their current struggle to defend their languages, their mythologies and their worldviews, not vestiges of abolished ages, nor anachronistic expressions nor museum pieces, but, as has been argued the linguist and researcher John Landaburu in his text on the long struggle of indigenous peoples, a manifestation of the present of our culture. Because in the face of the crisis of values in modern societies, in the face of the clumsiness of industrial culture in its relationship with nature, in the face of the growing desecration of the world brought about by the gaze of positivism, by formal logic and by the merely quantitative analysis of what really, these discrete and strongly united communities to the land, which have not been lost in an arrogant anthropocentrism and a contemptuous spiritualism, could help our societies to recover a little the balance of gaze and tenderness towards the world. No one today can postulate the massive return of societies to a supposed primitive Arcadia, and we have already said that the world does not seem to be advancing towards any form of cultural or ethnic purity but for that very reason the wisdom of all peoples can enter in a creative dialogue and contribute to retrace the path that brings us closer to nature again and allows us to establish a new pact with it. No one like the indigenous peoples knew and respected the secrets of this land, no one like the Incas knew how to cultivate the Andes without destroying them, no one like the Amazonian peoples knew how to live in the jungle without destroying it. We have the duty to listen to their wisdom and to make of those wise possessors of intuitions and ancient visions valuable advisors of the future. This is usually not to the liking of those in favor of rapid industrialization, of a rapid incorporation of our economies into the frenzy of productivity, the fever of profitability and the carnival of consumption, 
but in the face of systems as fragile as the Amazon we have to be able to learn the painful lesson of the wars in El Dorado, of the horrors of the rubber plantations and the devastation of drug trafficking, three different steps of the same hell of greed and unreason. Despite the fragmentation that the colony inherited and that the republics perpetuated, the truth is that there are no powerful tensions between our nations. Border disagreements are natural frictions between neighbors, who have rarely reached difficult situations of confrontation. A greater awareness of our cultural proximity, a wider dissemination of our common literary, artistic, and musical heritage, a more serious study of our common history, will help us build those mature communities that support projects of political integration and balanced economic exchange. Now, in this field it is necessary to rethink the logic that has governed our economies since the time of the conquest. We do not have the slightest possibility of accessing decent standards of living for the majority of our population while the priority of our business and productive world is exclusively to satisfy the needs of the metropolises. What would become of Europe or the United States if they governed their economy by the idea of producing welfare for other peoples as a priority? And the truth is that 400 million people, with customs that are not entirely dissimilar, constitute a gigantic market, which could become one of the priorities of our production. Europe itself is an example of how to establish continental exchanges first and respond first to the community itself. But perhaps the main issue there is not economic or political but philosophical. Only when peoples come to truly appreciate themselves do they stop behaving like surrendered tributaries of other more illustrious peoples. And perhaps the proud contemporary culture of our America, so present and so influential throughout the world, is changing our self-awareness in each one of us, and favoring that new view of what we have and what we deserve. Jorge Luis Borges argued that the reason why the Jews have been able to be so continuously creative in the realm of European culture is that they participated in that culture in a marginal rather than a central way. He added that for the same reason the Irish have been able to be such prolific creators in the field of the English language. This led him to rightly affirm that the children of this America have the double privilege of being an inalienable part of the European soul, but of living at the same time on its shores, so that we can feel European enough to receive its influence and participate in their mental order, but at the same time distinct enough to create without excessive awe of the importance of their traditions. The 20th century has proven that our America knows how to receive the legacy of Europe but does not feel overwhelmed by the weight of its truths or by the superstitious duty of perpetuating its errors. And that freedom will be fundamental when it comes to accepting the intellectual challenges of the future. The world faces enormous dangers, and many of them arise from the traditional virtues of civilization. For this reason, the future will require profound respect for human memory but a great deal of audacity and originality when it comes to creating the responses and ideals of the future based on that legacy. At the end of the 18th century, the great spirits of European Romanticism showed that reason had become aware of its own limits and called the world to an alliance with nature as the only condition for survival. In the late 19th century Nietzsche sought to subject the systematic thought that was Europe's obsession to the test of an incisive critical spirit and to the siege of intuition and poetry. Of course, Europe is in a position to assume this criticism of its own vanities and its own excesses, the criticism of its virtues, but even today the apparent advantages of its civilization do not allow that venerable old continent to fully perceive the risks of its own mental model. The mestizos of America know these virtues and have benefited from these exploits, but we have also witnessed how destructive and how barbaric the arrogance of empires and the vanity of dogmatic cultures can be. We are that kind of Europeans who, because of having had contact with different peoples, are always looked at with suspicion. And far from assuming an attitude of rivalry before our illustrious relatives, the only possibility we have is to accept ourselves as the fusion of that world with others. It is easier for us to relativize the truths, our thinkers and our creators know how to invite us to live in a conjectural universe, to prefer lucid questions to easy answers. Auden said that one of the secrets of America, of all America, is the tendency, as Edgar Allan Poe argues well, to value things not for the truth that is in them but for the beauty that abounds in its truth, and that constitutes its truth. Great totalizing systems cannot be expected from us, but instead aesthetic philosophies can be expected, 
where rhythm and harmony are as important as the hypotheses themselves, as the rigor of the arguments. With the Hegelian idea of a linear history collapsed, which advances purifying itself towards fullness and perfection, and which from Europe naively tried to dictate the law of its stages and its periods to a world that is both fascinated and subjugated, it is time to learn to look at the story sequence more subtly. While that kind of drunken optimism prevailed, according to which all perfection was always waiting for us, all past was necessarily error and precariousness, there was a very partial assessment of the riches of the people. This era, which seems to have left behind the most schematic paradigms of modernity, can look at the diversity of ages and the complexity of cultures as a treasure that carries both privileges and responsibilities. As Octavio Paz has suggested, it is time to learn that we are contemporaries of all ages. There is as much profound truth for us in the sacred goldsmithing of the Bogota Gold Museum as there is in Botticelli's Venus. And just as art does not tolerate a hierarchy of beauty, just as art does not tolerate the mechanical postulation of progress, likewise we have to learn to see progress not as an inexorable certainty but as a possibility that requires effort and patience. America, which saw bows and arrows suddenly changed to firearms, knows very well that not everything new is progress and not everything old is obsolescence. And as nature shows us, still alive and unruly before us, the oldest things can well be seen as the most current, since, like Valerie C., the essential always begins again. Recently, a former Spanish ruler declared sensibly that our peoples, raised in precariousness, are extraordinarily resourceful, and that even their proverbial indiscipline and cheerful disorder, which are usually seen as a mistake, compared to the discipline and efficiency of the industrious peoples of the world, they could also be the symbols of vigorous societies that do not submit easily. The truth is that overly disciplined peoples end up being too easily manipulated by fascism. The time that seems to be opening up before us is a time when mechanical discipline and unquestionable truth will be less efficient than recursiveness and the capacity for initiative. Those who love to control and dominate peoples look with distaste on these societies that have had to resort to indigenous malice to survive against powers that are too inflexible, too insensitive. Mestizo America is the daughter of very deep and complex civilizations and has the duty to receive the best of all of them. In the face of the mere message of productivity, which leaves no room for life or imagination, or in the face of the terrible message of power, which wants to see humans subjected to oppressive discipline, our peoples have before them only two fundamental imperatives, the imperative to survive, as dictated by the deepest laws of nature and for which it is also necessary to save that natural universe on which we depend, and the imperative to seek happiness, beauty, and harmony. We would prefer to persist in disorderly poverty rather than submit to a logic of productive frenzy and boredom like the one that dominates some opulent societies in the world. From Europe we inherit the search for well-being, individualism, the love of beauty. From America we receive the search for simplicity, respect for nature, the search for knowledge that generates coexistence before power. From Africa, the profound need for a rhythm that makes us feel not as rulers of the world but as a necessary and profound part of it. And from those firm origins, we are able to receive the teaching of many other peoples, of many other ways of understanding the human adventure. What else can we ask of the future, but that it make us worthy of the ancient and mysterious human condition, worthy of the planet we all share? worthy of its beauty and its gifts. Finish. Mestiza America the country of the future. William Ospina